Today is um, Wednesday, July 22nd, 2020, and we'll call the City of Homestead Regular City Council meeting to order. Pursuant to Executive Order 20-69 issued by Governor DeSantis and the City of Homestead local state of emergency due to COVID-19, this will be a virtual council meeting. The virtual meeting can be viewed live on the City Access channel or live stream at cityofhomestead.com slash public meeting. The public may also participate live during the virtual meeting utilizing video conference via WebEx events or via toll-free conference call number. Please go to cityofhomestead.com slash calendar for specific details and instructions on participation utilizing video and telephonic conferencing. The city has accepted public comments as part of the virtual meeting, and those comments can be emailed to public comments at cityofhomestead.com. Public comments are limited to 300 words per comment. Public comments on specific agenda items should include your name, address, the item you'd like to comment on, and your comment. It can be submitted up until noon Tuesday, July 21st, 2020, and reviewed by council as part of the record. General public comments, which should include your name, address, and your comment, can be submitted up to 30 minutes after the end of the virtual council meeting and will be included in the minutes of this meeting. Further details and instructions concerning public participation in virtual meeting are referenced in the City of Homestead Virtual Meetings Quick Start Guide located on the city's website. Roll call, Madam Clerk. Councilman Shelley. Here. Councilman Ross. Here. Councilwoman Bailey. Here. Councilman Fletcher. Here. Councilwoman Avila. Here. Vice Mayor Pierre Saggers. Here. Mayor Lawson. Here. Are there any additions, deletions, or deferrals? No, ma'am. Mr. Attorney? Mr. Mayor, with your permission, I'd like to request a motion to add a resolution approving a settlement agreement in a matter of early to the city of Homestead under my business later in the meeting? Just the one? Uh, for this evening, yes. No, no, no. Yeah, okay. For just that one yes. settlement agreement in the early case? Yes, for now. Okay. Thank you. Um, I am going to um, withdraw um, the item under my business for tonight, the, appoint the reappointment of a member of the police pension board. Um, I'm going to, uh, to withdraw that for the time being. Uh, next item is the consent agenda. Oh, I'm sorry, let's back up. We need a motion to add the request of the attorney uh, later tonight, uh, to be added under his business later tonight. Move a pool. We have a, mo we have a motion by Mr. Fletcher, a second. I believe that was Councilwoman Bailey. Yes. Any questions or comments on that item from members of council? Is there anyone who would like to be recorded as a no vote on this matter? All right, next item four on our agenda, the approval of the, um, the consent agenda, tabs number one through eight. We have a motion for approval. Move for approval. Moved by Councilwoman Avila. Do we have a second? Second. Seconded by Councilman Ross. I would just like to have the minutes uh, reflect that uh, I am voting nay on the uh, tab three, the um, adoption of the proposed operating millage rate and debt service rate for fiscal year 2021. Any further questions or comments from council? Is there anyone who would like to be registered as a no vote on the consent agenda other than as uh, I stated? Motion carries. 
Next item, public hearing. Item five. Um, Mr. Uh, White, are you in it? Yes, Mayor. Uh, this is the quasi-judicial section of the agenda. Please be advised the following items on the agenda are quasi-judicial in nature. If you wish to comment on any of these items, please indicate the item number you would like to address and the announcement regarding the quasi-judicial item is made. An opportunity for persons to speak on each item will be made available after the applicant and staff have made their presentations on each item. Swearing in, all testimony, including public testimony and evidence, will be made under oath or affirmation. Additionally, each person who gives testimony may be subject to cross-examination. If you do not wish to either be cross-examined or sworn, your testimony will be given its due weight. The general public will not be permitted to cross-examine witnesses, but the public may request the council to ask questions of staff or witnesses on their behalf. The full agenda packet on each item is hereby entered into the record. Persons representing organizations must present evidence of their authority to speak for the organization, and further details of the quasi-judicial procedures may be obtained from the clerk. In accordance with Code Section 2-591, any lobbyist must register before addressing the council on any of the following items. At this time, council members must disclose any ex parte communications concerning items 9 through 12 on the agenda. I'd like to disclose that since our last meeting, I, as I disclosed ex parte communications at that point, I have uh, received additional ex parte communications from, from various parties on what we call the copart application. Mr. White? Yes. I'd like to also uh, expose that I had uh, discussions on uh, Copart and the John Alger issue. Okay, Th this is only for tabs 9 through 12. Uh, if anyone uh, has had conversations on the Copart, uh, that's a legislative matter, not quasi judicial, so there's no need to. Uh, disclose those ex parte communications. Thank you. Okay. Hearing no further uh, comments at this time, Mayor, at this time, the, uh, I'll ask the clerk to swear in any persons who wish to testify on uh, tabs 9 through 12. Please raise your right hand and repeat after me. I hereby I swear right. affirm. Hereby swear affirm. Firm. The information I present, the, the information I present, shall be the truth. Shall be the truth. Shall be the truth. And nothing but the truth. And, and nothing, nothing but the truth. And nothing but the truth. So help me God. So help me God. God. Thank you. Mayor Tabs nine and ten uh, are related. They pertain to a proposed uh, uh, IHOP restaurant. Um, we, I can introduce both of those. You can have a collective uh, public hearing discussion on those and take a separate vote at the end of your deliberations, if that's the will. Uh, any objections from council on that procedure? All right, please proceed, Mr. White. All right, tab nine is a resolution of the City of Homestead, Florida, granting a waiver of plat requested by Sunshine Realty Partners, LLC for the division of two parcels totaling approximately 2.10 acres, generally located north of Southeast Third Street, east of South Homestead Boulevard, south of Northeast Second Drive, Maui Drive, and west of Southeast Fifth Avenue, as legally described in Exhibit A and providing for an effective duty. Tab 10 is a resolution of the City of Homestead, Florida, granting site plan approval requested by Sunshine Realty, LLC, for a 4,000 540 square foot restaurant on an approximately 1.05 acre parcel, generally located north of Southeast Third Street, east of South Homestead Boulevard, south of Northeast Second Drive, and west of Southeast Fifth Avenue, as legally described in Exhibit A and providing for an effective date. Thank you, Mr. White. Uh, Mr. Cordina? Yes, sir. Thank you. <clears throat> on, on both of these, the uh, staff recommends that the mayor and council approve both the waiver of plat 
and the site plan for the IHOP that is uh, going on, uh, on on US-1 south of the, uh, the existing uh, 7-Eleven. Effectively, a waiver of plat is really an administrative plat, shortcutting the plat process where we do it in-house, not having it go through uh, the lengthy county process. We looked at the waiver of plat and we looked at the uh, site plan and uh, we believe that both are fit our codes. The land use and zoning are both compatible uh, with one another. Um, and so uh, this is something that uh, should be, that we are recommending approval. Uh, so uh, with that, I'll answer any questions. Thank you. Council? Oh, is the applicant's representative present? Would they like to uh, introduce themselves and uh, add anything further to either of these items? No one present on behalf of the applicant? Uh, yes, Mayor, I believe that the applicant is present. And there's also a PowerPoint presentation that they've submitted. Okay. Uh, do you have that or is that, or do we need to have the clerk uh, go ahead and, and start that? I did not receive that PowerPoint presentation, Michelle. The IT department has it. Do, do you want me to play it now? Let, let's do that. Welcome to our presentation of the new IHOP store for Homestead. We don't see it. The architectural rendering of our future store in Homestead features our modern upgraded design. This includes wood and stone accents with brand recognition of our iconic blue roof and IHOP signage. Good. The store will be lushly landscaped and provides a welcoming presence in the community. This photo shows what the actual store in Homestead will look like. Our design team has also worked on modernizing and improving our interiors. We have added more booth spaces with USB connections and higher booth backs, giving our customers convenience and privacy. Our new stores employ 80 team members from the local community, bringing new jobs to residents. International House of Pancakes was successfully opened in 1958. In 1973, the acronym IHOP was introduced for the first time. Through our 60-year history, IHOP has opened over 1,600 stores across the country and worldwide. The last iconic A-frame was built in 1979. In 2006, the design team introduced the new Icon building and ushered in a new look for IHOP's family dining experience. Two thousand and fifteen brought us a new look with wood exterior siding, standing seam awnings, and new IHOP logos. The interior of the stores also received an update with modern conveniences. For over sixty years, IHOP has provided a family friendly atmosphere that has served breakfast, lunch, and dinner to families creating memories for millions. We pride ourselves on our core values, integrity, doing the right thing, excellence, expecting the best of our team members and ourselves, innovation, creative ways to delight our guests, 
and community, involving ourselves within the community we serve. Part of our core values is giving back to the community. Our chosen charity is the Children's Miracle Network. Across 154 locations in Florida and Southern Georgia, we have collected over $1.5 million in the last two years through National Pancake Day and our fall campaign. Our local stores are also involved in other various charities and give of their time and resources. In closing, we would like to thank you for the opportunity to bring a new and exciting restaurant to your community. We hope to serve you delicious pancakes soon. Well, thank you to our IT department for uh, getting that up for us. Are there uh, any initial questions or comments from council on this item? I have one comment and one question, please. Yes, I think this would be for the applicant. I saw on some of the plans the removal of the side signage and just the IHOP was left with a smile. Is that something that would be the case for the location here in Homestead? <laughs> The applicant's not going to they can speak. Yeah. Um, she was going to ask, you were asking the applicant, Ms. Bailey? Or, or if you have the answer. I can answer if you all would approve of me answering. Yes, please. Sure, please. Betty Antonio with Sunshine Restaurant Partners, LLC. Um, we do plan to put signage on the building as per code. Um, the side that is the front would have the IHOP restaurant plus the IHOP smiley face. Okay, thank you. Uh, I just wanted to also comment that I really like the more modern look of the interior and appreciate the wood facade. And as this being one of my son's favorite restaurants, that's, uh, <laughs> that's nice to know. <laughs> we have an upgraded IHOP now in our area. So thank you. And thank you for your continued work with the community and the kids. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councilwoman Bailey. Anything further from Council? Well, then I'll open this matter up to public comment. Is there any member of the public who is online with us who would like to speak on this matter? Not appearing, I'd like to add that from my perspective, I, I've received been made aware of no, no written comments on this item. So then I would look to council for a um, motion for approval of um, tab nine. I'll move it. Moved by Councilwoman Bailey. I'll second. Second by Councilwoman Avila. Anything further from council? Did any member of council wish to be uh, registered as a no vote on tab nine? Not appearing, Madam Clerk, it seems that the motion carried for approval of uh, R number 2876, the waiver file approval for Sunshine Realty Partners. Moving on to tab 10. Do we have any further questions or comments from council? Would anyone from the public like to speak to this matter? Not appearing, do we have a motion for council on item number 2877, site plan approval for Sunshine Realty Partners LLC, tab 10 on the agenda? I'll move it again. Moved by Councilwoman Bailey. Okay. And it's been seconded. Uh, was that the Vice Mayor or Avala? All right, do we have anything further from council? Would anyone wish to be recorded as a no vote on a motion to approve tab 10, the site plan approval for Sunshine Realty Partners, LLC? Then appearing in, Madam Clerk, it appears that this uh, uh, motion carries for approval. 
Thank you. We look forward to it to the applicant. Appreciate Thank you, Honorable it. Mayor and Congress, uh, uh, Councilman and women and, and staff. Thank you very much. We're looking forward to working with you. All right. And Mr. Howard, just for the record, if you would give us your name and title and address for the record. My name is Chris Howard. I'm Vice President of Construction for Sunshine Restaurant Partners. Thank you very much. All right. Next item, tab 11, Mr. White. Yes, Mayor. This is a resolution of the City of Homestead, Florida, granting site plan approval requested by Holiday Professionals, LLC, for an approximately 16,153.33 square foot industrial warehouse facility on an approximately 0.62 acre parcel located at 146 Southwest 2nd Avenue in the city as legally described in Exhibit A and providing for an effective date. Thank you, Mr. White. Mr. Cordino? Yes, sir. Staff recommends that the mayor and council approve the site plan request for this uh, 16,000 square foot facility. The applicant, Holiday Professionals LLC, um, is building this in the southwest neighborhood on about uh, 0.62 acre of a part, acre of land. The property is currently uh, zoned southwest planned urban neighborhood, uh, and it's got an industrial uh, use sub area, and it's got a future land use designation of planned urban neighborhood. The proposed use is permitted and compatible with the industrial sub area located within uh, the southwest neighborhood, so we are recommending approval, and I can answer any questions that you have. Thank you, Mr. Cordino. Council, any questions yes, of our planner? Is the applicant present? Would the applicant wish to speak on this matter? Uh, Mr. Mayor, my name is Alan Lerner. I'm the architect for the project uh, and representing uh, the owner's uh, holiday professionals this evening. As well, we have submitted a uh, PowerPoint presentation. Sure, uh, sure. You know. Whenever our um, staff is ready to play it, we're ready to watch it. Thank you, Mr. Lerner. Mr. Mayor, council members, yes. good evening. My name is Alan Lerner. I am the architect for the Holiday Professionals Warehouse Project, public hearing number 19-020. My office address is 13190 Southwest 134 Street, Miami, Florida 33186. However, I'm speaking to you today from my home in the Redland. I am registered as a lobbyist with the city clerk's office. Our project is located at 146 Southwest 2nd Avenue. This address is part of the Southwest Neighborhood Master Plan. Holiday Professionals is currently operating from a building that they own immediately west of the new project. They also lease space at a warehouse near Eureka Drive. It is intended that all operations and employees will be consolidated at this homestead location. Holiday Professionals has a very interesting business. They supply, install, and store holiday decorations as a service to significant businesses and institutions. Among their clients are Baptist Health, Miami International Airport, Ocean Reef Club, and others. On this slide, we see recent installations at Malibu Bay Club, Homestead Hospital, and Ocean Reef Club. Our site plan shows the building at the northwest corner of Southwest 2nd Street and 2nd Avenue. The building is 16,154 square feet. There are 17 parking spaces provided. A significant advantage and incentive of the Southwest Neighborhood Master Plan is that it allows for the development of on-street parking to meet the standards for required parking. This is a drawing from the Master Plan illustrating the geometry, design, and required landscaping for a 50-foot right-of-way, as is our case at Southwest 2nd Avenue.
You can see that we developed the on-street parking in strict accordance with the standards provided in the master plan. This master plan incentive resulted in approximately 5,000 square feet of allowable additional space over what have would been allowed with only off-street parking. Our floor plan is divided into three basic sections. Decorating at the bottom of the plan is the operational area where the decorating raw materials are assembled into the finished holiday pieces. The warehouse area is for the storage of both raw materials as well as finished pieces that are stored season to season for reuse. And the shipping area is ramped up to dock height for access to two truck bays. The building is fully equipped with a central station monitored fire alarm and automatic sprinkler system. This sketch is an example from the master plan of Florida Caribbean vernacular architectural style. Buildings within the master plan area are expected to incorporate design elements to show compatibility with these styles. The master plan did not provide a specific example for a warehouse. My idea was to try to achieve a sympathetic, rustic sort of cannery row appearance. This was acceptable to staff through the DRC process and was very well received by the P&Z board. It is important to note that our project did not seek, nor does it require any variances or special exceptions whatsoever. The application was approved unanimously by the P&Z board. I would like to reiterate, as I did at the P&Z hearing, what a pleasure and professional experience it was to work with staff here at the City of Homestead. Michelle, David, Alessandra, and Eddie all provided help and a positive, proactive environment for the project. This concludes our presentation. We hope and expect that you will look favorably upon our project. Thanks again. Thank you, Mr. Lerner. We appreciate that. Um, My pleasure, Mayor. Yeah, thank you. Um, I have a question. You mentioned you're going to move your entire operation to Homestead. Uh, is that going to include adding some jobs or just the employees that you bring with you? Well, they fully expect to add jobs, uh, Mayor. The, the decorating area that we're providing in this new facility is four times the size of the decorating area they currently are working with in the building that they have uh, to the west. They're also very fortunate. If you look at who their clientele are, and if you think about the fact that the, uh, the holiday season um, it will be with us, we hope forever and ever and ever, There's their, their business has a bright future, notwithstanding the challenges that we have otherwise. So they're, they're very um, positive about uh, expanding their business, getting more business, especially having more space to, uh, to store the, uh, the holiday decorations uh, year to year. That's an issue for them now. They've been forced to uh, go and lease space, as I mentioned in the presentation, and so they want to bring that all together. But yes, they fully expect to expand the amount of employees that they will have, uh, especially in the decorating uh, area. The decorating, the, the assembly of the pieces goes on year round because they know what is going to be needed uh, each year coming up and uh, what has to be made new, what has to be repaired. And uh, that, that process goes on uh, year round. Thank you, Mr. Warner, and you answered what my next question was going to be about whether or not this was an ongoing year-round jobs provider. It's not just a seasonal thing that this is uh, providing full-time, everyday jobs. We're just not going to have a building that is dormant most of the year. So, right. Absolutely. They, they have, obviously, 
a, um, a you know a, a, a rush season when when the installations have to be done. Uh, they I'm sure take on uh, some temporary employees for the uh, for the installations. I recently visited their other facility uh, up at um, near Eureka Drive, and there were guys. Uh, actually, what they were doing, they were uh, welding together Hanukkah menorahs that were about six feet high. Uh, so yes, the uh, the fabrication of the of the pieces goes on year round. Thank you. And um, one another question I had was, I guess your your trucks would be stored outside there in front of that loading bay. Is that correct? Well, that we, it, there is a um, a very precise uh, requirement for a loading area. Um, and if it were in in this particular case, Southwest Second Avenue, in accordance with the diagrams given in the master plan, Southwest the Second Avenue is considered the front of the building. There was a requirement that the parking area for the trucks, the loading area for the trucks, could not start until 24 feet back from the uh, the right of way area. So if, if you look back at the at the cycling, you'll see that there's a, a narrow drive coming in. It widens out uh, to, to that uh, area so that the two trucks they generally use box trucks is is what are used to uh, to take the things back and forth from the installation sites. Well, and I guess my concern was, and I'll look to Mr. Corradino for this. Yeah, it's it's impressive that you're providing on street parking and right of way enhancements. But I'm not certain that we want to see this evolve into as your business expands and evolves that we have box trucks parked out on the street all the time. Are you asking me or Mr. Cordino? Uh go to Mr. Cordino first. Okay. We can uh Mayor, we we can they have ample parking on site where they can um they can uh uh, load and unload the trucks. That's really what that parking lot is for. It's really a, a big loading area, so that should be sufficient. Okay, and otherwise sufficient parking for the number of employees? Yes, sir. All right, so, and, and I guess although in our package it's called a warehouse, it's it's much more than just a warehouse. Uh, it is. It's it's an operational area as well. Thank you. Thank you. Council, any questions for the applicant? I do, please. Yes. Thank you, Mayor. Yes. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you, Mr. Lerner. And to the applicant, thank you personally for bringing this to the Southwest. Um, I'm definitely in support of this. I'm excited about it. I'm really happy to see the sidewalk improvements. At this point, it has been and will continue be to be something moving forward that we need to ask for all of our businesses, especially coming into the Southwest, that they really look at the entire lot and um, and do those much needed sidewalk improvements. I really like the design, the Florida Caribbean vibe. I can see that there's a piece of historic downtown moving into modern. So I do appreciate that, Mr. Lerner. Um, and one quick question. You mentioned that this would be four times the size of the current of the current building. How many employees do you, do you have right now? I, I didn't mean that the building would be four times the size. Well, the building is probably about twice the size. But there's, the a, there's, a, there's a decorating area within the existing building. And uh, I, I think um, I can't be exactly sure on this, but I think that they have uh, about six or seven employees currently in that area. Okay, so you're thinking that it would be four times the Well, the, sure, yes. There's an opportunity to uh, to be able to go in and have, let's say, 20 or 25 employees. There'll be room enough for that if they can generate the business. And I, I'm really very uh, uh, impressed with what they're doing. Uh, I'm intrigued by it. I had never known there was a business like this. They have a niche that they've been very successful in, uh, in uh, you know, turning into a, a, a very decent business. Um, and that's what they want to do. Uh, they, 
They want to they want to enhance and increase that business, and that'll certainly result in additional employment. Great, thank you very much. We definitely need a very cheery and merry Christmas this year. All right, thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Councilwoman Daly. Anything further from Council? Mayor. Sure, Mr. Shelley. Yeah, I just wanted to thank the applicant. I think since I've set up there on Council, this may be the the first applicant that's applied for the Southwest under the Southwest Master Plan hasn't requested a variance or a complete remodel of the Southwest Master Plan as a condition of, of building their project. So I, I appreciate the applicant coming in and you know trying to meet the spirit of what um, was envisioned by the Southwest Master Plan and bringing a high quality and high, higher end product warehouse um, to the area. So I, I just wanted to thank him publicly. Thank you, Mayor. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Councilor Shelley. Council. All right. Are there any questions or comments from the public? Would anyone from the public like to speak on this matter? Hey, Mayor. Uh, Yaniel from IT here. Just for for um, clarification, the the members of the public, if they want to speak, if they can raise their hand using the application, or if they're calling in, just do the start start three on their telephone to raise their hand and start three to lower it. Okay, thank you. All right, so um, would IT see that, that that indication of wishing to speak? All right. Oh, Mr. Horner, I just want to add one thing. It's interesting that you mentioned the Cannery Row look. And yes, I don't sir. know that you're aware of this, but the last building that was on that site was the 1930s era tomato cannery wow going way way back i i, I was curious about that because the the, the uh, floor slabs are still there and i was very curious about what might have been there before that's interesting it was and it was probably you know close to 100 percent coverage a two-story you know heavy stucco building with a sign painted on the on the wall and maybe we can dig deep into some archives somewhere and, and find a picture of that to, to place in your uh, in, in the facility. Uh, That'd be so great. Really, really, really interesting that you, you know, made that reference to uh, yeah. the Cannery Row. And that certainly was in the heyday of, of homestead agriculture. All right, do we have a motion for approval of um, car number um, 2875, tab 11. Site plan approval for Holiday Professionals, LLC. I move it. Moved by Councilwoman Bailey. Second. Second by Councilman Fletcher. Any further from Council? Any member of Council wish to be designated as a no vote on this matter? Not appearing, the motion carries unanimously. All right, Mr. Wonderful. White, next item. Thank you. Thank you, Council. Thank you. Yes, Mayor, moving on to tab 12. Tab 12 is a resolution of the City of Homestead, Florida, approving a special exception requested by Jesus A. Rilnos to permit the development of a single family dwelling unit on an approximately 0.16 parcel within the multiple apartment R3 zoning district located at 915 Northeast Third Avenue, as legally described in Exhibit A, and providing for an effective date. Thank you, Mr. White. Mr. Cordina. Yes, sir. The staff recommends that the mayor and council approve the resolution granting the special exception to permit a single fam the development of a single family dwelling unit on the parcel in the multiple apartment R3 zoning district uh, at this location. This had gone through the planning and zoning board in in February and was approved by a 5-0 vote. Uh, effectively, you're allowed by right to do a single family home in R1 or R2, um, but if you do it in R3, you need to come for a special exception. Uh, and the special exception has uh, seven criteria, one of which is temporary events, so it's not applicable. Um, these criteria are compatib compatibility with the surrounding properties, traffic, consistency with the comp plan, compliance with the code, design compatibility, and then timing and pattern of development. We evaluated the uh, development on all these categories. We feel that it fits very well. Um, and so we're recommending.
planning approval. Thank you, Mr. Cordino. Council, or is the applicant present? Anyone on behalf of the applicant? We can, yes. Can you hear me? All right, the applicant is here. On behalf of Susan Ariano, he's not here in this moment. All right, thank, thank you. Um, any questions from council? Mayor, the applicant did prepare a presentation if the council would like to hear it. Council, uh, what's your pleasure? Do you, would you like to enter the presentation in the record and view it? I would. All right, let's do that. Thank you. Uh, Mayor, IT here, also for clarification, this presentation has audio on the first slide only, and then it just transitioned through the other slide, just to avoid confusion. Thank you. The intention of this process is to apply for a permit to build a 2,981 square foot new single family house into an R3 zoned vacant lot with an area of 7,115 square feet. Our design is clear and modern. A one-story home with a sloped roof and tile finish that complies with all requirements and codes for the City of Homestead and Florida Building Code and gives the neighborhood a fresh and new look without it affecting our neighbors. It is in our best wishes that our neighborhood enjoys and feels the winds of modernity and that our neighbors are proud to live here. Okay. Thank you. Um, is there anyone from the public who would like to speak on this matter? Uh, Mayor, yeah, IT again, yes. I see that uh, Tina Barker has the uh, hand on. Up. Oh, Tina Barker? All right, Ms. Barker? Yes. Please go ahead, give us your name and address for the record. Okay, I am, I am, uh, I'm so sorry, I'm having some trouble with my thing. Oh my goodness. Oh, no, 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 cancel that. I'm so sorry. I'm, I'm waiting for the next. Okay, process. thank you. I'm sorry. <laughs> thank you. All right, anyone else from the public? We have a motion for approval on um, car number 2879, tab 12 from council. Do we have a motion for approval? I move it. We have a motion for approval. I'll second. We have a second from Councilwoman Bailey. I believe the first was from Councilwoman Avila. Uh, any further from Council? Would any member of Council wish to be recorded as a no vote on this matter? And uh, congratulations to the Arianas family. Uh, best wishes in your uh, in your new home. I'm certainly. Uh, Heartened to see um, more trend toward um, single family and what had been higher density uh, neighborhoods. Well, thank you. Motion carried. All right. Is the next item on to Mr. Pearl? Yes, <clears throat> Mayor. That concludes your quasi judicial items for this evening. Uh, moving on to legislative matters. Uh, your first uh, legislative matter this evening for consideration 
is the first reading of an ordinance of the City of Homestead, Florida, amending the Master Development Plan for the Homestead Park of Commerce, located within the Villages of Homestead Development and Regional Impact, requested by a co-part of Connecticut, Inc., to allow vehicle storage, no sales, as a permitted use within the Homestead Park of Commerce, providing for conflicts, providing for severability, and providing for an effective date. This is first reading. Thank you. Mr. Cordino? Yes, sir. Uh, staff recommends that the mayor and, count and council deny this request to amend the previously approved master plan at the Homestead Park of Commerce to modify the permitted land uses listed in the plan to include vehicle storage with no sales as a permitted use. <clears throat> um, the Planning and Zoning Board also recommended a denial uh, for the proposed modification uh, by a 4-0 vote in December of 2019. Um, at the request of the applicant, the City Council deferred the proposed text amendment um, in January uh, and, and again in February. And uh, so that's where, and then March was canceled because we started with the uh, pandemic. So as background, um, essentially what's happening here is the applicant is seeking to purchase and develop approximately 98 acres of the remaining 275 acres in the Park of Commerce, or about 35% of the remaining acreage uh, for vehicle storage, no sales, uh, for on-site or off-site or online auctions resale and remarketing of the damaged or inoperable vehicles. Uh, vehicle storage is not permitted in this area. And it's certainly not permitted uh, in the code in this area. Our code essentially defines what the applicant is attempting to do as a junkyard. Uh, a junkyard is a building, structure, yard uh, for disposing storage of secondhand motor vehicles and those types of things. Uh, effectively, the only difference uh, between what the applicant is saying they're doing and a junkyard is the semantics of whether the sales happen on site or uh, through an auction. Um, aside from that, the proposed amendment would result in approximately 21,000 inoperable or barely operable vehicles on these 98 acres. The visual impact of 21,000 inoperable vehicles um, adjacent to the expanding industrial facilities, residential areas, educational facilities, uh, water uh, retention areas, uh, and potential economic opportunities uh, creates a blight um, for the remaining 177 acres within there. We do not agree with the applicant that constructing an eight foot masonry wall with landscaping around it would greatly re reduce the visual impact of that large uh, majority of vehicles, um, which will be a, a five or six feet in height. I mean, the, there are adjoining multi-story buildings, structures, schools, residential areas that will be able to see over the uh, eight foot walls. Um, the proposed amendment uh, is again intended to, to uh, limit it to the 98 acres. The applicant has also with this proffered a set of declarations, a right of way deed and uh, a, a park to be used for the public. With that, I'm here to answer any questions. Thank you. Council, any questions for our planning director before we hear from the applicant or their representative? Well then, hearing none, let's uh, kick it off and uh, please uh, please identify yourself as to, uh, do you have a video presentation or who will be first speaking on behalf of the application? Good evening, Mayor and Council. My name is Tracy Slavens. Address is 701 Brickell Avenue, Suite 3300. I have prepared a PowerPoint presentation and your IT department should have it loaded and ready to play. I hope. <laughs> Good evening. My name is Tracy Slavens and my address is 701 Brickell Avenue, Suite 3300. I'm here on behalf of Copart for the first reading of the Homestead Park of Commerce PUD modification. I'm joined virtually by my colleague Mercy Arce, by Ken Huck and Bucky Carson from Copart, Alberto Herrera from Kimley Horn, Andy Dolcart from Miami Economic Associates, Henry Eiler from Eiler Planning, and by Itai Kathleen and Frank Escalante the owners of the property. We're back before you tonight after many interesting months, to say the least. Since February, a lot has happened. We're in the midst of the worst pandemic the world has seen in 100 years, and our residents and our economy are suffering. Our future is uncertain, 
And in addition to the COVID crisis, we're in the middle of a hurricane season that NOAA has predicted will be above average. It's a lot. Meanwhile, tonight is the first time you're hearing a zoning item as a virtual council, and it's one that has a lot of people talking, some good and some questioning. So before I start, and in order to condense my presentation, I want to incorporate the public hearing testimony from the February 19th council meeting as part of this record. Since February, when the application was deferred to allow us some time to reach out to our neighbors, particularly the Keysgate Community Association, we've spent a significant amount of time working through questions and concerns, and we've been able to win their support. The reason why that this is, a, is that this is a good project. It's good for the city and it's good for the community. Some of those reasons are up on your screen and I'll walk you through all of them during my presentation. As a refresher, Copart is in the Homestead Park of Commerce, which is part of the Villages of Homestead DRI that was approved in 1975. The DRI vests the area for 3.1 million square feet of industrial use, and the Homestead Park of Commerce PUD allows light manufacturing, distribution, warehouse, and trailer parking uses, and it also places an emphasis on the technology industry. Lastly, it's also within the Homestead Air Reserve Base Accident Potential Zone 2, which has many restrictions on the uses of the property. Despite the fact that the DRI was created 45 years ago and the master plan and its vested rights were established 10 years ago, this project still struggles to attract business with only one new user every two years at best. Most of the area remains vacant and blighted. As of this year, only seven parcels in the park are developed. Three parcels are government owned and that's not on the city's property tax roll. And only two privately owned parcels have been developed in the past 10 years, which is not commensurate with the market. The last 10 years have been a time of significant economic expansion in South Florida and nationwide. Yet 79% of the Homestead Park of Commerce remains undeveloped. Finally, the city has been able to attract an S&P 500 company with Copart and their purchase of 98 acres. Copart will clean up the Homestead Park of Commerce, bring additional tax revenue to the city, add value to the community as a private partner, and most importantly, make a multi-million dollar investment in Homestead, all while protecting the Air Force Base from encroachment. Development of these parcels is not an easy task. The elevation of this site is less than 1.75 NGVD. The ground is as blue as the lake from the elevation standpoint. Over 51 out of 60 acres are wet six months of the year and are federally designated wetlands. So significant mitigation is required to drain and fill the land to make it usable. And this will cost $15 million to do. In February, we spoke at length about the economic benefits and the reality of development in the PUD, along with job creation. At the last meeting, there was a suggestion that the land could be developed with uses that create 50 jobs per acre. This simply isn't true, and I'm not just saying that. We hired Andy Dolcart, a Harvard-educated economist and the president of Miami Economic Associates, to study the property and PUD and render his expert opinion. Andy has over 45 years of experience working with city and private clients. Andy's specialty is the economics of real estate development, specifically in Florida, the Caribbean, and Central and South America. He's considered one of the leading experts in the state of Florida with respect to the economics of community development. Andy analyzed the project at length and prepared a report that was submitted to the city in March and is incorporated as part of the record of this application. What he found is that of the potential users for this site, Copart is ideal. The property is severely limited by the Homestead Air Reserve base restrictions. The APZ guts the ability to create jobs on this site. And so the fact that the city was able to recruit a $20 billion company to this site that will require upwards of $50 million of investment to make usable is a win. No one else would do this, nor could anyone else justify this kind of expenditure to their shareholders. Now this site may not create jobs on site, but it creates important indirect jobs. Tonight, you'll hear from employees from Copart's Princeton site, which has 17 employees, and of those, eight live in Homestead with their families. You'll also hear from business partners that are located in Homestead, owned and operated in Homestead, and hire people from Homestead. These include tow companies, service vendors, 
car dealers, insurance companies, and independent adjusters. Another question was raised about whether taking 98 acres for Copart was going to impact the ability to attract industrial uses to Homestead. The study shows that there are 365 acres of available industrial land in the area after Copart comes in. Between the cost of buying the land and mitigating the wetlands, Copart will be spending upwards of $50 million on the property. Again, no one else would do that. Copart's purchase of the land will create a major new favorable comp and will raise the standard for future sales in the area. The report confirms that Copart's investment will increase the property value by over $30 million. Remember, this site is considered to be wetlands today and is assessed at a very low rate. And other properties in the Park of Commerce have agricultural designations, which our property would also be eligible for. If Copart comes in, the result will yield a revenue increase for the city of $2.75 million over the next 10 years through property taxes alone. And these increases will take effect as soon as fiscal year 2021. This additional revenue is critical during these challenging economic times. The report also looked at the base and showed that it's the Copart coming in is one less obstacle to its expansion and winning the F-35s. The base generates $331 million for the local economy with 1,400 full-time jobs and 1,700 reservists. With the F-35s, the economic impact will increase with more jobs and more community investment. Lastly, the improvements outside of the property that Copart has committed to for the Lake Park and the community sponsorships total a million dollars. This is a win for Homestead. I want to pause here and reemphasize that the proposed use is not a junkyard. There will be no dismantling or deconstructing, crushing or compacting, piling or stacking, rebuilding or restoration of vehicles. And there will also be no on-site or in-person sales transactions here because this is not a junkyard. Copart is investing in the site to implement its disaster response model. When severe weather hits, Copart immediately deploys its catastrophic response team to begin recovery efforts. This is particularly important as every year feels like an above average year for storms. This map shows Copart strategically locates its cat sites. This one will serve the South Florida area south of Lake Okeechobee. They are in effect a first responder. There's a critical need in South Dade for a cat site due to the constant threat we're under for catastrophic impact from major hurricanes. Copart specifically plans for and responds to storm events. They act fast and expand operations before impact, and they serve as a front runner in any first recovery effort. There is also an economic benefit to this response. In a time of crisis, Copart spends real money in a community. $13 million was spent in Houston after Harvey, and $1.5 million was spent in Florida after Irma. This is critical when most businesses are forced to close and people aren't spending money as they try to recover. Copart is there to help and Copart invests. These are some examples of what a site looks like from above. It's clean, orderly, and cars are lined up in tandem spaces, not unlike a commercial parking lot. And this is the site plan for the vehicle storage facility on the north 38 acres. Again, it is designed to be a clean site with orderly grids for storage. This image is the rendered view from Park of Commerce Boulevard. We worked with Keysgate delegates to update this from the last time you saw it. We swapped the oak trees for green buttonwoods at their suggestion. These trees grow faster to maturity and will become shade trees much quicker than an oak wood. It was a great suggestion on their part and we were happy to agree to it. This is the street view cross section. As you can see from left to right with five rows of trees, an eight foot wall, and street trees in front of that, the, nothing within the property will be visible from the outside. At the last hearing, a question was raised as to whether the activities would be visible from the second floor windows of the homes backing onto Canal Drive. As you can see here, between the landscaping and the distance, the answer is no. The same is true for the new Lennar homes that will back onto Kingman. This is a shot to the 38 acre parcel. It's a distance of 2,300 feet, almost a half a mile. And this is a shot from the Kingman Road site to the 60 acre parcel, a distance of 900 feet. It is also clear here that there will be no visibility into the property. 
Many residents were also concerned about the truck routes that would be used to access the site. Traffic on Kingman Road was a major concern. This is Copart's primary truck route map to the site, and it shows very clearly that Kingman will not be used. We have committed to that. Trucks will access the site from the north using 137th Avenue and from the south using Palm Drive to 142nd Avenue. Staff is recommending denial of this application. However, we think they've reached the wrong conclusion. So we engaged Henry Eiler, the president of Eiler Planning, to review the application. Henry is an expert planner with more than 30 years of experience, including his work with the City of Homestead to author the city's own comprehensive plan. After his review of the file, the staff analysis, and his own independent research of the Park of Commerce Master Plan, the Zoning Code, and the Comp Plan, Henry concluded that the proposed text amendment is consistent with the overall intent, character, development, environmental, and scale principles and guidelines contained in the Park of Commerce Master Plan. A copy of Henry's report has been submitted as a part of this record. In conducting his analysis, Henry applied the three factors established by the code for approval of a PUD modification, and he concluded that the application satisfied the criteria for approval because of three reasons. One, there's no significant impact on facility and services. Two, the amendment is compatible with other development depicted on the master plan. And three, all other relevant planning factors were satisfied. Henry's review of the facts concluded that the use is wholly consistent with the Park of Commerce master plan. This PUD allows industrial uses. These include warehouse distribution and unlimited trailer storage, which means the use of vehicle storage is compatible. The project will also have no significant negative visual impact, and none of the operations will be visible from the outside, as you saw from the slide I just showed you. This use is specifically limited to the 98 acres that Copart has under contract, and with its significant improvements to the streetscape, it will encourage other investment in the Park of Commerce, which is a goal of the Park of Commerce Master Plan. The applicants have also submitted a declaration of restrictions in connection with this application. A draft was submitted to the city attorney back in February. The declaration of restriction prohibits all junkyard related uses to the property, including in-person sales transactions. It also benefits the air reserve base in that it prohibits public assembly uses and subjects the property to the regulations of the APZ2, which it was otherwise exempt from. In effect, Copart will remove the risk of incompatible uses on the property and create a permanent encroachment buffer for the base. Additionally, the base and the city's consent will be required for any modifications to the declaration of restrictions. Now, since the declaration was submitted, additional restrictions have been agreed to and will be incorporated into the draft before second reading. These include that we will not expand the permitted uses listed on the Park of Commerce Master Plan for the property for 20 years. We will not lease the site to a property that will not conduct a permitted use on the property. We've committed to the primary truck route, which will not include Kingman Road. We've updated the street trees to include green buttonwood trees, and if acceptable to the city, we'll include an art wall on the street facade of the project. Sponsorship of certain park improvements and activities have also been committed to in a private letter delivered to the Keysgate Community Association. There are other benefits to approving this application as well. Most importantly is first responder support. Even though this site will be vacant for the majority of the year, Copart allows the site to be used for first responder training. 50% of its facilities work with lo local law enforcement and EMS to allow them to train on their sites. These include SWAT, canine, and special operations because they can simulate scenarios here without risk to the public. Copart is also committed to fixing up the entrance feature to the Park of Commerce. As they say, you never get a second chance to make a first impression, and the entrance feature to the Park of Commerce today speaks to the overall blighted condition of the project. Copart will spend up to $25,000 to replace the lettering, repair and paint the wall, and add landscaping to enhance this entrance. Copart has also proffered improvements to the existing lake to create a new public open space. The PUD master plan specifically states that the Lake District is primary open space for repose and recreation within the Park of Commerce. In an effort to capture the vision and fulfill the expectations for the Lake Park, we're proposing a three-quarter mile track around the lake and an outdoor exercise area that'll feature low maintenance landscaping. 
The applicant is committing to financial contributions associated with the cost to bring this public benefit to fruition and potentially fund maintenance for a number of years. We've had preliminary meetings with the city manager and parks director, and we'll continue to work with them to implement this plan if the council would like us to move forward in making this a public park. But either way, it will be a publicly accessible open space. Since the beginning of this process, Copart has shown its commitment to be a part of and support the homesick community. Um, our last event with the city was the Seafood Festival, and it was a huge success. In summary, the list of benefits are extensive. The recovery work after weather events, the improvements to the Park of Commerce, the increase in tax revenues, the reduction in traffic, the partnership with law enforcement, the promotion of economic benefits citywide, sponsorship of community events and activities, new open space, and protection of the air reserve base are critically important to the city's success. So before I conclude, I do want to emphasize again that encroachment on the base is a real threat to its ongoing mission and expansion. There's a significant list of uses that the airport ordinance prohibits and that the base would have to if they were being proposed here. And that drives away a lot of people, a lot of investment, a lot of businesses. However, Copart is here and Copart complies. We understand the importance of the base to this community and to South Florida as a whole we're willing to step up to protect it. We hope this means that the base can win their bid for the F-35s. By way of example, in Madison, Wisconsin, the F-35 win was a huge boon to the city's economy. As Homestead begins its 2021 budget process and considers raising millage rates to compensate for budget shortfalls, we feel the acute pain of the COVID aftermath. Investment is more important than ever. Homestead needs Copart now and now is the time to approve this project. We have support from members of all sectors of the community and they have spoken. In addition to the survey results that we submitted at the last meeting and are part of the record, we have letters of support from a number of people. The base issued a no objection letter and former base commander Derek Rideholm issued an email in support. On Friday, the Keysgate Community Association transmitted a letter to the city expressing their support for the project. Together, we found solutions for their concerns. We've made changes to our primary truck route and street selection. We've agreed to leasing restrictions, and we've committed to supporting their efforts to encourage youth athletics with a sponsorship programming at the sports complex. Senator Annie Terry Flores submitted a letter to you in support, as did Northgate Community resident Chuck Butler. Homestead Youth Soccer organizers Lonnie and Kimberly Allen have written in support, as have various Park of Commerce businesses, including NWD USA, Goodman Distribution and Contender Boats, Jones Lang LaSalle, 336 Raceway, and various members of communities around the country, including municipalities where Copart is an active member. There is a clear consensus that Copart is good for the community. In conclusion, approval of this application will bring a major international publicly traded billion dollar company to Homestead. The presence of an S&P 500 company, along with significant improvements to the Park of Commerce, will serve as a catalyst to attract other business. All of this with no impacts to infrastructure or traffic. This would be a major economic win for Homestead at a critical time. I want to thank you for listening to this presentation and for your consideration. I also want to highlight that this request is only for 98 acres and will not apply to the rest of the Park of Commerce. So with that, I will conclude by asking you to please vote to approve this project. I'm here to answer any questions you may have along with Andy, Henry, and the Copart team, and I would also like to reserve time for rebuttal as needed. Thank you again and good night. Thank you, Ms. Slavens. Uh, anything further from any other member of your team before council kicks off their questions? Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, I'd like to let um, Henry Eiler just make a, a brief statement summarizing his report. I think in light of the staff recommendation, it's important that he speaks directly. Thank you. Mr. Iowa. 
Um, yes, members of the council, mayor and members of the council. Um, my name is Henry Eiler. I have my uh, uh, office at 1688 um, Meridian Avenue, Miami Beach. Um, I'm president principal of Lighter Planning Group. Uh, as uh, as Tracy mentioned, this is a uh, uh, this is a project uh, really in two phases. Phase one would be the 38 acres uh, for the vehicle storage use with no sales, uh, with the eight foot high wall with landscaping, and then phase two is the 60 acres, um, uh, of which at this point uh, only eight acres of that 60 would be developable, uh, uh, possibly without significant wetland mitigation fees. Um, the original Park of Commerce plan was created some 20 years ago. About 80% of the park uh, does remain uh, undeveloped today. Um, 17 acres of the park have been developed in the last 10 years. Uh, based on that absorption rate, the Park of Commerce has some uh, 50 plus years of um, inventory left, even if Copart is approved. Plus, as uh, Andy Dokart uh, had stated in his report, there's some 266 acres of vacant land around the Park of Commerce that can be used for uh, similar uses. Uh, it is in the planned regional activity center land use category, which does permit industrial uses, such as vehicle storage. Um, the industrial uses are also allowed in the PUD um, district. Um, provided they are free of nuisances, uh, and um, and the co-park such as dust uh, odors and noise, the co-park project has none of these nuisances that have been identified. The developer will also build the planned lake park, the uh, the uh, uh, walkway and running course around the park. Um, once again, a public benefit, uh, which is one of the primary reasons for the PUD process, is the is to have both a public and private benefits. Um, and there will be, of course, they're going to dedicate the right of way for the contender road, uh, one of the major uh, parts of the road system for the park that's been in place for over 20 years. And as, uh, as was um, estimated in the applicant's application, it'll generate about $160,000 uh, per year of additional city tax revenue over, um, over the next 12 years. You have, um, Three criteria in your uh, PUD code uh, to really um, determine whether an amendment is significant. The first criteria is the impact of the amendment on facilities and services. Uh, adding vehicle storage as a permitted use in the uh, Park of Commerce will have no negative impact on public services or facilities. In fact, as a planner of a many years, I have a hard time coming up with an industrial use that could have less impact. Um, it will meet or exceed all the city's um, adopted public uh, facility level service standards for things such as roads, drainage, and water. Um, the park system will be greatly improved with the, uh, with the improvements to the lake park. And of course, the road system will be improved with the roadway um, dedication for contender road. The second criteria, uh, the second criteria criterion for an amendment to a PUD is compatibility with other development on the master plan. The proposed uh, co-part use is very compatible with surrounding um, development now and in the future. Uh, the eight foot tall masonry wall with landscaping will mitigate any negative uh, visual impacts from the, uh, from the car storage and the use will generate no, nu no nuisance factors like traffic, noise, or, or dust. Um, the third criteria is any other factors that are raised by the director uh, uh, of the uh, department. Um, uh, it was stated that uh, in the staff report that possibly this is not a viable or visually appropriate type of use. Uh, I, I really feel the opposite. It's going to be, uh, it's really going to be a use that's very viable. This is a company that's putting millions of dollars um, uh, into this site if it's approved. Uh, certainly, they think it's viable and visually appropriate. It will have no visual impact uh, other than a landscape wall um, um, on the surrounding property. The use would not create any kind of negative visual impact, uh, in my opinion, as stated, uh, as was stated in the staff report. 
Um, and uh, in reality, the approval of vehicle storage with no sales would not really uh, open up uh, land uh, beyond this site. This is a very specialized use. Um, it's also I've got 52 acres of wetlands, which, which will give pause to any land developer in the future trying to develop this site. Um, and the fact that there'll be no sales or demolition uh, on the site uh, really makes this, uh, makes this a use that is fully compatible and consistent with your criteria for PUD amendments. I'd be glad to answer your questions. Thank you, Mr. Eiler. Um, all right, before we open comments from council, there's a couple of, a couple of housekeeping items I'd like to address with council and address to not only the applicant, but the owner. I'm sure they're in the audience and the representative is in the audience and then I'll reserve to uh, circle back around after others have had time to, uh, to speak. But I've got to be frank with you, since your first hearing, whatever it was back in January, February, um, probably January, I've had a lot of people talk about the money that's being thrown around town by Copart, and are they are they buying votes? Um, so, you know, I'm I'm big on transparency and and everybody being very forthright about about what's going on. Um, I would be interested if any member of council. Um, is involved in any not-for-profit or any other organization that has received a, uh, a contribution from anyone related to, to this application. And I'm not saying that it precludes any of us from participating. I think it, it lends a, a, an air of transparency and, and really forthrightness to the, to the consideration of, of this proposal. Now, and in that regard, I'll go first. It's no secret, I'm a member of the Rotary Club. The Rotary Club puts on the, uh, the Seafood Festival. It's been very successful. And Copart approached the club. I was not involved in, in those negotiations, but I, I'll disclose that I'm involved with the group that received a, a very generous sponsorship for the, for the Seafood Festival. Uh, and again, I'm not intimating that anyone is, is precluded. Um, personally, I, I'd like to know, I think the public would like to know, most importantly, I think the public would like to know, uh, as, as council um, makes their comments, uh, whether or not any of those uh, generous uh, gestures of financial support have been made. But I want to to first ask, and then I'll, I'll, I'll turn it over to council. You talk about the, the dedication of Contender Boats Road or whatever the name of it is. And that seems to be a, an offer only if this matter is approved. Yet clearly all your materials talk about how vital that road is to circulation and, and to promoting and helping other businesses um, within the park. And I will tell you that based on firsthand conversations with, with representatives, it is my perception that contender boats felt pressured into supporting this and that it was conveyed to me that threats were made that if they, if this approval was not granted, that that roadway would be, be closed off. So my initial question is, in a show of good faith, will the owner or whoever is, is uh, authorized to do that commit to dedicating that roadway now for the benefit of contender and others and any other future user before the vote is taken tonight? You know, certainly if this measure isn't passed, uh, I would feel that the owner is going to be uh, Casting about for other users, other other forms of development, and that roadway might as well go ahead and uh, and be legally dedicated as a as a public right of way. So at this point, my sole question is: Is there uh, a willingness to make that representation now that, irregardless of the outcome of this hearing um, or any extension of this hearing, 
that that roadway would be dedicated as the, the public roadway that was always intended. Mr. Mayor, um, the ownership is present on this meeting, virtual meeting. Um, I can tell you that from Coport's, Co Copart's perspective, um, they have every intention of, of deeding the road, um, but today Copart doesn't own it. So I, I would like um, one of the owners, which is Frank Escalante or Itai Caffeine, to be recognized so they can answer your question. Right, I understand. Right. If you're no longer representing both sides, I guess they're separately represented. And Yes, I, I would like to hear from them as well. Mr. Mayor, this is Frank Escalante. Thank you, Mr. Escalante. Give, for, the, for the record, give us your name and address, please. Francisco Escalante. My address uh, is 9451 Southwest 146th Street, Miami, Florida. And I'm part of the ownership group of homes uh, HPDG 1, 2, and 3, the owners of the property. And we do not have any interest in contender boat road um that should have been dedicated to the city years and years ago my understanding was a mistake that it wasn't dedicated to the city and we don't have any interest in either closing that road or maintaining ownership of that road does that answer your question well if you don't want to maintain ownership of the road the best way to do that is to go ahead and execute and record the right-of-way deed that's already been circulated. If I may, Mr. Mayor, a right-of-way deed needs to be accepted by an action of the council, so it would have to be a, a separate item on your agenda. Uh, the city attorney can probably confirm that, but if that's the case, we can we can find a way to put it on the next agenda. Well, that may very well be, but if action is taken tonight that is not in favor of Copart, We've got nothing. Uh, no, no big stick to 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 pursue this. And I, I guess I'm looking, at, and I guess tentatively, as part of this this application package, the attorneys, our planning staff, have already examined the right of way deed. And um, I guess my again my basic question is: Will the owners commit? to doing what is necessary, irrespective of the outcome tonight, to dedicate that right of way as, as anticipated it. And I know you uh, can't speak for them. Mr. Mayor, we're, we're absolutely w willing to consider it and you know move forward with the best interests of the city. Well, con con Congress. considering is is not much to hang my hat on. And let me be really clear. Contender is the fifth or sixth largest employer in our community. And their management confirmed with me yesterday that they have 262 direct employees on their payroll. And the project before us tonight contemplates zero full-time permanent jobs. That's a huge disparity. And in some of these materials we talk about, it's talked about Copart being good corporate citizens. And, and, and I understand that Copart's not the owner, but um, if, if I can't have something more concrete that the ownership would consider it, um, I, I see nothing on the horizon if this um, doesn't pass at, at tonight or at an extension of this meeting that probably the city and, and contender are going to have to hold hands and, and pursue litigation. So let's all, let's all do the right thing. I think you know, the, the testimony of Mr. Escalante was it should have been done years ago. It wasn't. Things happen. The economy went down the drain at about the time that was supposed to have been done. And um, I, I think that it's, a, it's an important question as to whether or whether or not um, we're going to take this off the tape. That issue, it has a huge issue for this community as to whether or not that, that elephant will be taken out of the room. So with, with that, um, I'll open it up for council questions and comments.
Council. Okay, I will start. Thank you, Dr. Um, we've had a long time to think about this. A lot of moving parts, a lot of things have changed, and a few things have stayed the same. And I appreciate and I understand PNZ's request to deny, but positives of this continue to outweigh the negatives for me. The improvements to the site, the improvements to the surrounding area is something that we have been in desperate need of for a long time now. Taking the encroachment risks off the table for the base, that's another big positive for me. And for those reasons alone, I think it will attract and encourage a lot more businesses. This is not the perfect thing for there. I want something with a lot of jobs. I want something that is... Yeah, something that we could be a little more proud of, let's say, but I can see I can see this being something that will grow the area and encourage new businesses. That's all I have for now. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Mr. Mayor? Mr. Roger. Good evening. Uh, just a uh, couple of my consent in here. Um, Initially, I had no uh, feeling uh, positive or negative against this project. I didn't think it was a bad idea, uh, but I also didn't think it was a good idea for this uh, particular use. Uh, after reviewing, uh, again, the uh, six paths and uh, the planning and planning board's uh, record of no um, I've had a lot of input with uh, the neighborhoods here in Keysgate. Uh, to include uh, my immediate neighbors, as well as having some discussions with uh, some of the delegates um, at the Keys Day community. And uh, as, as early as this morning, or as late as this morning, uh, a message went out from uh, one of the uh, delegate uh, basically stating that uh, based on the input from uh, those of the uh, delegates that had responded uh, uh, either for or against uh, the Keysgate Community Association or our delegates were not going to put a letter out either for or against uh, in relation to this issue concerning uh, the proposed use by the applicant. So based on those conversations uh, with my neighbors and uh, the voters of the city of Homestead, I will not be able to support this uh, application this evening. Thank you. Mayor, if I may? Yes, please. Thank you. Uh, so I'll start with um, that it's no secret that I am a board member of the great organization that is the Kiwanis Club of Homestead South Dade. And I can report that there have been no donations received or even offered for that matter. Um, from Copart or any of its affiliates. I have to admit I'm a tad jealous to say that, but neither here nor there. Uh, also, in regards to any affiliation that I may have with the base, there is none other than that I am married to a service member. I do not work for nor do I report to the Homestead Air Reserve base, and there is no conflict. So I do feel comfortable in discussing and deciding on this matter. I did think long and hard on this topic. I'm sure we all have. I attended many meetings on this, both in person prior to COVID quarantine and on the phone. I reviewed many messages, both in favor and against the project. So to say that this was a challenging decision is an understatement. Uh, many of the concerns raised in opposition to this project came from a good place and prompted me to dig deeper and to explore all the potential outcomes um, of having having co, uh, co part approved and not approved. The arguments against it uh, were received large and loud and clear. And so I, I even got videos of other facilities um, in Florida, which just made me decide I needed to go see this facility for, you know, the, the one that up north of here for myself with my own eyes. And I figured that that would drive a nail in the coffin. 
Uh, so I made an unannounced visit to the site. I don't know if any of my other colleagues, colleagues have. And as I drove by, I actually thought I was in the wrong place because it looked like a gated community. You see, I was looking for a junkyard. I was looking for cars parked along the street, easements. Uh, I was looking for rubbled ground, litter everywhere, or even a line of tow trucks to indicate that I was near some type of compound. But uh, I'll tell you what I what I didn't see. I didn't see any of that. I didn't see the cars. I didn't see the unkept or littered ground. I didn't see any traffic. Aside from construction vehicles attending to the project across the street, the, even the gate was open at the property. So as I drove by, I thought to myself, I remember thinking, okay, now I'm going to catch him. I'm going to see the oil spill. I'm going to see the, the car parts lying around and the, the mess that, that I'm hearing about, all the, all the chaos of what would be a junkyard in the neighborhood. And I was shocked. I had to check the address and the GPS a couple of times because I didn't believe I was in the right place. I just can't believe the rumors that I'm seeing being spread across the community. So I'm, I'm glad to see that there's been change of hearts among the communities. And, um, and I just don't believe that this would be a negative uh, project for our city. The, the building walls were clean. They were shaded by a canopy, just as we're seeing now in the presentation. And, and if it's even a fraction of what we're going to be expecting to get, then it's an automatic win for Homestead, I think. And I think it's a wake up call for the other businesses in our park of commerce, because I think Cole Park can be listed as a standard for that community, for all the upgrades they're gonna be doing to our entrance, to the lake, to the commitment that they are giving to the community. This is a standard that other businesses can look to for wanting to come do business with our town. So for, for those reasons and many others, I am going to be supporting this tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Councilwoman. Mayor, if I may. Sure, Councilman Roth. I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna take a little different uh, approach to this and ask uh, Development Services and Mr. Cordino a few questions about uh, additional uh, restrictions that may or may not be evident in the uh, proposed. Um, Proffers or declarations that they've given to us, and Joe, maybe you can answer, or, 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 or the Slavens, you might be able to answer this. Um, and it's it's all geared towards uh, the operation they have up in Princeton, which I've I've also visited myself. But that operation is is totally different than the operation that they're proposing here in Homestead, where there will be no uh, on-site sales, there will be no mechanical uh, performances made on any of the vehicles. But let me get to a few of my questions, uh, and hopefully, maybe this will clear up some of the, the 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 questions that others may have about this being a junkyard, which I don't believe it is. But my, one of my questions is, uh, and, and somebody can answer this. Is there any restrictions on a year-round usage at this property, or will this property be only used in the event of a natural disaster within within a certain region of South Florida? And is there a potential that this property will be improved and no vehicle will ever enter the property if there are no natural disasters. Uh, this is Joe Cordino. I, I see I do not see any restrictions like that in their declaration declaration of restrictions. Uh, Ms. Slavin may have more information, so I'll leave it to her to answer. Thank you, Mr. Cordino. Yes, so this property has been designed and the site plan um, that you saw for the 38 acres um, speaks to that as a catastrophic response site. Um, if this was going to be a year-round site that operated like the Princeton site, we would have submitted a site plan that would have shown buildings on it and, and had a totally different style of operation proposed for it um, with, with, you know, a different design and, and different infrastructure. So, um, you know, it is our intent to use this in times of, of catastrophe. 
uh, hopefully that will be never. Um, but you know, in between floods and hurricanes and fires, there there is something that that may occur throughout the course of the year that will activate the site. Right. Mr. Ross, that, that being said, there, there are no restrictions on its use uh, to that end. Right now, would it be uh, prudent to request something like that? Would it be uh, something we could do? Um, but the purpose of the question was to more so reiterate the fact that there is a potential that there will never be a vehicle on that property unless there is some type of a natural disaster. And then my follow-up question would be for, for that is after a natural disaster occurs and vehicles are brought to the property, how long are they projected to stay there and then the property be vacated again? Um, Councilman Roth, if I may, um, I have some members of the Copart corporate team on the line here. Um, we have Buckley Carson, who is the, the chief of development, and, and Ken Huck is the regional manager. I think Ken is probably best equipped to answer that question, but between uh, Buck and Ken, I, I think they can address the, those questions for you. Thank you. We can't hear. Um, Ken, Ken, can you unmute? Is that I don't know if, if IT has muted him or if he needs to unmute himself. Well, I think he was. It just sounded like he was. His, his hand is up. I can see that. Okay, I think you're unmuted, Ken. Ken, uh, you you were muted a second time. Try again. There you go. Oh, I think we're having trouble hearing him. Okay, so I'll, I'll do my best to try to answer. Um, the typical operation period for a site depends on the severity of the storm. Um, you know, if, if an Irma didn't create much damage, but uh, an Andrew does. So um, the average time um, that a, a property is used uh, as a CAT site is about six to eight weeks. It can be shorter or it can be longer. It, it really depends on the recovery period needed based on the scope of the disaster. But um, typically it's, it's not longer than three months. Okay, and then just one final question and then I'll, I'll, I'll uh, reserve time for follow-up. Um, I just wanna make sure that with the Princeton location being so close in proximity to our location that they wouldn't be allowed to use this facility as an overflow of vehicle storage on a temporary basis because that's what we're trying to avoid when it comes to um, creating the junkyard appeal or appearance. Um, but just not just to make sure that there, there's there's no opportunity for them to use this location as an overflow for the, the Princeton location. With that, somebody can respond if they wish. Mayor, uh, I'll, I'll step aside for now and listen for further comments. Thank you, Councilman Roth. Councilmember Roth, there is no restriction in the declaration that it wouldn't be used as an overflow. But to answer your question from a practical standpoint, the Princeton site just acquired an additional 50 acres of land um, off the 240th Street um, corridor right off 137th Avenue. So they've effectively added an enormous amount of capacity to that site for their daily operations. It's, it's not intended for those operations to be pushed over to Homestead. This is a CAD site. The, the, the Princeton site needs an office and, and they have um, employees who need facilities um, that aren't temporary. So the, the, everything that happens on Princeton stays in Princeton. Fair enough, Mayor. I'll, I'll yield for now. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Council? Mayor? Yes, Mr. Councilman Shelley. Thank you. Yeah, I think this is, I mean, this issue, we, we obviously debated out pretty much so in length um, during the last physical meeting we were all able to have prior to this COVID-19 pandemic. I know that we need, 
you know, had a lot of debate at that time. There was a lot of pros stated, a lot of cons stated, you know, for my purposes, my my position from that night really hasn't changed. Uh, you know, I, I would reference anybody that's watching this meeting to reference that meeting, um, you know, in the minutes of that meeting and the comments that I made and the reasoning I had at that time for uh, supporting the projects. Again, I'm not, I'm not thrilled about the projects. You know, I, I think then I stated I was 51:49 in favor of it, and I'm I'm still probably sitting at that location where ultimately I do think that the the facts and the benefits for the project outweigh the those against the project. Um, but again, it's not it's not if I had a magic wand and could ultimately determine what I wanted to go there, this would not be what I would choose. This is not necessarily the project that I would would be the most excited about. But I think the way I look at it and, and the way I look at it back then is the same now. I mean, you have two big issues I think that are, are most more most critical. And one is obviously protecting the Homestead Air Reserve Base. That's that's a big deciding factor for me. I've always been a supporter of the base and a supporter of um, you know, protecting encroachment of that base. And this allows us to undo something that was done years ago that, you know, could potentially um, threaten that base in the future or could potentially have a, a, an issue or leave an open-ended uh, consideration while they're thinking about expansion of the Homestead Air Reserve Base or bringing new F-35 to that base. And the second item that, that then, you know, kind of swayed me and as does now is this mitigation issue and, and the substantial cost of trying to mitigate those wetlands that are that are part of this property. And, and ultimately, as we talk about trying to bring a business or an investor into the Parker Commerce, that particular property is going to be very difficult to market because in addition to having someone have to buy into why why the homestead area, you know, is the is the place for their their regional headquarters or industrial park or whatever it might be, you, they've also got to then overcome the idea of having to put a substantial amount of money in there to mitigate that property, which becomes very difficult when you're trying to attract someone there. And so the way I've always envisioned this was that hopefully Copart would come in and and mitigate that land, and at the at the end of their time, whatever that might be that land will now be much more marketable because you will have a property that is is more turnkey. You know, it's filled at that level. You don't have to mitigate it. You no longer have these wetlands issues. Um, and not that I'm I'm hoping Copart doesn't make it long if they if they ultimately, you know, come in and build their property. But long term, I'm, I'm looking at Copart as more of a, a short term, uh, get the land up and running, protect Homestead Air Reserve Base, undo some of the things that were done from a, a legislative perspective and hopes that you know, is it five years? Is it 10 years? Is it 15 years from now? Uh, the the companies and the investment groups that we want to come into the Parker Commerce will now have land that is ready to be built on versus having to come in and, and do all that mitigation. And so for those reasons, I still find that the benefits outweigh the negatives, um, you know, conditioned on, on, on what I said. But again, I, I refer to the last uh, meeting when I when I kind of laid out my case then and set forth my justification. So, oh, and, and one other thing too though is I do echo Count, uh, Councilman Ross' questions that he had because I do remember that during the last discussion that that was one of the selling points was that regionally there would be restrictions potentially placed on the use of this property for storage because one of my concerns always was that they have some sort of a, a major catastrophe and you know. Georgia or the southeast or, or a hurricane hits there and before we know it they're trucking cars all the way down to South Florida to store it um, which you know has nothing to do with us down here and so that was always a concern it still is so I would be more comfortable if there was something that potentially addressed that going forward um, you know that at least regionally set some sort of a, a limitation that it wasn't going to be used for storage from outside a certain regional area whatever that regional area was so thank you Mayor. Thank you, Councilman Shelley. Vice Mayor, I think you're the sole remaining voice. <laughs> yes, thank you, thank you. My daughter's asleep, so I'm good. I'm here for the long haul. Whew, thank you. <laughs> okay, so um, I have a lot of notes here. I first thought I'd like to thank the community for weighing in on this agenda item. I know there has been some pros and cons for this, and it's caused a lot of contention in the community, but hopefully one day we'll we'll be able to get on one accord. But moving forward, um, based on the conversations at our last meeting, I understood that this would not be a salvage or junkyard or have junkyard related uses. That was a major concern for me, but that was mitigated after the last meeting. 
But what was most important for me was jobs, jobs, jobs. I wanted to preserve that property in order to bring more jobs to the community. Um, in light of COVID, COVID and the economy, how it's suffering, I'm not sure if bringing in high-end jobs is foreseeable in the near future. But I have a couple of questions I would like to ask um, staff, if I may. Uh, Mr. Corandino, I recall after Hurricane Irma, I'm not sure if you know, after Hurricane Irma, there were cars that were stored on the the RV lot that is owned by the Homestead Miami Speedway. Weren't those cars being stored there for the same or similar purpose as this? Vice Mayor, I do not know the if there were or or for what reason they were stored there. Is Michelle on the call? Yes, Michelle's on the call. Michelle, would you are you able to answer that? Hi, good evening, Vice Mayor. Yes, I believe you are correct. The vehicles were stored after Irma for a similar purpose. Okay, and they were stored just behind a chain link fence, and there was clearly visible, and I would ride past. I wonder what was that, and I recall that is that was the purpose of that. I didn't hear I didn't hear any um, concerns from the community regarding that. My other question is: Have we received any applications from or anyone as it relates to? moving into the park of commerce could you repeat the question that you broke up michelle or for anyone um, interested in coming into the park of commerce um well we receive applications uh, every so often for people to come into the park of commerce and similar applications like this uh for places like truck max uh, have been have been um um, uh, you met the same met with the same response, but no, nothing's in the pipeline right now. N not for any distribution type sites that you're aware of. No, 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 nothing. Um, nothing's in the. From pipeline my understanding, right now. because from my understanding, there was an application or someone expressed interest in a smaller type distribution site in the park commerce. So if I may clarify, the city does have an application for a distribution center currently under review. However, the location is not in the Park of Commerce. Okay, okay, thank you. Thank you for that information. So to be clear, I'm, I'm really not um, a fan of this project. I was hoping for something else to come into the Park of Commerce in order to create um, more jobs for the community. My question to the applicant is, how many employees do you have at your Leisure City site? Good evening, Vice Mayor. It's nice to hear you again. Um, I have confirmed with the Copart staff over there that there are 17 employees currently at the site. Of those, eight are Homestead residents. And those eight folks are on the line tonight and here to talk to you and give information to you about what it's like to work for Copart. In addition, we have uh, a list of other vendors, tow companies, insurance adjusters, providers, um, and other businesses that we support through our Princeton site and ultimately, once this is approved through this site, that are based in Homestead, owned by Homestead residents and employ Homestead residents. And, and some of those business owners are also here tonight to speak to you to talk about how Copart has indirectly created jobs in Homestead for their businesses and allowed a lot of small and local business owners to prosper in Homestead because of the part. So I you know um, that they don't have numbers for those indirect jobs, but um, it is meaningful and it is, I think, as important as, as the, the hires that could have potentially been on this site. Can you just list some of the businesses that you partner with that has created jobs in the community? 
Yes, um, Copart just signed a new um, contract with GEICO. And so um, the GEICO office is actually based in Homestead. Um, we have a couple of folks that do landscaping work um, that are also uh, based in Homestead. And Ken, I know you had some uh, audio trouble before, but if you could try again to, to list the names of some of the businesses, um, I know that would be very helpful. IT, this is Ken Huck. It's um, H O U C K. He's unmuted, but we don't hear him. Uh, yes, he's unmuted, but uh, most likely it's an audio issue on his end. Okay. Um, <laughs> Ken, can you try again? Okay. Well, that's fine if, if you don't have the information. I was just interested in the businesses that you partner with that has a halo effect in order to um, create jobs in the community. It's fair. Um, and we also have, um, you know, contractors and construction uh, companies that we'll be working with on this site for the construction phase. Um, uh, Pinky Munns for Medline Construction is on. He could speak to you about what kind of a, a scope of a job this is. Um, and and the, the landscaping companies, um, Casey's Corner um, is a business based in Homestead that sent a letter of support. Um, so so there is there is the support there, but I unfortunately I I don't have the names in front of me. Okay, okay, thank you. Um, that's fine. So so as for me, I appreciate the declaration of restrictions that you offered the the right of way deeds and the park. Um, the park proffering. Earlier you mentioned that money will be available for fund maintenance. What did you mean by that? Um, fund, so, fund, fund maintenance for the park. Yes. So uh, we have budgeted about $750,000 for the improvements to the park. Um, but once we actually did a deep dive with Bermeo Ahamil, the architecture firm that was helping us with the design, we realized that it's only going to cost about $500,000 to make the improvements which leaves $250,000 um, available to fund maintenance. And the uh, approximate maintenance costs for this site are about $15,000 a year um, because it's a very naturalistic design and, and it's mostly just going to require um, grass and, and some pruning to, to maintain. So there's money um, set aside that can absolutely be used for the maintenance of the park, whether that's done through, you know, a special taxing district or if, if the site is, remains privately owned but open to the public, we would fund it. Um, there's, there's alternatives to do it, but the money is there. Okay. Thank you for clarifying that because I know when you mentioned that you would create this park, there is an understanding that the city would have to maintain it. And currently we're strapped right now. We just can't um, assume the cost for maintaining the park, but I'm encouraged that you have figured out a way to be able to defray the cost for the maintenance, which was a very important point for me. So where I am with this right now, I'm going to support it because there's a strong support from the Homestead Air Reserve base which is a great selling point for me, but more importantly, um, Amazon. I was hoping that Amazon would, would be coming to Homestead, but we've learned that they're going to unincorporated date. And because our economy is suffering right now, and coupled with the layers of restrictions um, for this site and the millions that will be, that will be needed to mitigate this site. I just don't see the ability to attract anyone at this site to bring more jobs and who will be willing to defray these costs. In addition to that, there are other, there's which is, I think you mentioned 365 available acres left within the park if yeah. Cole Park is awarded this. So there is another opportunity um, if any other businesses would like to um, come to Homestead. So with that, I will be um, supporting this project tonight for those aforementioned reasons. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Vice Mayor. And I'd like to, to circle back around and, and talk about some of 
of my concerns and some of the the additional safeguards I'd like to see the four of you who have expressed your support for this issue. Um, I'd like to have you all consider um, imposing them as a condition for um, approval. Um, first, is we want to talk about the the tax benefits. Well, the reality is is that this this total property, and I'm talking about it as as one parcel, went on the the tax rolls at eleven million dollars. Uh, the sale reported in 18 of $11 million. It was on the tax rolls in 2019 at 12.3. And for 2020, based upon an appeal of the tax assessment, the property has already been reduced to about $9.6 million with 50, I think 56 or 58% reduction being applied to the um, to the larger parcel. So one of my concerns is to, you know, to call the bluff or put your money where your mouth is, is for an agreement for this transaction, for the entire property, for this uh, a condition, be that the transaction be clocked in with the clerk of the court prior to December 31st, so that on January 1, those properties can be put on our tax rolls at least at the full sale price. Now, if any of you took time to read through the Miami Economic Associates report and the Iowa report and kind of did some backwards math, it appears that this is a land deal of about $30 million. When, when you talk about, or, and I'm sorry, it's probably well, close to that, uh, about $28 million when they talk about that based on, you know, potential tax assessment of 30.2, or they talked about 95% of the, the sale price would be a new assessed value. That works out. You can work backwards and find out this about, based on their documents, not my conjecture, their documents, this is a almost a tripling of what it went what it changed hands for in um, in 2018. So to put their money where their mouth is, I kind of like to see them uh, ensure that this went on the tax rolls as of um, as of the end of of this year so that so that it gets on on the tax rolls at at the full conveyance price. Also, I'd like some agreement to have this, um, any, the owner chime in and agree to withdraw any tax appeals. Ms. Slavis, I see you have your hand up. Uh, yes, uh, assuming the, the application is approved on second reading on the next agenda, um, we would be closing before the end of the year. Well, that's all good and well to say. I'd like a commitment. You know, talk is cheap, all right? And, and look, I'm not gonna support this, and my colleagues have taken their time to tell the public why they are. It's my turn to tell you why I'm not, but I'm asking my colleagues not to blindly go down this path of, of, of conjecture and follow the unicorn and lollipop down the trail and, and put some real meat and potatoes into this deal. After all, this community was ecstatic two weeks ago when Amazon announced 350 new jobs, all right? But yet, tonight, we are foreclosing the opportunity for about that same number from ever coming to that site in the Park of Commerce. The vice mayor said earlier, her issue was jobs, jobs, jobs. I agree, and that was my concern prior to COVID. It is certainly no less of my concern today. So if we're not gonna get jobs, it's my job to exact as many concessions as I can. Because the bottom line is, is if four people are going to grant you something that you're not otherwise 
entitled to. So again, it's a balancing act when we sit on this side of the table. I'd like a commitment for this deal to be clocked in before the end of the year so that it can go on the tax rolls in full next year. In case you haven't heard, we have some serious budget problems here. I learned this week that the last council, over the last 10 years, and this is for the benefit of the public, spent $30 million in reserves of the city to, uh, to avoid increasing a, uh, a water rate to the tune of about four bucks a month for the average household to go out and campaign they didn't raise rates. And now after COVID, we're left holding the bag. So am I looking for coins in the couch cushions? Yes, I am. And when I ask you to commit to that, I'm asking my colleagues who generally support this to recognize that there's gotta be some give and take and help our, our city's budget issue. Um, further to that, is, is there a timeline for wetlands remediation? Uh, is the end of 2022 sufficient? I believe so, yes. All right, I'd, I'd like to see that that imposed, that if it's not, and, and subject to getting another maybe six months extension, some commitment to, uh, to have the approval lapse as to the acreage that has not yet been mitigated at the time of, at, as of December 31st, 2022. I wanna talk for a minute about the park and Ms. Lavens, you sat here the conference table I'm sitting at now with, with all the parties in interest several months ago, we talked about the park. And I made it very clear then that I don't think the city ought to be in the business of building parks. And what I see proposed tonight is the alternative of A, will this, this applicant group will either give the city $750,000 and, and convey the lake property for the purposes of building a park, or B, Copart at some point, some undefined point in the future, will construct the park as, as conceived. I would support an option C, that the park be constructed at Copart's expense within a given amount of time. And again, whether or not it's 18 months from now or whatever reasonable time frame will be, at their expense with the approval of the city and whatever it costs, it costs. I don't really want the city to be in the business of building because the, the regulatory hurdles that are put in front, in front of us really decrease the value of that $750,000. And I guess at some point I'd like staff to weigh in as to whether or not, and I think I know the answer to this, is that um, the, uh, that the park be done totally as a responsibility of, of Copart and, and, and not even turned over to the city. Bottom line is, is right now and for many years to come, we conceivably cannot um, afford that. Um, one of the other issues I had was that given there's, you know, in addition there'd be up to 21,000 vehicles and not just vehicles, Mr. and Mrs. Public, boats, farm equipment, and machinery. It's not just vehicles. Well, let's assume it is just, 20, just 21,000 vehicles. If every car carrier can only carry 10 cars, we're talking about 21, if, and if it's only in a disaster, we're talking about a minimum of 2,100 car carriers and big trucks in and out of there over a period of, of months as these cars are all brought in and then sold and carried out and potentially only one or two at a time. That is a, that is a significant um, traffic issue. And to one of my colleagues points earlier, there is no restriction on it being disaster related. The issue before us is, a, is for a blanket approval of of storage and handling of, of those vehicles. There's, there's
there's absolutely no restriction that it be local disaster related. And I know, I think Ms. Slavens, you mentioned um, from Lake Okeechobee South, we have no way to police that. And I, I kind of like your input as to how um, we're going to be able to police the, the truck traffic to, to those designated routes. I think that's very important, but I don't know how that we are going to practically implement that. So, um, you know, those, those are issues I have. And not, not to mention the environmental. Let's not kid ourselves. It's very low-lying land. It's not going to be a concrete uh, cap. It'll either be some kind of packed sand or, or asphalt that, that's more permeable. And uh, we're, we're going to have, um, I believe, um, pollution issues. I want to go to the aesthetics. Trees can only show so much, and your drawing saw one say one thing. But I was shown video by someone who took a video of your huge facility in the Orlando area. And no, it didn't look like a gated community, as was represented by one of my colleagues as to what goes on in Princeton. This more looked like the outside of a federal prison. Um, you know, trees and landscaping just are not going to provide enough lipstick to put on that, that pig. I would also ask is whether or not this approval would allow the, the storage by car dealers of, of a used car inventory. I, I, in reading this, it seems that this could not be used as a staging area for new cars, but in speaking with, with people in the industry, I understand that, that inventory storage for used cars is becoming very near and dear, and, and that could create some addition, additional traffic issues as well. So for me, uh, besides the fact that it essentially cre directly creates zero jobs, directly creates zero jobs, um, we the the traffic impacts are are certainly um, are open ended, and 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 I have not really seen a. Um, I've seen, I've not seen anything that merits uh, giving up the potential for 350 to 500 jobs on this site by another user um, to allow this to happen. Um, and I'd just like to say that in reading the package and the, the reports that have been submitted, I take away that the position is, is that our park of commerce has been a failure. And then because of that, you might as well go ahead and let this in, let it happen, despite everyone else who's there having lived with the, the regulations. Homestead, once again, you're a failure, so be the needy stepchild and just let us do this. I, I don't live that way. Again, as I said at the last hearing, I believe we are fast becoming the final frontier. And I know that others are looking at, at the Park of Commerce. And this is not the way I wanted to do it. And it's a little premature. And I don't know if it'll change anyone's mind. But at the same conference table that I'm sitting at right now, I met with legal representatives and representatives of a developer who right now have the preliminary documentation pending to construct an Amazon distribution facility in the city limits of Homestead. Don't be distracted by what's going on on the county property at Homestead Air Force Base. That is a secondary facility. The Homestead facility in the city limits to create another 350, 400 jobs is very much in play. Now, why is that relevant to this application? It's relevant for at least two reasons. The first reason is, is I happen to believe that that facility will cause spillover effect into the Park of Commerce. Um, uh, uh, across the board. And um, it, it also shows that, that despite their representations, Copart is not the only game in town 
with the millions of dollars folded up in their back pocket that can do wetlands mitigation. If Amazon will come to Homestead, the sky's the limit, and we do not have to settle for something that I have to say, for my opinion, is nothing more than a junkyard. And finally, I'd like to, to say my piece and say that I think that there's been a lot of, of misrepresentations uh, with respect to this. I think the position of the base has been misrepresented. I think that by uh, you taking advantage of, of the folks who are directors in the AYSO, they used AYSO stationary, but clearly if you read the letter, it was their, their individual position. You talk about homestead businesses. Well, as we found out with the COVID number reporting, Homestead, I guess, is pretty much ever considered everything from Cutler Bay South. Um, you know, don't throw water on me and tell me it's raining. Let's be realistic here. But most importantly, I believe that the fiction that is, has been created about we have to save the base is just that. I think I used the expression shiny distraction last time. Call it that. Call it smoke and mirrors. The removal of this acreage from potential encroachment still leaves other acreage that is grandfathered in and would be taken into consideration. And let's also remember that I think our planning director and others reminded us that virtually every existing facility in the Park of Commerce complies with the restrictions that would be in place to protect Homestead Air Reserve Base. And finally, who do we represent? I represent the people and the taxpayers of the city of Homestead. And it's incumbent on me to strike a balance between the base as our economic and partner and, and partner on so many other levels. And I think it's appropriate to, to strike a balance. But the base has drawn that line in the sand and, and has have been represented to say no. And that's the job of the base commander, who's the mayor of Homestead Air Reserve Base. He doesn't really have to, he's not answerable, or she, he's <laughs> not answerable to the people of Homestead, doesn't have to worry about balancing the budget and creating jobs. So for anyone out there, in my opinion, who is relying upon the base as a basis for a, of, of uh, wringing their hands and approving this, I happen to believe that that is, is very misplaced. But again, to my colleagues who have indicated their willingness to, um, to approve this, I would ask that you resolve the tax appeal issue, resolve the timing of the the clocking in of the deeds issue, and sufficiently resolve the park issue. We've all been around long enough to know, most of us have been around long enough to know that these loose ends and ambiguities cost nothing but headaches and attorney's fees in the future. So thank you. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Fletcher. Yeah, thank you very much. I appreciate you uh, discussing the potential uh, issue with Amazon looking at areas inside of our city. Uh, I was not uh, completely privy to all those discussions and have not had a full briefing from staff. I'm aware of, uh, you know, them taking a look at our area very strongly and uh, looking forward to uh, potentially working with them in the future and uh, other businesses that may be working with them. If I may uh, ask a question in regards to uh, the property uh, we're discussing now, in reference to the environmental issues, uh, I know I see in the uh, application that talks about having either crushed rock or a uh, band of some sort at a certain depth uh, for uh, mitigation of potential fuel leaks, oil leaks, things of that nature. I would just like to offer that we might want to look at having them putting some type of liner underneath that. Uh, I know they make up clean or a rubber liner that would uh, assist in preventing potential uh, outfalls from uh, 
those type of issues. Um, so I would offer that our staff uh, insist upon having some additional controls in place to protect our uh, Biscayne Aquifer and South Florida water in general. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Mayor, you, Council Fletcher. Mayor. Yes, Vice Mayor. Thank you. Um, unfortunately, I wasn't privy to any of those conversations as it relates to Amazon potentially coming to Homestead. I feel as if they are really serious about that. All of us should have been aware of that and privy of those conversations. But if they are, I mean, I think that's a good thing. Additionally, um, I, I I know you know who I represent. I represent the community, and I mentioned earlier that I'm grateful for all of the feedback that we have received as it relates to this application. So I don't want anyone to feel as if their input has gone on on deaf ears. It's unfortunately we have to vote it up or down, and someone will feel slighted in any of the decisions that we make. But to some of your points, um, some of your recommendations that you had asked COPAR, I, I don't think are bad recommendations. And Tracy, you mentioned that you plan on closing by... Um, Vice Mayor, you're breaking up. Yeah, check your audio. First. Can you get into that? Um, so we have some closing by... Yes, it is. Thank you, Vice Mayor. So, Tracy, can we put a little bit more teeth into um, closing by the end of the year to ensure that this goes on to the tax, tax rolls? I don't believe that was a bad recommendation. Uh, if I may, I, I agree with you. Um, we have a contract in place at the moment um, that is based on the the approval of the application. So based on the timeline that I've mapped out for our first reading tonight, our second reading on the next agenda, then we would absolutely be closing by the, ne the end of the year, barring this getting appealed. Um, but the, yes, I, I do believe that that's feasible. And, and most likely, uh, the, the contract, like I said, doesn't have a, an, a, a fixed date because of the COVID and the changes to the hearing schedule. Um, but our, our intent is that we are ready to close. And as soon as we have the final approval, we will close. So that should be, hopefully, in the fall. Right, but that still doesn't give a lot of um, certainty that it will occur. So to staff, what can we do to put more teeth into this as it relates to the closing? I know we can factor out any appeals because you may get appeals that may kind of kick the can down the road so that you don't close. But what can we do to ensure that um, we hold you accountable to closing? We'll hold them accountable to closing by December 31st. That was a question to staff. Staff, is that be to the attorneys about inserting that yeah. condition? Yeah, that's what uh, this is, Joe Cordino. <clears throat> I, I would suggest we insert it as a condition um, in in the uh, in the as a condition of the approval and. Um, I would ask the, the attorney if, if there's a possibility of doing that. Hi, Mayor. Can you hear me? This is James. Yes, James. Loud and clear. <clears throat> so um, this is a little unusual. Um, normally, we, uh, in the realm of land use or the realm of master plan amendments or declarations or restrictions, uh, we don't control the ownership or the private transactions that happen. I mean, we're looking at this as a use and whether or not the use uh, should be allowed and go forward. Um, I'm a little hesitant about trying to place a condition on this when we don't have any control over 
um, the closing process, uh, even though even though it's intended that they close at the end of the year, given the pandemic and the state that we're in, there's no assurances. And so, um, I mean, we can certainly craft something that would unwind or invalidate the change um, if if the closing doesn't happen. But I would really need time to look at this because on the back end, we also have other applications that would come in with this site plan, some other things, and what would the effect of those approvals also be? So I think I would need some time to look at that before I find conclusively tonight on that. Okay, well, I just figured I'd take a stab at it because it sounds like a valid um, recommendation, but as you indicated, we don't control, you know, the closing but the pandemic. We're not sure when that would occur, but Tracy, I, I think it's very clear that um, this council would like to put that on the tax rolls for the upcoming year for 2021. It's so I would also encourage helpful. you. Yes, um, and 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 Copart is eager to to close on this property. It's been longer than they expected to, um, but our goal is to be on your 2020 tax rolls at the full purchase price. 21. 2021. 2021. Yes. Additionally, what else um, piqued my interest was the fact that the maintenance on the park, we have to have some very serious conversations about our next steps as it relates to the budget. And we are already facing deficits. And there are some items that I know I want to bring forth to the city to consider. And it, it comes at a cost. And I'm not sure that our parks and Rec recreation department can um, absorb the cost for the park maintenance. I know you proffered, uh, what, $250,000 as a result of the 500000 that it would take to create the park, but can Copark commit to maintaining that park in perpetuity? Um, I will have to ask them, and again, this is, um, this is a question for whether even the city wants the park. Um, it may just be a privately held open space. Um, we have time between first and second reading to, to, to make that determination. I think it's something that if the council directs us and the city manager and the parks director to figure out, we absolutely can. Um, you know, it's, it's really a question of whether, whether the park should be a homestead city park or a publicly accessible open space that's owned by a private property owner. Okay, I, I mean, the park wasn't a selling point for me. Yeah. Just because it was there, I just asked the question, because that wasn't a selling point for me. And as we move forward, I don't know what my colleagues feel. Do they want the park or they want it to be a public park? Because we really can't afford to maintain that park if we absorb it as a city. So that's a question for my colleagues, and I'll rest there, Mayor. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Um, let me interject real quick, James or Mr. White. Yes, sir. This is a legislative matter, so tonight's it, correct? Uh, this is first read. Yeah, this is the first reading, Mayor. So uh, this, if it passed this evening, it would come back to you on second reading. If it fails tonight, then it's dead. It doesn't move forward. So those conditions, this could move forward subject to those conditions being inserted into the final document. Is that correct? That's correct. Thank you, Mr. White. Council? Mayor, if I may? Yes, Council Thank Roman. you. I, I'm in favor of the condition for the closing to be required this year so we can get it on our tax roll. I think that if it can't close, barring you know any appeals that could happen but if they if they do if they don't close and something else better is on the table then their approval was contingent on it and uh, maybe maybe a better opportunity it would be on the horizon you mentioned amazon maybe the next couple of months is enough time to see that happen so i really hope that um, copark can close in time and if we can get that in the final document i think that would be a motivation for the deal to get sealed um, and to keep some options on the table for us. Um, with regards to the park, 
it was my understanding that the lake and the park improvement, which is a complete revival of the lake and the surrounding area with significant lake bank erosion, would be 100% built out by Copart, not the city. So I need some clarification on that because um, I'm hearing that there's some contra contrast to that idea. And then um, Tracy, also with regards to the restrictions on the on the cars that would be brought there, we discussed this many times, and there were some restrictions or triggers rather that you you advised me on. So you can explain on the record what those triggers were and how we can be uh, reassured what cars and, and at what point the, the site would become activated. Um. Well, uh, first we can talk about the park. That was your first question. Um, Copart offered sort of a, a menu with the sellers of, of what the park could be. There are, yeah, as the mayor indicated, various options. We could build it, keep it private. We could give you the, the land and the money to improve it yourself, or we can improve it and give you the, the improved land. Um, there are various options, all of which um, we we are open to discussion on and and you know the land is there and the funds have been set aside so whatever works best for the community is is what we're happy to do um, and and maintenance will not be an issue um, Copart you know typically if, if well if they own it they will absolutely maintain it and if there is a, a way to create a special taxing district to fund the maintenance or some other means to to make sure that the city has the funds to maintain the park. We're, we're, we're open to it. Um, so that's the answer to the first question. The, the second question um, relating to the activation of the site, it, because this is a cat site, what will happen is when a hurricane warning or a tropical storm warning or a state of emergency is, is activated, or if there's some major fire or flood or some other event that creates a demand for this additional storage space, Copart will open the site. And by opening the site, what they do is they bring in a team of people from around the country and some from their local operators, uh, operation places here in, in Miami-Dade County and in South Florida or throughout the state of Florida to work specifically on the property. And they bring in um, what they call their catastrophic response uh, mobile team. And they're, they're essentially tractor trailers that are outfitted like offices. And they set up on the property and they work to, to process the, the vehicles that come in. Um, typically, the vehicles are whatever you find in an urbanized area that's affected by a storm. So, you know, if, if the major flooding happens along the coastline, it's mostly going to be cars, um, maybe boats, um, but, you know, light trucks. That's, that's what you would see. Um, you know, if, if the storm hits like Andrew and wipes out a huge swath of South Dade, which includes, you know, the agricultural areas, um, you may have some light farm equipment, um, but that's the purpose of the landscaping in the eight foot wall so that whatever goes back there is screened from view and kept clean and orderly and, and, and away from public view. Okay, so in your, can you modify your declaration to specifically state the triggers and you, you mentioned in conversation about Okeechobee South being the, the area, affected areas that would activate the site, and then to limit the overflow from the, Pine, um, the Princeton location to this site, can you revise your declaration to specifically comment on those and provide triggers or restrictions for that? Um, I believe I can. I, I just need to confirm it with, with the Copart representative. So if we can listen to public comment and, and come back to that, I, I would appreciate the, the extra yeah. time. No problem, because my approval and my support were based on those, um, you know, promises, for lack of a better word, th through our discussions, which were very in-depth and uh, lengthy. Um, and then with regards to the, the, the site, and the, whether there's sand or an underlayment to protect the ground, definitely we need to have um, you know systems in place to protect um, you know the earth under your site. Can we? This is a question for staff in, in, in regards to the operating license that we have to be renewed each, each year. Is it subject to any regular site inspections to make sure that they that Copart is in fact 
um, using their you know, implementing their policies for spillage, uh, mitigation, et cetera. Uh, this is Joe Cordino. Yeah, we, we as they are out constructing the site, we'll be out there inspecting it to make sure that it's constructed uh, correctly. Of course, uh, Derm would be involved with it to make sure that uh, any of the environment, environmental issues are taken care of. But after that, um, we would only go out there if a code enforcement violation were noticed. Okay, and so at any time, throughout the year, we can call for code enforcement to go out there and do a health checkup. Is that okay to say? Yeah, I think that's safe to say if we, if we noticed any violations or, or, or there were any complaints, we can send code enforcement out there okay. and check it out, make sure it all work, working well. And if they're not in compliance, their operating license would be revoked. If they're not in compliance, mm -hmm. we would uh, we would uh, give them a, a citation and work with them to get back in compliance. Okay. And could that ever result in a cease and desist of operating? Uh, in rare, I guess in rare cases, if they were in such violation and refused to come into compliance, we could uh, take it to, to the to the to the very end and uh, and um, you know give them more severe penalties. All right. So, yeah, I'd like for this approval to be contingent on the closing of this year and for the declarations to be revised and for the park to be constructed by Copart and handed over to the city for ownership. I don't think that it would be in the best interest of the neighboring communities for them to start off with a beautiful park and then years down the line, another uh, plan comes about and the park gets demolished or turned into something else. Uh, so I would like to make sure that we keep that improvement permanently, uh, along with at least 15 years of maintenance calculated uh, and fund balance, which is what the calculation I'm coming up with now with that additional 250000 So with that, I'll rest for now. Thank you. Thank you, Councilwoman. Before we go to public comment again, I just want to reiterate my concerns that I don't see how we can effectively police where the vehicles are coming from and the way this is written, it allows a lot of other sourcing and, and, and full-time operation. Um, as to the park, um, there are ways to ensure that it remains a park without taking ownership and responsibility for it. And I know, you know some of your political benefactors across the board wouldn't mind selling the city some more insurance every year but it doesn't need to be on our dime and deed restrictions and covenants can pr protect the park that is for the public benefit, but not our liability. Very uh, well. Uh, mm -hmm. let, me, uh, let me open it up for public comment. IT, are you monitoring who's in line? Uh, yes, Mayor. We have um, two, uh, three actually. Um, so the first one is uh, Jose Daza. Okay, this, Mr. Daza, remember name and address for the record, please. And remember, hey. yes, Mr. Manager, uh, can you hear me first? Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, my name is Jose Daza. I'm located at 3115 Southeast Seven Place in Homestead, Florida. I'm a resident of East Lake, which is next to the Corpac Project. Uh, let me say good afternoon to all the, uh, the council members and all the attendees at this meeting. Uh, I, I want to bring to your attention, Mr. Mayor, and I'm going to literally repeat what you said earlier. On page 808 of the agenda, uh, which is the Master Development Plan Exhibit A, when in item 17, vehicle storage, no sales, there is an asterisk right there, and I'm going to read what Corpat's is giving you what I call the fine print on this deal. Quote, the vehicle storage no sales use is intended to permit outdoor vehicle storage only of use, damage and undamaged, operable and inoperable automobiles, trucks, other vehicles, trailers, boats, and construction slash farm equipment and machinery for online auction with accessory office, 
temporary inventory storage, and there is other words in there, and I close quote. Literally, they are already telling you this is not just vehicles, what is going to be stored on this site. You are going to have their construction farm equipment machinery. These are the negative impacts that I see on this proposed use in the Park of Commerce. Number one, the proposed use will lower the home values in Keysgate, Isle of Oasis, and the Banjar neighborhoods. Number two, the proposed use will create a major hazard during hurricane season to the adjacent neighborhoods. Number three, the proposed use will be located across the neighborhoods along North Canal Drive. Number four, the proposed use, which is the most important, is, is not just vehicles. We are having here, uh, and it's written in the fine print, machinery, farm equipment, boats, construction, trucks, trailers, anything that a hurricane, and, and it was said at the end of the meeting. So I urge you as a resident of the city of Homestead, please, please, this is not the best use for that land. I think we have plenty of opportunities. This is the last land in south of Okeechobee in Miami-Dade County. Thank you for your time. And I hope that you do not approve or take the chance to approve this project for the city of Homestead benefit. Thank you for your for listening. Thank you, Mr. Daza. Next up. Uh, next we have uh, Karen Alba. Uh, Hello, good. Ms. Alba, good evening. Hi, good evening. Can you hear me? Yes, please go ahead. Hi, Mr. Mayor. Uh, my name is Karen Alba. Oh my God, I listen with yeah, an echo. got some echo, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know why, <laughs> a lot. Uh, but um, I'm a resident in Homestead at 2179 South East, First Street in Homestead. I'm Ventana del Sol. I am also a business owner in Homestead, Florida. Um, I consider that this project of, will help the community not only by adding significant improvement and beautification of the street's appearance, but it's also going to help the city of Homestead. Can you hear me? Yes, we have an echo, but we can hear you. Oh, I'm sorry, I don't know what's the issue. Um, in many ways, um, um, and it's also compatible with the Homestead Air Base reserve, uh, reserve Base in their desire to maintain a low density in the accident potential zones in which the site is located. Um, I consider that, you know, some other projects are gonna come, but this project uh, will help the uh, community, you know, will help in the improvement of our community. Thank you. You're welcome. I'm sorry for the noise. <laughs> I didn't know no what No problem. Happened. That's part of the new normal. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Alba. You're welcome, sir. Uh, next, we have uh, Bradley. Yes, my name is Bradley Steve, a Copart customer. My address is 30040 Southwest 156 Ave in Homestead, Florida. I have been a resident of Homestead for about 12 years, and I fully support this application for Copart to come in the city. I believe having a $20 billion publicly traded company will definitely add value to our community and city, no doubt about that, and also help recruit other companies to the area. Hopefully we can get other companies in here because as of right now, you have none. Tax revenue for our city will also be a big plus. I wholeheartedly support this application. For me, it's a no-brainer. Thank you. Thank you for coming tonight. IT, who's next? Next, we have uh, Tina Barker. All right. Hello again, Ms. Barker. Well, hello. I'm glad to be at the right show. Let me get back to this here. Um, my name is Tina Barker, and I live at 424 Northeast 35th Avenue in Homestead. Um, I, too, am in... Uh, support for this project as it will cost more to utilize this land for other usage 
and this project will bring a significant economic impact to Homestead. As was mentioned, many acres will be available for further business growth, which um, we look forward to as well. Um, after hurricanes, having a clean site for this service would be a positive and economically sound investment for Southeast Florida. Having lived through Hurricane Andrew, I remember that catastrophic <clears throat> event um, and there was much cleanup to be done and it totally looks like a war zone. I remember it quite vividly. Um, I would like to have a plan in place for some of that cleanup to be done um, and a place to uh, start that with um, already having something set up to uh, start that cleanup. This company has worked with the community and has been able to have positive agreements made. So I believe that this is a positive application for Homestead and I am in favor for any positive economic growth for this community. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Barker, for joining us tonight. Thank you. IT. Next we have uh, a Smith, Brian. Excellent, can you hear me? Yes, we can, perfectly. Excellent, good to see you, Mayor. Thank you, uh, council members. My name is Brian Smith. For the record, I live at 1155 South Alhambra Circle, Coral Gables. I uh, work with JLL, Jones Lang LaSalle. We are a Fortune 300 uh, real estate service firm. We were hired to market this uh, property with the current ownership. I would like to address the specific com comments regarding Amazon. Our office uh, is, is known to work with Amazon throughout the country. Uh, myself, I have done multiple transactions with Amazon. We do represent this park in this sale as well. So I was very um, curious to hear that Amazon is in Homestead speaking about it and it's becoming public record because that really sort of defies their, their usual MO with their strict confidentiality. Um, we have not heard that Amazon is interested, uh, yet we've completed two transactions with Amazon in the last 30 days. Uh, we've been marketing this property globally to every investor, occupier, Fortune 500 industrial user in the country. Uh, we work on some of the largest industrial parks here in South Florida. Um, this project has been put in front of every major developer and every major user. Uh, we would love to have brought a user that brought a lot of jobs. The trouble here is this site is very complicated. Uh, it's not every day that a user can buy a 100-acre site for this number and then put another 20 or $30 million into just getting it pad ready to build. Furthermore, the site had a great plan 20 years ago. However, they're ahead of their time. However, th that plan is not suited for this location. It won't happen. I realize that a lot of the people who are been opining on this have a lot of emotion and ties to this community. My role, I am on the executive council of JLL. I sit as the lead of South Florida Industrial. I work with many large corporations strictly with industrial requirements. We could tell you this site, there has not been a lot of other projects that we put more effort into because we wanted to start a new trend and we want the South to become popular. We understand the metrics of what's happening in industrial in South Florida as well as anybody. We have UPS, FedEx, Amazon, Walmart on our direct dial. These, all of these folks were presented this site multiple times. We have zero offers from any of them. With that, I'll conclude. Thank you. Mr. Smith, uh, I, I can't sit by silently. You have effectively intimated that I'm a liar when I talk about Amazon. And you kind of no, intimate that you're the gatekeeper. I said for it's Amazon. interesting that that and, that and that, I happen that. to know you're not the gatekeeper in full for Amazon. And and time will tell 
but I can tell you, and I'm, I'm under an obligation to speak the truth. Unlike a lot of people out in the audience tonight, I have a county mandated obligation to speak the truth or I can be removed from office. And I can tell you that Amazon is interested in being here and the initial groundwork has been laid. And again, it's not within the park of commerce. Let me be very clear. It's not within the park of commerce. Right, you know, you, you gave a very affluent address in a very nice area as your home address. God bless you. You've been very successful. Most of the people in our community haven't reached that level of success yet. And as mayor of those people, I don't appreciate your smugness toward what is and isn't proper here in, in Homestead. As you know, I've got a little saying, and I was in a meeting – a committee meeting the other day with three or four other council members, and they kind of agreed with me that if it's not acceptable in Palmetto Bay, Cutler Bay, or Pinecrest, why should we accept it in Homestead? And with respect to your comments tonight, I don't think it would be permitted in in Coral Gables. So um, I appreciate you know your expertise and and congratulate you on your success. But my loyalty and my passion lies with my community. And first and foremost, you may not be accustomed to elected mayors of Homestead being this way, but this one is not a liar. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Thank you. I was merely addressing your comments. Thank you, Mayor. Next, Ike, who's up? Next, we have uh, Michelle Pino. Thank you. Good evening. Michelle? Is it Pino? Michelle Pino? Who's up next? Uh, yes. Um, Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you now. Okay, all right. Okay, so uh, my name is Michelle Pino. I live in 11794 Southwest 273rd Lane in Homestead. That's uh, 33032. Um, I've been a resident of Homestead on and off for about 23 years. Um, I was here during Hurricane Andrew. I do know that it did look like a war zone, as, as someone mentioned before. Um, and I am a Copart employee. I actually got my job as a result of IRMA. When IRMA occurred, they were looking for extra employees due to the increased workload. And um, I was hired as a temporary employee, which eventually became a permanent position. So um, I just wanted to, to mention that and that I am in support of the application. Thank you for joining us tonight, Ms. Pino. Appreciate it. Uh, next, we have uh, Susan Sorrentino. Hi, Ms. Sorrentino. Good evening. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Um, I'm concerned about the stupid of the poison under the the project that will flow into the Atlantic and kill our coral. I don't know if you could still hear me. We can. Okay. Um, the water flow underneath with all the gasoline and other poisons that come from disabled cars flowing into the ocean and killing the coral reefs. You only touched on it. But this is disastrous. Also, those vehicles with all the uh, oil and gasoline from being disabled could go up in flames. Then who puts out the fires? That smoke will billow more than eight feet over those walls. You're not, you're not thinking straight if you're going to approve this. I'm sorry. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Sorrentino. Uh, next. Next, we have uh, Joshua 
Vasquez. Hi, good evening, everyone. Hi, good evening, Mr. Vasquez. Um, so my name is Joshua Vasquez. I live at 992 Northeast 41st Place. That's in Homestead, Florida, 33033. Um, I've been there for quite a few years already. I've been a resident of Homestead for over 10. Um, and I, too, am in favor of this application. I'm also an employee of Copart. Um, I've been an employee of Copart for six years now um, and where I was blessed to have that job. So I truly am in favor of this. I know that it can be a true blessing to, to the city of Homestead. Um, and I know that everyone else can say the same. So I do approve this application. Thank you, Mr. Vasquez. Next, we have uh, Chris. Hey, good evening. My name is Chris. Um, I, I'm a small business owner of a towing company in Homestead. I've been around for about 14 years. Um, ran into Copart. I do work with them directly. Um, they're a very good company. Then I was able to actually hire employees. I started off by myself. And <clears throat> sorry, and um, I was able to hire people and make my business grow. So I am in support of the um, application. And that's all I would like to say. Thank you. Can we get your last name and address for the record, please? Uh, it's Chris Jikerin, and the address is 24141 South Dixie Highway. Thank you. Homestead. Thank you, Thank, you for joining. Thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you. Next, we have uh, Paul Wiggins. Mr. Wiggins, good evening. Go ahead, Mr. Wiggins. Can you hear me? Yeah, barely. Can, okay, is that better? Much better. Okay, so I'm calling in tonight because I am not in support of this proposed project. Uh, I forgot to give you my address. It's 2008 Southeast 23rd Avenue in South Florida. And it looks like it's probably going to pass. So i am always been a person that tries to look to mitigate problems because this is going to cause a lot of problems out in our area in Keysgate. So most of you know that I'm in the, in the landscape industry. I'm the past president of the Florida Nursery Growers and Landscapes Association for Dade County. And I'm on the Farm Bureau board with your father, Mayor, which he's a great guy. And I will let you know that the proposed plan with the five layers of trees is a good plan. But the problem is, is if they put it in with a normal county code where it's a 10 foot tree or a 12 foot tree on the street, it's gonna take 12 years before you actually have protection of that site. It will take 12 years plus to reach a height of 20 foot. So when the site plan comes forward, I really would hope the council would look into that matter and require to have a minimum of 18 foot trees be installed on the property to give that instant protection, not protection 10 years from now. And I would also recommend that they put, instead of four, five layers of trees, put four layers of trees and then add a hedge of clumping palms Examples are Rika palms or a fishtail palm, and they clump up, they have little suckers, and they continuously grow thicker and thicker. And if you install a 20-foot hedge of those, you would really mitigate a lot of the actual problems that this is going to cause. So, and, and anyone in the council or mayor can reach out to me, and uh, I'm sure you all have my email, and um, we can far discuss that. So I've always been in, a proponent of solving problems when they arise. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Council. Thank you, Mr. Wiggins. Good points. Next, we have uh, Nell Corona. Hello? Yes. Yes, how are you doing? Uh, my name is Nell Corona. Uh, this is 24860 Southwest 127th Court in Homestead, Florida, 33032. Um, I've been a resident here and also in Color Bay for the last uh, 25 years. I've been in Homestead for the last 10. Um, I am for this application. Uh, I am also an employee for Copart. The company definitely opened its doors to me. Uh, definitely grew in this company. I have seen a lot of uh, other companies that work alongside with us. Uh, 
at having uh, one of those guys, uh, Chris, that just spoke a little while ago, seeing his company grow and others as well, alike, um, definitely brings opportunity to the city and to businesses all around uh, the neighborhood as well. So I am for this project. I think it's a, a really big thing for the catastrophic events that do happen in Miami. We're really known for these things, the hurricanes coming. Um, we haven't had a bad one or an Andrew effect type one here close to home, but I've always been one that knows that if we haven't had it yet, it's probably coming. We need a company that's gonna clean up the mess. So I am definitely for this, this project. Thank you, appreciate your input. Next we have uh, Jody also. Okay, please go ahead. Hello. Hi. Hi, uh, I'm Jody Olson. My address is one four nine two zero Southwest three hundred and seventh Street, Homestead, Florida three two zero three three. I just wanted to say that I'm in full support of this project. Um, I like that it has. Uh, I'm sorry. Excuse me. Uh, driving by the site, I love that it will considerably look better than it looks now. Um, I'm also married to an active duty service member, currently deployed, and I support anything beneficial to the military and the Homestead Air Force Base. I also like that they have uh, storm relief programs. I feel like that's really important in these areas. Um, honestly, that's about it, but I appreciate you taking your time. Thank you so much. Thanks for listening in tonight. Appreciate it. Thank ne you. Next, we have... Uh, Jonathan Molzov. Hi, good evening. Hey, guys, how are we doing? Good. Uh, so basically, my name is Jonathan Molzov, and I reside at 3143 Northeast 4th Street, Homestead, Florida, 33033. Uh, I just want to start by saying I've been receiving numerous emails to stop the junkyard. I uh, just feel it's an unfair statement. This is clearly not a junkyard. Um, with that being said, I think the benefits by far outweigh any potential negative, and I support the project and, of course, the Homestead Air Force Reserve Base. And please vote yes. Thank you. The smells off. Thank you. Next, we have uh, Edward Relic. Yes, good evening, everyone. Can you hear me? We can. Can we just uh, acknowledge that we know where you are on this and move on? No, I'm kidding. Go ahead, Ed. Good evening. Thanks, Mayor. Uh, always enjoy working with you. Uh, again, my name is right. Edward. Come on. I do. Yes, I do. This is fun. Uh, my name is Edward Redlick. My address is now 4265 Merganza Avenue in Coconut Grove. I hope you will not hold my address or zip code against me, Mr. Mayor. I I'll do already, but go ahead. Thank you. Uh, but uh, you know, as well as everybody does, uh, I'm very proud of my roots. I've been Redland raised for 20 years. Uh, my passion and my roots are in Homestead, Florida. Uh, so I'm a commercial real estate broker with the Commonwealth Companies. For over 25 years, I've specialized in the South Dade industrial real estate market. I'm speaking this evening on behalf of Copart, who I currently represent in the acquisition of this property. So we all have the same vision for Homestead. Every one of us listening here wants to improve our community and create more jobs. We all agree on this. The challenge with a specific subject property is that it's been vacant since the 1990s due to a lack of demand in the market. But now we finally have a solution right before us. So just some background on myself. In 2007, I personally acquired 15 acres with the Homestead Parker of Commerce. The site was adjacent to the subject site we're talking about tonight. After nine long years, Nine years, I was finally able to recruit Dunham Bush Air Conditioning to this site. In 2016, I, uh, they acquired the site for myself. Most investors and developers looking at Homestead, they just do not have the wherewithal and the fortitude to hang in for nine years or even longer. So in my personal experience and my professional opinion, this is the highest and best use for the property. In fact, I would dare to say it's a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. My dad got me started in this business in 1995, and for all those years, we have not seen a solution to this property. 
This project is truly a win-win, win-win. A win for the United States Air Force Base, a win for the ownership, a win for Copart USA, and a win for the city and its residents. So let's send a positive message to the South Florida business community and beyond that Homestead is open for business. Let's approve this use. Let's welcome Copart USA to the Homestead Park of Commerce. And then let's all work together to go recruit more businesses to Homestead. Thank you very much. Ed, let me ask you a question real quick, if I could. Thank you for your comments. And maybe you don't know. Was this always wetlands or did it revert to wetlands because of failure to be maintained and used in the aftermath of the uh, economic meltdown in 2008? Mr. Mayor, I think that's a good question. I don't know the answer. I remember that the Rockefeller Group was involved in 1999. Uh, then the property was later sold from the city of Homestead to a &H development. They were also not successful. That property then went to uh, GBX development. They were successful. So I don't know at what point it went into wetlands area. Um, we can certainly look that well, up. Oh, yeah, it's, it's not relevant. It was just some academic curiosity. Just as, as it's always been an academic curiosity as to why the current owner would have paid $11 million for it when he couldn't do much with it, but that we're beyond that. Oh, thank you, Mr. Redlick. Appreciate it. Thank you, sir. Next. Next, we have uh, Tamilia Ambersley. Yes, hello. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Yes. Hi, my name is Tamilia Ambersley, 13244 Old Biscayne Drive, Homestead, Florida, 33033. I support Corp support Copart having this parcel uh, because I'm looking forward to seeing improvements that are beneficial in my community. I also support the Air Force Base and hope they can continue to maintain and evolve without restraint. Thank you for your time. I just didn't want to repeat anything anybody else has said. Thank you. Appreciate Thank you guys. it. Mm -hmm. Next, we have uh, Timothy Forbes. Mr. Forbes. Yes. Hello. Good evening. Uh, Mr. Mayor and uh, Community Council, uh, I just wanted to say that I am in four. I am all the way. Let me stop. Let me back up. My address is two five two zero eight Southwest one seventeen Place, Homestead, Florida three three zero three two. My name is Pastor Timothy Forbes. I'm a retired sergeant from out of the United States Army. I retired in nineteen ninety nine. Um, I'm born and bred, and in, uh, in Miami. I relocated here with my family to the Homestead area. I've been living here now for about four years. And I am uh, very familiar with this uh, area uh, because I frequent the base uh, quite a bit. And um, it would be good to see that area put to good use. And I think that, in fact, I'm, I'm, I'm very confident in saying based on the information that um, I've heard from both sides and watched the presentations. I'm even more convinced that this would be a very good thing for the area, for the Air Force Base, for the community, for Homestead. So I'm definitely in favor of this. And I hope that uh, uh, the decision makers will come together and uh, we'll all agree. Thank you for your time. Thank you, appreciate it. IT, how many more do we have in the queue? Actually, that was it. And, and I would like to ask, uh, there are some attendees that they already participated and they have their hand up, if they can lower it, please, to avoid confusion in the future items. But this is all we got, Mayor. Okay, thank you. Uh, okay, and again, let me repeat what I just, IT just conveyed to me in case you didn't catch it, that if you've already spoken and, and you know, virtually raised your hand and you haven't taken it down yet, please do so. All right now, I guess that at this point, we need to stop and entertain a motion to continue the meeting until 10 o'clock. Motion. We have a motion by Councilwoman Avila to continue the meeting until 10. Second. We have a second. Anyone wish to be recorded as a no vote on the extension until 10 o'clock? All right, motion carries. So, um, Council?
Mayor, for me? Yes, yes. certainly. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm concerned that a carrot would be dangled in reference to hearing about a supposed plan for Amazon to come to our city. And we as a council are unaware of it, uh, for one. Um, it's great that there's a potential for other companies to come to the city, but for it to be brought up tonight with no evidence, with nothing presented to council, uh, makes no sense to me. The second thought I have is imposing restrictions on closings. We, we are in uncharted waters when it comes to transactions. And a transaction this large could take many more months. It's already been delayed uh, five or six just to for a uh, pandemic. And to send away an applicant with a condition of forced closings by the end of the year, to me, uh, is something that may not even happen. So I wouldn't be for her forcing them to close by December 31st. Making all efforts to do so, yes. And maybe there's something that could be proffered up in lieu of a closing in December um, in forms of some kind of a guarantee that the city would experience some of that tax benefit. I don't know how that works out. I know that Mr. White said he's got to explore, even if it's possible for us to impose that, because we're, we're not here talking about that. We're talking about a change in zoning. So um, we've heard a lot of comments tonight. A lot of things have been said. It's a very emotional time. And I've lived in this city nearly 30 years. I've watched the Park of Commerce. I've watched people come and go. I've watched um, nothing happen out there for the most part. It's been spoken about many times. Changes have been made in the Park of Commerce to accommodate things that probably shouldn't be there. Uh, be that as in May. I understand the importance of being ready for a catastrophic event. Whether it happens directly in the city of Homestead, whether it happens to our neighbors to the south of us or to the north of us. When a catastrophic event hit, hits our area, we all have to come together and be prepared. I think Irma taught us a big deal about the tree removal and debris. You had nowhere to put it. I'm also for looking at protecting the environment, making sure that the construction process is done in a way that there is no seepage of fluid. I have all the confidence in the world that a Fortune 500 company is capable of making those things happen for us. As far as the park is concerned, I feel that it's a nice gesture. It takes some responsibility off of uh, the, the owner of the property to hand over 17 acres, whatever it is, to the city. But I also think that it would be financially irresponsible at this time to accept the responsibility of maintaining the park. I think they've offered us $250,000. I think someone mentioned that it might cover 15 years of maintenance. I think that's fair. Uh, if they're gonna proffer us up a park that our residents now and in the future are gonna use and enjoy, I think at some point we should be able to take care of that property. 15 years, if that's the offer, I think it's adequate time for that to happen. I was on the fence. I wasn't sure. There's still plenty of land out there for 
an Amazon type company, a FedEx type company, UPS, whomever it may be, to look at this area as well. I think the problem has been laid out to us as leaders of the city that the lands in that area come with a lot of challenges. One challenge is obviously protecting the base. This gives the base some sense of security that at least this 98 acres will no longer threaten their missions. Having heard everything tonight and waiting to hear the rest of the comments, I will be supporting this tonight. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Roth. I want to address one of your initial comments in your last uh, monologue, and that is you're questioning the veracity of, of Amazon. I think if you'd have been a closer listen at, at the question, a question that Vice Mayor asked of staff earlier, she used the word large distribution facility. At first, she asked if it was coming to the Park of Commerce or if we knew anything that was coming to the Park of Commerce. Clearly, Michelle Lopez of our planning department answered in the affirmative that the initial filings had been made to lay the groundwork for a large distribution facility in the city limits of Homestead, but not in the Park of Commerce. And I don't appreciate you any more than I appreciate somebody from Coral Gables intimating that the mayor was dangling um, carrots that may or may not be true here at the last minute. Certainly, I agree with the speaker from JLL. They have their time frames and they have their, their protocols and we had certainly um, hope to make an announcement before now, but certainly with the world turned upside down, uh, that just wasn't the case. Uh, when this came up in the course of conversation and those principals and, and interested parties and representatives were watching, I was given the green light to go ahead and confirm that was in fact in the pipeline. And I had hoped that we had been able to announce this earlier so that it would convince a majority of us that there was the potential for bigger, better, more job producing uh, projects on, on this particular parcel. So while you not, may not like what I say or how I say it, you can always believe it, Councilman Roth, count on that. Council? Do we have a motion for approval? I'll make the motion to move it. We have a motion by Councilman Roth. To I'll second this it. As presented with no qualification. And was that a second from Councilwoman Avila? Bailey. Bailey. Okay, I'm sorry. I, I want the record to be clear. I'm sorry. Sometimes I can tell you all apart on this audio and sometimes I, it's okay. I can't. So the motion is made and seconded would be to to move this forward as presented with no additional conditions and I guess really no resolution as to the park com the proposed park component or safeguards on, on truck traffic. It's my understanding there is safeguards on the trucks. Um, uh, Councilwoman, I, I didn't hear anything other than we promise. Uh, I, and I, again, I don't know how we, we police that. Um, you know, and I'm, I'm looking to, to those of you who are prepared to support this to try to make it a good deal as possible for our residents. 
Um, From the first day that they came forth, I just will speak for myself. I have spoken to the applicant about every single thing that has been brought to my attention. It's incredibly important for me to look out for the best interests of the city. I definitely, that is 100% the way that I will always vote. I mentioned before, this isn't the ideal business to come to the area, but it is also, it's a commercial and industrial zone. So it's, I don't know, as far as the park, I would like, where are we exactly on the park? What were the last details? Uh, to my recollection, there was no, no firm direction given as to how that may be uh, negotiated out during, between now and the second reading. So can we move this forward? and have a last discussion on the park at second reading? Mr. Attorney. Mm -hmm. uh, Mayor, Council Member, I think uh, if that's the direction, what we could do is we can certainly, um, there have been a couple of different options uh, uh, with regards to the park. Um, we could work with the applicant and the city manager's office to um, outline a couple of those options um, that uh, would be available um, or that would be on the table for consideration. And we could bring that, um, have that uh, teed up on second reading if this moves forward. I think we should do that. You know, this, this all started coming about when the council seat for area five was up. And one of the biggest things that I heard were a lack of parks and areas for residents to walk around. So that's one of the reasons that I spent a lot of time on that part of it because that's my area, but it was one of the things that came up often. So I wanna make sure that it is something that the area would appreciate and be able to use and that doesn't cost an additional uh, fee from the city. Mayor, if I may. Councilwoman Alva, yeah. Thank, yes, you. thank you. I appreciate um, Councilman ba Councilwoman Bailey's um, comments on that. I appreciate you considering that the park is a priority for us. It is, and that is one of the um, the main topics of discussion with that I had with Copart. I can support this motion, but I would like for the motion to be restated with the or to include the restrictions to their declaration to include the triggers uh, for the activating of the site and for uh the and and so that we can come back and decide on the park at the second reading as well and i and i know that we also discussed trying to find a way to uh, ensure due diligence for closing on time uh, takes a, you know, it happens. So I'm not, is that something we'll also discuss at the second reading? If that's the case, then I can support the motion. Thank you. Thank you, Councilwoman. Mayor. Yes, Councilman Shelley, thank you. Yeah, I think there's a lot of, you know, I think I expressed some concerns. Um, Council's expressed some concerns that they have. You've expressed some concerns that you've had as far as things that we might want to have as conditions. I know that the uh, applicants um, representative had indicated that after public comment, they you know would hopefully be able to have an opportunity to confer with their clients and maybe give us some some clarity. I do think some of the conditions that are being requested are not easy answers and things that could potentially be uh, clarity given tonight. I know I have some questions about how certain things would be implemented, and and I want some specifics before I start voting on certain conditions. But I do think that the applicant needs to be prepared with a bunch of different scenarios because I think some of these conditions are going to need to be or likely will be inserted by the second reading or by the time uh, it would pass on second reading. And I think now that these issues have been raised, I think the applicant needs to be prepared with answers and potential solutions uh, and also use the time between first reading and second reading 
to work out some of these details amongst uh, the council members as well as with city staff to figure out what can actually be done and how can some of these things be accomplished. Um, I don't know. I don't know that we'll solve all of those problems tonight, even if we continue to discuss them, because I think that some of these are not. I don't think there's enough information on the table or or enough direction given at this point to be able to get some of those things done. And I know we have a long agenda. Uh, there's still a lot of other big big items to discuss going forward tonight. So I, I would support the motion as is, but with the understanding that that likely there's going to need to be some changes and some ultimate ultimate uh, conditions placed before a final passage would occur on second reading. Um, and so I just wanted to make that that comment, Mayor, because I do think that there are some things that the applicant needs to be ready to to address. And then just weighing in on the park. Because uh, I, I haven't done that yet. I mean, I do have similar concerns. I, I expressed those to them when they first came to me about, you know, a revenue stream being required to maintain that park going forward. I mean, providing a turnkey park is a great thing, but the maintenance going forward is always uncertain. And although they, there is a an amount set aside and there's a, a estimated cost for that maintenance, I don't know where that came from either. I would want some sort of justification to show that the fifteen thousand dollars a year is, in fact, all it will take to keep those things maintained, you, you've, got a, you've got a concrete uh, uh, or pathway that you're building that potentially could you know, crumble or could have effects as well that could require some potholes and some other things being filled over time. So I, I do think there's more maintenance, unforeseen maintenance that could occur, and I have some concerns about that. Um, you know, but I, I do think it would be nice to have the park for the residents to the extent that that's what a lot of people are looking forward to. So I just again I think that the key for me on that park is going to be finding out safety wise to make sure that there's not a long term uh, maintenance issue or liability issue for the city, uh, but still provide that benefit for the residents. And if they can solve that problem, then I, I think it's a great thing. But but I do have some concerns about long term maintenance issues. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Councilman. Mayor, uh, yes. this is James. If I could uh, just interject for a moment. Um, before we're waiting to hear back from Ms. Slavens with respect to um, consultation with her client on uh, proffered, additional proffered declarations that um, would, uh, would provide some parameters with respect to um, the use, the catastrophic event, the South Florida radius, um, and overflow vehicle storage um, prohibited from their other locations. Um, if the applicant, um, I mean, we don't have the ability to mandate that they modify their proper declaration, but certainly if the applicant doesn't proper that, I think it's appropriate that we can make that um, a condition of approval and we can come up with some parameters that would um, address those concerns or those issues um, with regards to this use. So, pending um, the applicant's representative getting back with us, do we have a means by which to uh, to recess this hearing and move on to the next items and come back to this later in the agenda? Is that what's being suggested? I, Mayor, I, I don't know if Ms. Slavens is uh, where she is on this issue, uh, if if we need to do that or not. I, I can't say. If I may, um, you, Mr. Mayor, um, I have had conversations with um, the client, and they are willing to consider all of these potential conditions, and we would like the opportunity to move forward this evening and work out the language and the, the dynamics of each condition between first and second reading and present you with a revised declaration of restrictions, memorializing all the things that we've discussed this evening by second reading. Thank you, Council. All right, so I say to my colleagues then, uh, having heard Council for uh, for the applicant and there is a there's a motion a second on the table to move this forward as um, presented is there any further comments from um, from council members on on this item 
All right, are there any final comments from the public? Do we have anybody in the queue? Uh, Mayor, we have a, a call-in user uh, 38, um, which I can unmute, and then they will hear a tone so they can speak. Okay, let's go, let's go to that quickly then. Actually, this is Brian Smith again. Uh, you know, I guess we could just, we could leave this alone, but I'm just curious as to, on record, Mayor, uh, with regarding Amazon, do you have permission to be disclosing that they're sitting down with you and pursuing opportunities in Homestead? I would like to know that. I do. I, I stated that a little while ago in my response to someone's complaint uh, that they weren't uh, weren't aware of it. You know, if you want to pursue me and bring down Amazon on my head because I'm not supporting um this application that your employer is going to get a commission on that's fine i'm ready to do battle mayor mayor may I, may I may i say something with, with all due respect may i say something contest with you i answered your question all right so we have a motion in a second let's have a roll call vote councilman ross Yes. Councilwoman Bailey? Yes. Councilwoman Avila? Councilwoman Avila? Yes. Thank you. Councilman Shelley? Yes. Councilman Fletcher? No. Vice Mayor Fairclough Staggers? Yes. Mayor Lawson? No. The motion carries. Thank you. Thank you all. Look forward to seeing all of you again uh, next month from the Copart team. Appreciate your your courtesies, uh, Ms. Slavens. All right. Thank you, Mayor. Good night, everyone. Good night. Thank you. All right. So that takes, takes us to... Um, tab 14, the first reading of car number 2944, amending the annual consumer price index adjustment. Um, is this Mr. White or Mr. Uh, Pearl? Actually, Mayor, I think it's me. Okay. Thank you, Mayor. Section 28-13, annual consumer price index, the CPI adjustment of water and sewer rates, fees and charges was first established in 2002 with the intent that the rates would be annually adjusted by such index. Pursuant to this section, the rates were last CPI adjusted in 2008. The purpose of this amendment is twofold. Number one, to change the current CPI table from all items to the water and sewer and trash collection service CPI table to better mirror the operations whose rates are being adjusted. And also to clarify that any and all CPI adjusted rate changes pursuant to this ordinance will require council approval via resolution. Staff recommends that the Mayor and Council approve the proposed ordinance amending Section 28-13 Annual Consumer Price Index Adjustment of Water and Sewer Rates, Fees and Charges. And Mayor, this is not an increase to water and sewer rates, it's just a change to the ordinance. Any increase to water and sewer rates would have to come back to Council. Correct, thank you. And I, I appreciate the, the explanation that you and your staff provided uh, to me earlier in the week and uh, certainly this I'll admit this ordinance was one that was passed uh, on the heels of a, the last financial meltdown in the city back in 1999 and 2000. So, um, council, any questions or comments? Do we have a motion for approval? Move it. I had two of you talking at the same time. Who who moved it? I'll second it. This is Amelia. Okay. Vice you. Mayor. Thank you, Vice Mayor. So moved by the Vice Mayor, seconded by Council on Avila. Um, anything further from Council? Anyone from the public? Do we have anyone in line?
None appearing. And any final comments from council? All right. Um, would anyone wish to be recorded as a no vote on car number 2944, tab 14, amending section 2813, annual consumer price index adjustment? Um, do we need to have this read by title? Matt? I believe we do, Mayor. I think so, too. Let's see if we can get Matt back in in a second. Okay. No James, changes. can you read it in? Matt, we can't hear you. Uh, we heard you sigh. Mr. Mayor? Yes, got you. Okay. Thank you. I, I don't know what happened there, but I apologize. Happens to um, <laughs> This is an ordinance for first reading, an ordinance of the City of Homestead, Florida, amending the City Code of Ordinances by amending Chapter 28 Utilities, Article 1 in general. Section 2815, Annual Consumer Price Index Adjustment of Water and Sewer Rates, Fees, and Charges, amending the mechanism for annual consumer price index CPI adjustment in rates, fees, and charges concerning water and or sewer services, providing for severability, providing for inclusion in the code, providing for conflicts, and providing for an effective date. Thank you. Okay, we have a motion and a second on this item. Would anyone wish to be recorded as a no vote as to the amendment of this ordinance? And appearing then, uh, Madam Clerk, I guess you'll enter this as being unanimously approved on first reading. Next item, agenda section seven, tab 15. Uh, is this you, uh, Madam Manager? Yes, it is, Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. The City of Homestead has been awarded a $44,168 grant from the Florida Department of State Division of Cultural Affairs for general program support at the Seminole Theater. The grant award requires a $44,168 match that will be covered by the cost of the contract for Pinnacle Venue Services. Staff recommends that the Mayor and Council approve the attached resolution authorizing the City Manager to enter into an agreement and establish a budget for a grant award of $44,168 from the Florida Department of State Division Cultural Affairs for General Program Support at the Seminole Theater. Thank you. Council? I'll move it. Moved by, was that Avila? Okay. We have a motion Second. for approval. Second. Second by Mr. Fletcher. Um, I have one question I want to clarify. One of the questions I was bringing to the table tonight, I saw that it was a matching grant but I wasn't clear that our existing obligation was able to cover our obligation for this grant. Do you, Mayor, mean the existing obligation to Pinnacle? To Pinnacle, yes. Yes, yes, sir, it does. That okay. is our match. Yes. Thank you, because I, I did have a concern about obligating ourselves for yet another $45,000. No. In addition to the four hundred and fifty we're already obligated for. Uh, for this project. So, no, sir. Thank you on that one. Anything further from Council? Would anyone wish to be registered as a no vote on this resolution, car number 2936, tab 15, 2021 General Program Support Grant for the Seminole Theater? Anyone wishing to be recorded as a no vote? Not appearing, and it appears to have passed unanimously. Okay. All right, so um, yes, tab 16, we're back to the charter review recommendations. And uh, Mr. Pearl, is that your your time in the spotlight at this point? Yes, sir, can you hear me? We can. Okay, fantastic. So following our, our workshop last week, um, there were some changes made to the initial uh, resolution uh, that was provided based on the recommendations of the committee as we've made some changes to the text 
what I'd like to do with the council's permission is to go through each of the questions, um, take a, discuss them, answer any questions, and take a vote on whether or not we want that particular question to be included in the resolution should you decide to move forward. At the end of the evaluation of each of the five questions that remain, um, I'll ask for a vote on moving the resolution forward, either as it is or as we amend it um, as we go, if that's okay with the council. Anyone? All right, well, let's proceed. Okay. Question number one deals with the implementation of a requirement that an elected official desiring to run uh, midterm in order to run for the another elected office in the city, basically going from council member to mayor midterm, notify the city clerk 30 days prior to uh, the commencement of qualifying so that the clerk has enough time to work with the supervisor of elections to have that vacancy filled at the subsequent election. Um, there was some discussion at the workshop that um, people were uncomfortable with the, the hard 30-day deadline. And so in the intervening time, an amendment was made um, that would permit an individual to revoke this notice of intent and retain their current council seat, provided that the revocation was submitted to the city clerk in writing not less than 10 days prior to the first day of the qualifying period. So it, you provided, it would offer the person who files the initial intent to change their mind as long as it was done so, basically in conjunction with the state's 10-day mandate to, retire, uh, to resign to run. So that is question one as it has, was amended um, based on the discussion that we had at the workshop. If there are any questions, I'm happy to answer them. If not, and somebody would like to make a, a motion to move that forward, then I would appreciate that. Council? Questions, comments? I think in, in short, when this was discussed, um, the adjustment addresses uh, the concerns raised by Councilman Shelley, then what we've done here is we've created a balance to put potential candidates on notice for the seat being vacated 30 days out, that there's a potential that that seat will be available. And then um, at a point 10 days prior to the first day of qualification, it draws a hard line in the sand that someone has to be um, to be in or out as to um, pursuing the other office, which is which allows our clerk time to coordinate with the supervisor of elections. Really, Mr. Pretty, pretty straightforward. Is that you, Mr. She Councilman Shelley? Yes, it is. Just a just question on, on, I guess, procedure here. I, I maybe missed what Matt had said. I, I got distracted here. But as far as what we're planning to do, which is, Matt, you're going to go through each question, I guess, answer questions that the council may have on, on any amendments or any changes that were made from our last meeting to this meeting on that question. And then are we voting for, at that point, like right now, you're asking for a motion to vote on each one of these to then put them forward onto the ballot? Is that where we are uh in this process? No, what I what I would like to do is take a motion on each question, whether you want it included in the resolution, and then at the end of going through each of the five questions, then I would take a motion to approve the resolution as may be amended, depending on what the the council's position is on each one of the questions. So if you were to, if we, for instance, there was a vote not to move forward on a particular question, the final vote would be to pass the resolution with the removal of that proposed charter amendment. All right, so since we're, we're repeating what we did last meeting and like we're moving these forward to final form, but then the final vote will be taken at the end of this, which will um, include all, if we move all of these forward, then that final vote will be to move them all to the ballot, or if we only move some of these forward, then the final vote will be move the whatever ones we did move forward onto the ballot. So that'll be, because I have some discussion and some, um, I guess dialogue I'd like to have before I get to the final vote, but I, if that's not where we are, then I have no problem. I can move these forward 
to then have a final vote. I just wanted to make sure I understood where we were. Okay, yeah, well, think, I'm sorry, Mayor, go ahead. No, I think that, Matt, as I understand your explanation, that um, there's going to be at least two opportunities to vote uh, tonight. First, as to whether or not it goes forward, and then the final form of the the global resolution putting setting an election date and putting these questions on the ballot. Well, I'd like, as we go through each question, I will call for a motion to have that question either included in the final resolution or not. Once, if it is not, then we're going to set that aside so that when we hold the final vote on the resolution, that will, the, the motion to approve that final resolution will be subject to the amendment of the removal of any of the particular question that was voted down as we go. Or adjustment of a question. Or adjustment, yes. Or adjustment. And I okay. think that was to Councilman Shelley's point. Yeah, I, I just, Mayor, I'm sorry, when you said we're going to have two cracks at each one, if we change, if we vote to remove this one, oh, yeah, as, we go, one as we go, one we go. Okay. Absolutely. I just wanted to make sure we were all on the same page. All right. Very good. Councilman Shelley? Yeah, no, I, that's all. I just, before I, we made the, the final, my, my discussion, I guess, and my analysis may come when we go to the actual ballot. When does it actually go into the ballot? Um, that's where I probably have most of my discussion. So I wanted to make sure I knew when to have that. So as okay. far as I know right now is not the time. Um, I'll have my opportunity then to kind of weigh in. Maria, thank you. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Yes, thanks. Mr. Mayor, if I may? Yes, Councilwoman. Thank you. Question for Matt. Doesn't number one coincide with number three and four? And so wouldn't it be more appropriate to decide on three and four first before we decide on number one? Or am I confused? Um, it, it, it works. You can re require the mandate whether it does three, whether we go a special election or not, um, but the impact of the mandate would be blunted. So if you prefer to take this out of order and go with three or four before we address that, we can certainly do that. I think that makes more sense to me, yeah. Okay. Well, I think the core question, I, th I think the question I'm hearing is, is that the intent of question one is to fill the vacated seat by the upcoming regular election. That's the intent and the, the text of, of the, the actual charter provision that's proposed. So councilwoman, correct me if I'm wrong, is it that 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 you are perhaps rethinking whether or not a vacancy that occurs as a result of an upcoming upcoming election is going to be filled by election regular you know within that next regular election or by appointment of some sort is that correct Correct. I'm thinking that there's um, still some thought that the vacancy could be filled by vacancy, by appointment, rather. Okay. That the vacancy could be filled by appointment versus a special election. Um, but, mm -hmm. okay, but I'm sorry to interrupt, but let's not, conf let's, let's focus on this. And maybe it helps if we put real world situations to this. Let's take the situation back in August of, um, mm -hmm. of 2019. If Councilman Shelley sit, sitting as, if this had been in effect, if Councilman, she if Mr. Shelley sitting as interim mayor decided to give up his guaranteed two final two years in his council seat to run for mayor in his own right, then his council, the remaining term of his council seat would be filled in that same election. It's not just a general vacancy. This is a vacancy where someone resigns to run in the next regular homestead election, if that makes any difference. Right, and, and at that point, it would still be a piggyback cost to the city. Correct. 
Um, as far as I know, and, and some of the numbers that were were circulated today, don't tell the complete story. This would just be a matter of adding a name or a position or a race to the ballot that's already going to be printed, advertised, and circulated for the election anyway. So it's kind of hard to imagine what real cost would be associated with the addition of a name by by having it concurrent, having what's deemed a special election concurrent with the next regular election. And then what would happen on the off election years? We'd be forced to run a special election. Well, in the if someone left office for for any reason, death, removal, resignation, whatever, whatever it may be, under the current scenario, it would depend on how much time is left in. Well, no, it wouldn't matter. It would be under our current scenario a pure appointment. So I I guess that means you want to jump to perhaps question three and analyze that scenario? Well, I'm thinking question one should follow question three and four. If we can maybe start with question two, then do three and four, and then go to one after that. I think just chronologically, just thinking of the the way I'm in, the way my brain is working on how we have to logistically see these things working out, that makes sense to me. And I'd like to hear the, you know, other comment on this from the, the rest of my colleagues too. Well, Let's do this. Since we already opened the conversation on question one, um, okay. You know, other than the concerns that you have expressed, um, I'm wondering if there, you know, other than perhaps the implementation, which we'll get to at the next stage, are there any additional questions or concern or concerns from council as to question one? For me. Sure, Councilman Roth. Yeah, one of the one of our sticking points in, in the last meeting was the consensus of putting it on this year's November ballot. So instead of debating all these things once again, and maybe take a consensus, ask the question now, a stand up, you know, straight up and down vote. Do we want to put this on the 2020 ballot so we can avoid this? These are some good topics. I get that part. There's some things that need to be looked at and changed and maybe even removed, but, um, you know, instead of wasting everyone's time in getting to the final vote and saying, hey, uh, I'd rather not see it on this year's ballot, I think we need to get that that out of the, out of the way, whether it's, yes, we do want to see it on there, or no, we don't. But I, think it's gonna come, I think it's going to come down to that. Make a motion, then. I'll make a motion that we we decide this if we want it to go on the 2020 ballot the november 2020 ballot or do we want to put this off until a homestead election in 2021 Mayor, can, can I restate just to clarify? So I understand yeah, where I, going. I was trying to get the words out to pose that very question to you. Thank you. Can I? I don't want to. Um, I think that uh, Councilman Roth, and you can correct me if I'm overstepping, that you would like a motion to defer consideration of these th these items uh, to a future time, or are you trying to say that you want these very items on the 2021 ballot? Because I think there's two different things. If we want to, if we want further consideration of these, then I think you can make a motion to defer this item to a subsequent meeting to talk about the substance, which would basically have the effect of taking it off the 2020 ballot because we have to submit this by the end of the month. Um, versus, you know, you want these exact questions on the 2021 ballot, and if that's the case, we can entertain a motion that way, and we can take things from there. So. Which is the intent, and then we can craft the motion. I think it's okay. So I think what we would do is defer this and continue the conversation so that these these items don't go away 
but they go on the 2021 ballot. Okay, so I think it would be appropriate then for a motion to um, defer um, the consideration of these to a subsequent meeting, and then we could where you would go through each of them. And at that point, you could give direction to the charter committee that continues to operate, or decide at that you know whether there are any additional items that you want considered. Um, but I think for the time being, if the motion that you would like to make is a motion to defer. Fair enough. Let's make a motion to defer. We have a motion by Councilman Roth to defer. Do we have a second? I will second it because I do have additional questions that relate to the calculation of term limits, the, the process for the vacancy uh, and appointing of the same. Um, uh, so I'm making the second because there's a lot more to discuss here. Even even after getting it two weeks in advance and spending five hours last week? Okay. Mr. Mayor? Mr. Shelley. Well, let's hear, we have a motion and a second to defer all questions. Mr. Shelley. Yes, so not to throw a monkey wrench into everything either, but um, so I kind of I kind of came up last time, um, you know, advocating for exactly what the motion is now, which is the which is the deferral uh, till the next local election, preferably either either a county or or city election. And I still I still think that's the best course of action. I still think the best thing to do is to have you know to have these done at the local election. However, I will say that you know after going through all of these during the last debate and discussion, we've essentially whittled down most of and what I what I thought were substantive policy changes that I was most concerned about, essentially making sure that we had the voters who were most in tune or most um, involved in the city of Homestead's dealings to understand what we were doing and making that policy decision, you know, when we're talking about four-year terms and, and uh, further strengthening or changing term limits and how the vice mayor is selected and things of that nature. I thought those were more substantive in nature. And, and those were more my real concerns were, you know, what I found now, you know, af after we whittled this down is for the most part, what we have left is, is technical changes where it, it's not necessarily substantive in my mind. Now, now for others, it may be substantive, but, but in my mind, it's less substantive and policy and it's more technical in nature as far as things that are already occurring or maybe maybe tweaking the way those things are occurring, but they're not making wholesale changes. So, I, I, I mean, I support the deferral if, if my colleagues or the majority wants to defer it. I mean, I, I don't have a problem deferring it. Again, I don't think there's anything that's pressing that needs to be addressed immediately, but I also am not opposed to moving some of these forward because I do think they're more technical in nature um, than, than not. Um, but I just wanted to put that on there just, just because I had kind of come out last time uh, so I wanted to make sure everybody kind of knew where my position was and where I stood based on what we're left with in front of us. Um, and then, like I said, I'll, I'll, I'll support a deferral, but I also would support moving some of these forward too tonight. Thank you, Councilman Shelley. Would any further member of council wish to weigh in before we vote on the motion? Mr. Mayor. Mr. Fletcher. Yes, thank you. Uh, I, I believe that, uh, you know, again, these questions have been often on ask for the last 15, 20 years, uh, basically in the same format. Uh, and I believe that we are doing a tremendous disservice to those individuals that we appointed to the uh, committee, uh, that each of us appointed to a committee to provide us with a recommendation that we're all unanimously, uh, with the exception of one or two items, uh, approved by those individuals uh, to bring forward to the city council and uh, I think we're doing a disservice to those individuals, and I think we are taking into account that we believe some of our voting uh, just don't want to take time to go and look at these issues. In an, in a, in an, yes, it's going to be a, a tricky election with a lot of items on the ballot, but uh, I believe the citizens of Home Center are up to, uh, to that task and will perform that duty. So I would be in favor of moving these items forward for the ballot for this year. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman. Mayor, Thank I have you. a question for Matt. Sure, Councilwoman. Thank you. Thank you. Matt, um, with regards to, for example, calculation of term limits, if a council member were to resign, let's say, within the uh, first three months of starting their term, 
when does the clock start for their mandatory break if this were to be adopted? Does it start after, or does it, does, for example, does the two years start right at the time of vacancy? So it basically time, time vacant, vacated is applied towards the two year break, or does the break start after the four years goes by that they would have served? I believe that the intent is that it would count concurrently that someone is not sitting on the dais for two years um, would come, would be able to come back. That would be considered a break in service. But if that's something that the council would like to clarify, because it is a good point and it was not something that was discussed at the committee level, um, you know, language can be added to clarify that. Right, so so this is something that I would like clarification from the committee on because I don't think it would be fair for the clock to start ticking four years later for a two year break. I would think that any time vacated would be applied towards um, the required break. And if not, I'd like to hear why. And so I think that that deserves a thorough thought process. Um, and there's, I think, a, a, a really good opportunity to, to add to this list with this wish, wish list of changes um, the idea of maybe changing to a presidential election cycle so that we can have more voters accounted for for when it comes to federal funding. So I think that there's um, this is a good start. I think that there's um, uh, other items to bring to the list as well, but I, I, we still need clarification on, on these items. Mayor, if I may. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Um, at our last meeting, um, that I apologize, I had to abruptly leave on because of my daughter. I had mentioned that I was prepared to go either way. What was most important for me and my line of questions um, amplified that was the fact that I was very interested in the committee really taking a deeper dive into the charter and bringing forth all the recommendations um, to the council to consider. With committees, the understanding is that they are a recommending body. So what they bring to us is ultimately up to the decision of council. So I don't want to dismiss the work that they have done um, as a part of this process. And I support them continuing this process and moving forward and um, having more conversations about recommendations for charter changes. So I wouldn't be opposed to deferring this to give the committee an opportunity to really look at and address all the charter um, amendments that they want to proffer to the council collectively. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Any further comments from council on the motion to defer in full? Well, I just like to interject that there's been this continued articulation that either voters aren't going to know what they're going to vote on or they'll ignore the end of the ballot in this upcoming November election. And again, for whatever it's worth, we've always done in my 20 year involvement done charter review elections that have always gone very well in November elections. Some were presidential years, some were not. But it would seem to me that if we, if the goal is to really have those voters who are engaged um, lay in, those good quality educated voters are going to go to the end of the ballot and they're going to have educated themselves on these questions. I, I think that 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 on that on on that basis, it's, it's very dismissive to to our to our voters. And I kind of thought, leaving our marathon meeting last week, that that we had resigned ourselves to the fact that um, there are other couple other huge issues, at least two, that would take more time than we already had and perhaps should be standalone um, in the next election cycle 
because they are so momentous rather than putting tremendous items on on a ballot with uh, with these items. I mean, um, I think I know what the real intent here is, and and I apologize again to to the committee that that you got caught up in in oppositional politics. I don't know what else to call it and being transparent. I don't think there is anything else we can call it. So um, we need to be real clear to the people that these items that have been massaged and, and, and worked on over a five to six month period and the adoption of some of them could play a vital role and clarify a lot of ambiguities between now and the next election, as well as govern the next election. And personally, I think, think that's a point uh, very, very important. So, um, you know, we're potentially kicking the can down the road for a period of, uh, of two years, but there, there is a motion. And uh, if there's nothing further from council, I think we need to have a roll call vote on the motion to defer in full. Mayor, if I just may, one yes, second. Vice Mayor. I just, I just wanted to be clear that my emphasis was on bringing all of the items at one time. I understand your perspective. I was interested in seeing all of the items at one time, particularly single district voting, which has been in, in conversations for some time. So, I, I mean, honestly, I don't have a dog in this fight. The reason why I support moving, deferring this item is so that all items can come at one time. So I just want to place that on there for the record. Thank you, Mayor. Okay. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Appreciate it. Anything further from Council? No, Councilwoman Avila, those who supported you certainly got their money's worth tonight. So let's have a roll call there. I take offense to that. Yes. Councilwoman Bailey? No. Councilman Fletcher? No. Councilman Shelley? Councilman yes. Shelley? Yes. Councilwoman Avila? Yes. Councilwoman uh, Vice Mayor Fairclaude Staggers? Yes. Mayor Lawson? No. Thank you all. Motion, motion. carries. All right. We are now at uh, item 17, discussion on a uh, significant uh, big picture item. Since we've been at this, for uh, since what four o'clock, four thirty? Um, would anyone object to recessing for about ten minutes and coming back and starting fresh at this uh, this next item? Mayor, just a question: At to what time did we extend the meeting to? Well, we Was extended it ten. We're going to have to come back and extend anyway. Okay. No, okay, no I, don't, I don't oppose that. Yeah. Um, so, is, is there anyone that objects to to a to a ten minute recess, or do we just want to continue? All right, Mr. White, tab number seventeen. <clears throat> yes, Mayor. Tab seventeen. Uh, we placed this item on for your um, consideration, discussion, and for direction um, as to uh, where the um, council would like to go. Um, I provided some background information in your agenda. I know it's been a long evening, so I'll try to be brief and concise, um, but it'll take me a moment to sort of explain where we are, how we got here, and what's on the table for you all for this evening. Um, 
so background information on this is that um, in May of this year, May 21st, the city was presented with uh, the pre-suit notices for two separate claims uh, pursuant to the uh, Roche Harris Jr. Private Property Rights Protection Act, otherwise known as the Harris Act. Um, the, those two notices claims are in your agenda packet. And those claims were presented to the city on behalf of the Alger family. Um, those claims relate to approximately 192 acres uh, that are owned by the Alger family that are currently designated agriculture under our future land use map designation and under the county zoning designation, but they fall within and under the accident potential zone, um, which is an overlay zoning district that prohibits residential development um, that comes out of our adoption of the 20, uh, out of adoption of our airport zoning regulations for the, for the HARB. Um, so I'll digress for a moment just to, uh, to give you a little bit of history on the, the, the Harris Act. Um, so the Harris Act is a um, creature of the legislature that uh, came about um, around 1995. And essentially, uh, the intent behind the legislation uh, was that uh, it would provide uh, private property owners the ability to seek uh, relief under the Harris Act if um, as a separate and distinct cause of action from a takings claim uh, if the property owner um, was able to show that a regulation, law, or ordinance as applied to their property inordinately burdens or restricts or limits their rights on the property. Um, so this, was, th this Harris Act claim is a standard that's less than a takings claim um, and is not as burdensome as a takings claim or what you would have to show under a takings claim under either the state or the United States Constitution. So the standard is something less than takings, and that's the intent behind uh, this Harris Act statute. And um, that's what the Algiers have done. They've, uh, they've submitted notices to us of their proposed uh, Harris Act claims. Uh, the way that the statute works is that um, upon receipt of these claims, there is a window, a 90-day period, um, before any um, before a claim can be filed in circuit court by the Algiers. In that 90-day time frame, there are certain requirements um, that we, as a local government, um, have to consider. Um, and so this evening. I'm requesting direction from you all as to how you would like to proceed under uh, the Harris Act. And I can get into a little bit more specifics as to the history of this if you'd like, or we can jump right into um, the options on the table for your consideration this evening. Whatever the council, whatever the will of the, ca the council is, I'm happy to do. Council? Yes, I mean. Yes, Council Walmart. Yeah, I'd like to I'd like to see us um defend the case. I have a question. If we if we move forward in defending, does this close the door to any possible settlement later? Uh no, it doesn't. And and uh under the Harris Act, um so there are a couple of options on the table for us right now in this 90-day period. Um, the first is that uh, we as a local government could uh, entertain or proffer a settlement um, proposal to the Algiers. Uh, and if the Algiers accepted that, then we would be off and running in um, implementing the terms of a settlement agreement um, 
and that would stay the time frame. We would agree to stay the time frame for filing any future litigation until the terms of the settlement agreement were either effectuated or not. Um, so that's step one. If we if we don't decide or proceed with a proposed settlement offer uh, to the Algiers under the Harris Act, then the, the, the next step that we do is we're required to provide the Algiers with a, um, a letter indicating what their permitted uses are on the property. Um, and in that letter, we would also probably uh, put in any, uh, any defenses, procedural uh, or substantive defenses that we have as a placeholder for any future litigation. Uh, once the Algiers get that letter, they can agree or not agree. If they don't agree, then they are able to file a Harris Act claim in circuit court. And once they file the Harris Act claim in circuit court, then um, we have the ability to request an executive session, a shade session, to discuss possible uh, settlement options, if that would be the will of the council. Otherwise, we would be off in defending the Harris Act claim. The third option is if we take no action, which I don't recommend, um, if we definitively say that we are not interested in settlement, that we are not going to provide Algiers with a letter uh, which provides their allowable permitted uses, uh, that is, that, that, that's final action uh, that could um, allow, allow the Algiers to proceed immediately to circuit court and file uh, these Harris Act claims uh, and not wait the full 90 days. So the 90 day time frame that we're talking about, the earliest, um, uh, that 90 day time frame runs approximately the middle of August, August 19th. Um, so if we, if we were talking about settlement or we were talking about um, providing uh, the Alger family with a letter uh, memorializing their permitted uses on the property, um, once they receive that letter, I mean, timing wise, we're already toward the end of July. So um, it would probably be close to that 90 day period um, before the Algiers would be able to file in uh, circuit court. So those are the few, those are the, the options that are on the table that we as a city uh, need to decide um, what we're going to do um, as requirements under the Harris Act. Right. James? Yes, sir. That's right. Let, let me be clear. You know, when the councilwoman talks about defending the case, does she really mean going directly to litigation? As I understand your memorandum, we are obligated within the 90 days to do a handful of things. We are required to give them a statement of allowable uses under all of our applicable ordinances as they exist. And we are required to make a written settlement offer. And there are 11 specific items. And 10 is kind of a buffet of, of starting point of how can we make some adjustments to, to make you happy. And number 11 is our offer is here's your list of allowable uses and we are not proposing to make any changes that would adjust that list, expand that list of, out, of allowable uses in any manner. Is, is that a fair lay summary of, of our obligations at this point? Yes, Mayor, that would be correct. And based upon our response, the contents of our response, the potential claimants could either 
have an open-ended ability to enter into settlement discussions with us based upon our response, or at any time in the future, with or without pursuing settlement options, the burden is on them to bring the formal lawsuit. It, uh, is that a fair, fair assessment? Yes, Mayor. That's correct. Okay. Now, let me back up and rewind a minute. I'm sorry I didn't uh, mention this at the outset. I was trying to gather gather my thoughts for this, this situation. And again, I used the word transparency in a, in a hearing earlier tonight. And I sit here. We potentially, we being the city, the people, the taxpayers and residents of this city, in a worst case scenario, are faced with the potential of a liability in excess of $13 million, together with incurring our own attorney's fees and being on the hook for the claimant's attorney's fees. Worst case scenario. All against the backdrop we have some serious budget decisions to make going forward. And based upon my conversations with staff, that it may very well be that if things don't come together, the enactment of a millage rate of the maximum rate of 10 may not be sufficient to cover all of our shortfalls without some major budget cuts. And I say all this to lay the foundation for the following, the people need to be assured that there is pure transparency. And as I sit here tonight, this has been weighing on my mind a long time. I believe, and I need the people need that are watching or are going to hear about this need to know that I believe that two members of this council have if not in fact an actual legal conflict of interest, they carry to this discussion the appearance of an impropriety. And I believe that at the very least, that until those two members go out and get an independent evaluation of both the legal and, and, and practical and appearance implications, that those two members should have no part in the conversation tonight or any subsequent conversation until those issues are resolved. That, that's my, my real concern. This is not playing around. This is not political gamesmanship with whether or not we're going to put things on char the charter ballot. This is not granting co-part for big fat campaign and charitable contributions down the road. This is real life major financial issues facing us. This could bankrupt our community. And I would hope that those two members, and you know who you are, have the decency within you to recognize that there is a legitimate inference of something between an actual legal conflict of interest and an appearance of impropriety and walk off the dais now. Okay, so the silence speaks volumes, and we'll we'll deal with that. Um, so, James, now that we've put it in in context, I think that the conversation needs to be. Um, I guess you're looking for direction as to what item or items from from that buffet list of 11, are we going to direct you to propose? Yes, Mayor, that's correct. And uh, and in your in your in the memorandum that I I provided in your uh, in your packet, um, there is a section called Bert Harris claims statutory requirements. That's exactly what I'm looking at. And uh, the second paragraph references the uh, statutory provision 70-004C. And there's a enumerated list of various items um, that are available uh, for us to choose from 
with regards to a written settlement offer. And certainly, number one, number two is applicable here if you're looking at some type of legislative change or modification to the existing regulations um, and rolling, rolling, the re, rolling the prohibition on residential back um, that the Algiers are claiming uh, is the regulation that is the subject of this Harris Act claim. So that's an option. If the council doesn't want to take some sort of action that's legislative in, an or, in, in modifying an ordinance or fix, then you would direct me to number 11, which is no change to the action of the governmental entity. And so if that's the direction, we would incorporate that into a letter, which would, uh, which would be a combination of our written settlement offer pursuant to the statute, um, as well as rolled into that would be the permitted uses uh, allowed on the property. And that would, uh, once we did that, that would, that would be the last, uh, last thing the elders could look at and they could decide at that point whether or not they wanted to file the Harris Act claim um, in circuit court. All right, thank you. And, you know, we're, we're in a real disadvantage here that while the Algiers have the benefit of meeting in private with their attorneys and discussing strategy and potential settlement, at this point, we have the huge disadvantage of having to discuss this in full view of the Alger dynasty and, and their council. Um, so we, we've got to make the best of it. Um, I know that when, when I met with you at length, subsequent to the receipt of the, the initial demand, we had a discussion as to whether or not a laser focus amendment of the ordinance um, to allow one on five would be a solution to take the liability off the city. A re real viable solution to get this $13 million elephant off of our back. And I've got to be very candid with everybody. I have taken it upon myself to talk to other firms throughout the state that have extensive, successful experience, both bringing and defending Burt Harris claims, and they are all in agreement with, with that very advice, that that is, is something that, that could, uh, you know, at least close the door on Burt Harris liability, it doesn't close the door on bringing, uh, facing, again, another round of litigation from the base, but it certainly uh, would relieve us from, um, from liability under this very specialized and unique to Florida uh, Burt Harris uh, takings statute. So, you know, I'd be really interested to hear from my colleagues as to whether or not they're interested in doing anything other than sitting back and daring the other side to file a lawsuit after we issue the list of allowable uses and nothing more, or is there any room from among that list of the other 10 items to, uh, to attempt uh, to work this out with having to go full board litigation. Mr. Mayor, for me? Yeah, I think that was Councilman Shelley. Thank you, Mayor. You know, this is one where, and, and James, correct me if I'm wrong, but I, but I think that, you know, we, this thing's been pending for years and years now. I guess we're on four, five, six years, I, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, from when this thing began versus where we are now. And and during that time, you know, I think that we have gone through many permutations, you know, of one through through ten. I mean, we we have had discussions about ways creatively or otherwise with the parties to figure out some way to settle this to to make it a win win for all three, which would be the city, the Algiers, and ultimately the Homestead Air Reserve base. And we came close a couple times to finding that win win and ultimately, you know, one party or the other would would back out or decide that that was no longer what they wanted or what they thought was in their best interest. So 
you know, I, there's some of these options that are on the table when you're talking about transfer of de development rights and, and increasing, um, you know, our location of the least intensive portion of the property. You know, we tried clustering where we would push the, the residential units into the area that was outside of the air reserve or outside of the AQs to, to make sure the algers would still have some sort of beneficial use of their land. You know, there was a lot of, of things that we had to go through to check those boxes, but ultimately um, couldn't get parties to move forward to, to take those actions. So I think at this point, you know, knowing how much time has been put into this and how many efforts have been made to find creative ways of settlement, I think you're really only left with one option, you know, which is their current request that I think the Algiers are making, which is ultimately a change of the legislation to to give them specifically one unit per five acres on that property. Um, and so, I mean, James, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think we've gone through all the other options. So right now, the only one that would even be valid for some sort of offer of settlement, unless we offer re-offer settlements of proposals we've already made, which I'm willing to do. Um, but but as far as what we know has not already been rejected by the Algiers, all that's really left is what you mentioned earlier, which is modification legislatively. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Um, I, I think the only uh, the only applicable, if we were going to uh, if we're going to proceed with proffering uh, or entertaining some sort of settlement, a written settlement offer, um, it would be based on one or two, which essentially would be some modification to the existing ordinance legislation that we've adopted. I don't think any of the other ones would be applicable at this juncture, nor do I think, based on my conversations with, um, with uh, Alger's legal representative, that um, those would even be acceptable. We've explored all of those things over the course of 10 years and um, to no avail. Correct. Still... Um, Sorry, go ahead. Well, yeah, yeah. So, so that, that was kind of my, you know, that that's the thing. And my, my personal preference is at this point, I'm not ready or willing to legislatively change to guarantee or provide for, you know, houses underneath the the flight path and so i'm i'm willing and wanting to find some way of settling i think you know I, I have been from day one and i've worked hard on this over time as well um and ultimately you know i think we're down to one option and so at this point in time i don't i wouldn't be comfortable making that offer of settlement uh now my, my you know the, my other colleagues may decide that that's a, an option that they want to take but my position is i don't want to change legislatively to guarantee or provide one per five, I do think there are other uses um, of that property that would potentially give us some good arguments. I would at least like to potentially see where things develop uh, before making some additional decisions on ultimately what I consider our liability to be and whether or not at some point I do believe that maybe we have to uh, concede and, and resolve the matter, but I'm not to that point yet. So thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Shelley. But you know, to your point, what I glean from the letter submitted, or the, the preliminary claim submitted by counsel, is that they're telling us what will fix this is the restoration or the grant. And there is some question as to whether or not there, there was anything ever to restore, but that's, that's a litigation issue of one house on five acres. And we're talking about at a maximum, 40 houses. Now, in reality, I don't know who wants to live out there under the flight path. The roads are poor. It'll take a ton of fill. But, you know, they, they've kind of boxed themselves in to that's, that's what we want. And, and clearly, they're signaling to us that nothing else is going to be, um, to be viable. And it seems to me... Um, you know, a, 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 an easy, look, I'm about getting the liability off of our shoulders. And clearly there are pools of money uh, which can be uh, potentially accessed to, to take away that concern of, of, of four, up maybe 39 or 40 houses under the, uh, the flight path. Um, clearly there, there are, I believe, there are numerous defenses available to us in litigation. The litigation is very expensive. 
And, um, you know, I think it should be something as, as a last resort. But if we, if we propose nothing, we have guaranteed litigation. So if we're going to go down that road, let me go ahead and open this can of worms. And as I said earlier, I've spoken with, with other firms around the state, both locally and throughout the state. And um, they've had, you know, little twists and different perspectives on things. But here's my concern. For nearly 10 years, our attorneys and, and the Algiers Council have been on the same side. And they've been colleagues and, and collegial um, working as co-defendants, if you will, against um, litigation brought on behalf of Homestead Air Reserve Base. I am not comfortable – well, let me, let me back up. If we are forced into litigation, it should be bare knuckled, no holds barred. And I'm not comfortable, with all due respect to our, our firm, that they can, with their history with the Alger Council and the Alger family, that they can um, rain down the blows that need to be brought on behalf of the people of this community. This is not going to be litigation that's pussyfooting around. We've got to go full bore. We've, we've been made out to be the devil in, in, this, uh, in this first volley of, of this transaction or potential litigation. They were evil, and it's all our fault. And again, I recognize we have a lot of defenses, but so we've got to be really ready to fight tooth and nail to protect the people of this city. So while it may go to litigation, I certainly don't support being the party that forced it into litigation. Fair I, I would propose that if it goes to litigation, that we retain special counsel uh, other than our usual uh, city attorneys to represent us on this matter. And that's, that's an issue we're going to have to face another day, but I'm just not comfortable that given the, the history, um, I'm going to be second guessing uh, what happens in, in litigation. But again, to propose nothing forces an expensive proposition and very risky proposition because there's very little justice at the courthouse. Um, that's my two cents. Mayor, Mayor? Yes, is that you, Mr. Roth? Yes, thank you. Um, a question for, for Mr. White. Uh, you, you pointed out that we're kind of at a disadvantage by having to speak in public in reference to uh, our potential uh, strategies. Why is that, that we don't have an executive session to meet an executive session for a potential lawsuit? So, Councilman Roth, um, the, the simple answer to this is that litigation has not been filed yet, and there, uh, there are AG opinions out there that uh, indicate that um, because this is pre-suit notice, um, it is not pending litigation and therefore does not qualify uh, as uh, as an executive session for qualify for protection um, under executive session privileges uh, under state law. So at this juncture, the only avenue for us to discuss publicly is what we're doing now, unfortunately. Um, and so we're not able to have an executive session until such time as there has been litigation filed in circuit court. Understood. Thank you. Um, you know, th this has been going on a long time, and I, it, it, I've spoken to, obviously, different folks, and I think the biggest sticking point that Algiers have is the fact that they did lose the ability to build one for five, and they had those, re those, those vested rights basically taken away from them. And I know that one of the solutions that had come up in, I guess, some of their discussions with either the base or whomever 
I, I don't know all the details, was the ability for them uh, to get those rights reinstated and then transfer those rights off of that property onto another property that would increase or solve the value issues that they're facing today. So I don't know if we can uh, proffer a, 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 um, a thought to them that if we were able to give them back the rights on that property, it would only be in the instance of being able to transfer those rights to another property, thus not in, 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 in encroaching on the Air Force Base and, and, and their missions. So that's just the thought that I had that, um, and I know that there would probably be some, some county uh, way, way into depending on where the property was, they wanted to reassert those, those vested rights. But that, that was, I think, the biggest sticking point they had. It, they don't have it out for the city. They just wanted to have the ability to reinstate those rights and then move them somewhere else. And I don't know if we can figure out a way to make that happen, have a conversation with them. Um, that way we, we kill two birds with one stone. One, we give them back their rights, we get off the hook for the lawsuit, and two, we protect the Air Force base at the same time. So I just don't know how that works out. Maybe somebody can elaborate that. Maybe James, you can you have more history probably than anybody with what, what they've been going through. But I, I think that's the biggest sticking point is um, th those rights and, and the inability to market those or to move them somewhere else. I'll leave it at that for now, but that's just my thought. Thank you. Yeah. Would you like me to respond? Please. Okay. So uh, based on my conversations uh, and the history of this, it's always been my understanding that the elders were seeking to have uh, their rights recognized, their one per five residential rights recognized uh, the density on this property. Um, there, there is an ability under the existing airport zoning ordinance where you could transfer a property from a uh, from an existing site to a receiving parcel. The problem with that is that con previous conversations with the county. Um, there are issues with regards to transferring that density to a, another property and whether or not the county would recognize or allow clustering of density because of uh, the location of the property um, in the urban development boundary line. And um, so there's issues with that. Um, but, but with regards, to, the first step is you have to recognize the rights on the property. And I think the Algiers, uh would like that as a legislative fix, and then they would be free to, in the future, market or sell those uh, rights um, to whatever entity uh, possibly could uh, purchase those development rights um, and extinguish those development rights on the property, whether it's under the county's purchase of development rights program uh, that deals with ag preservation, whether it's the, the United States military's programs with respect to purchasing development rights on uh, property that they consider to be uh, um, sensitive or encroachment areas. Um, so there are a number of options and uh, funding sources out there, none of which we have control over and none of which, which guarantees uh, that the Algiers would be successful in whatever future venture they may have. Um, so to the extent that can maybe answer some of your questions, I mean, that's, that's, that's based on 10 years of discussing this and going down many different paths of, um, of trying to reach some sort of settlement. And uh, I mean, I, I understand, I understand that part. I just, I, you know, uh, I, I don't know who's going to want to live out there as well uh, under the flight path. And I think if we can solve the problem um, by reinstating rights with the, with, with the understanding that nothing could be built there, but those rights could be transferred off, off of that property somewhere else. I, I know it's a lot of work um, for someone to do, but to come at us and threaten us with 
uh, lawsuits, I mean, it gets your attention, of course, uh, to solve a problem that, that we didn't create, uh, so to speak, as a as sitting up here today. But um, it, it's a lingering problem that I think it can be worked out if, if everybody is willing to cooperate. Because I think that the main goal is for the reinstatement um, on the Algiers part and then the marketability of that or the transferability of that. So I, I don't know what we have to make a decision on tonight, if we can form it in some way so that we are answering the thing, the 90 days starts, whatever, and then we can get into executives. I don't know, will we get into the executive session at that point or still not that because there's no lawsuit filed yet? So we're we're not able to have an executive session yet. Depending on the depending on what action that you all direct uh, this evening, will then dictate what the next action is on part of the elders. Okay, if we if if we are if we if you're directing if the consensus is and the direction is to provide a written settlement offer to the elders, uh, indicating that we would make a modification to the ordinance to um, to recognize the one for five, but you can't build it and you have to transfer it. Um, we can certainly present that to the Algiers. I'm not sure if they would accept it. And if they didn't accept it, we would be off in um, litigation. All right, so uh, I'll listen to more comments. On this, but would that satisfy the the, the, the the notifications and then that would start the 90 day notice process and then we would go through the process of answering the, the next the next step. So the 90 day process has already started. It's starting. We're, okay. we're in the 90 day process. Okay. The 90, the 90 days expires, um, I, I believe, uh, August 19th. Um, and so whatever action we take, we'll need to uh, present that to the algers and uh, and then take the next step. I mean, we're, we're talking month basically tops before, we're, you know, before the algers are able to file in circuit court. Gotcha. Okay. And, and, and councilman and mayor, I believe that uh, uh, Algiers Legal Counsel Representative Miss Amanda Quirk is uh, is uh, on on the call and um, certainly could answer any questions that you may have. Um, maybe there's some initial thought or insight from the Algiers if that's even an option for consideration. Thank you, James. Before we go any further, though, I think we uh, we need to go back and. Uh, Move to. I would ask that someone move to extend the meeting until midnight. We met our 10 o'clock deadline already a little while ago. So moved. Uh, moved by Councilman Fletcher to extend to midnight. Do we have a second? Second. Second by Councilwoman Bailey. Is there anyone opposed? All right, we're extended to midnight. Uh, Council, any further questions, comments, suggested direction to take? Mr. Mayor? Yes, Councilor Shelley. Yeah, just to piggyback on, on Councilman Ross, um, I mean, my opposition to legislative uh, settlement is the concern that ultimately, if we grant it and they're not able to transfer those rights or have those rights purchased under either, you know, some sort of a TDR program or ag protection or base protection program. Somebody could actually build those houses. And that that's not what, you know, I'm not comfortable allowing or voting for that at this moment in time and the current we currently sit. Now, to the extent that there is a mecha mechanism where rights can be acknowledged, but also acknowledge that they're not going to build, then, then that's a different ballgame. I'm, I'm open to some discussion about that where where we acknowledge that rights maybe existed or maybe do exist or we grant 
knowing or having some safeguards in place that won't actually allow them to build. Now, I don't know that there's a way to do that and still have them have rights that can be purchased. That seems to be the catch-22 in this whole this whole process is that in order for them to have monies paid to them for those residences or for those units for that density, they have to have rights that are recognized. Right now, there are we're saying they have no building rights and therefore there's nothing to be purchased. So the base is saying I, they, they can't even apply for the monies that are available because they they have no units in which it exists, you know, because we're saying they don't exist. And then you have the courts that are saying they didn't have a vested right and didn't have those in existence. And at the same time, if we don't grant them, then they, they can't they can't make those applications. But if we do grant them, then there's a risk that they actually get built either by the Algers or, or whoever the Algers ultimately sell the property to, um, which then is risky for the Air Force Base as far as you know, having residences underneath. Granted, it won't be a lot of residents, but I think any residences underneath there would potentially cause a, a problem for the Homestead or Reserve Base and their mission. And ultimately, especially when you're talking these F-35s again, or, or any, for that matter, any expansion of, of the flight. So I am open to the idea if there is a solution that can be worked out that allows us to somehow recognize or provide them the rights they need such that they can be purchased. But I need some safeguards in place that also prohibit them from actually being able to build those buildings underneath that flight path. If there's a solution in that response, then then I would support moving forward in something to that effect. Thank you, Councilman Shelley. Thank you. Well, here would be my perspective to that, that conditionally granted rights are probably not sellable rights. So I, I just I just don't know that that, that is, is a viable solution at all. But again, I'd like to share with you all some of the perspective that some highly respected attorneys shared with me that one house on five really should not be deemed incompatible with base. Now, I know that's the bill of goods that, that the 2010 council bought, and it is what it is. But I was reminded that there are agricultural uses permitted that as a matter of right could be placed throughout that property it would have greater density or intensity, or let's put it in raw terms, far greater potential for civilian death and destruction than one house per five acres. So look, let's let's get back and focus on their demand. One house on five acres makes the thirteen million dollar elephant in the room go away. And if you get beyond this superficial defense of the mission of Homestead Air Reserve Base and this myth, this one in five chance that someday the F-35s might come here, you'll realize that there are other permitted uses at this point, while perhaps not as lucrative as one house on five acres, are far less compatible than one on five. So for, for me, it's it's an easy solution. Um, and let the chips fall where they may. Um, council? Well, our attorneys need some direction. Mayor, I think there was an invitation for the other council to speak, or was I mistaken? Was it Amanda? Are we, did, were we told Amanda was on the line? Amanda is here and available uh, should a member of council wish to speak with her. So if you oh, want to have public forum settlement negotiations, you have at it. I'm just trying to go back to James inviting her to speak, and then there was additional conversation that didn't allow that. So I'm just I'm open to hearing everything that's going to be said. Would Ms. Quirk like to weigh in at this point? Uh, Mr. Mayor, uh, IT here. I see that uh, there are two attendees, Amanda and John, Amanda Hand and John I. Alger. Uh, 
Okay. Let me know if I need to unmute them. Well, um, yeah, let's let's unmute uh, let's unmute them both and see if they uh, if it, to make them available to any questions that that my colleagues may have. Okay, they're on mute now. Thank you, Ms. Quirk. Yes, Mr. Mayor. Um, I don't know if at this point you would deem it necessary or appropriate to weigh in. I have I had a council member ask that uh, you know you be made available, and uh, you know I'll leave it to your discretion on behalf of your client as to whether or not you you wish to uh, initiate a conversation or would limit your your participation in in responding to inquiries. So, you know, members of council. I, yeah. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Go ahead, please. Um, I I would appreciate the opportunity to just make a few quick remarks. Um, you know, uh, primarily in response to what has been discussed tonight. Um, it has, you know, as as has been stated, this has been going on for about ten years. We have explored ad nauseum um, different iterations of how can you legally recognize right, um, but not have anything to build there, so it's such that they could be transferred or sold under the well-established programs and purchasing development rights. We have not found a legal way to do that. Um, the rights are either there or they're not. The county cannot purchase theoretical rights. The base won't even entertain an application. I will remind you that the base had a repi application pending for property in the APZ-1 when the City of Homestead passed this 2010 ordinance, you know, stripping the property of that one-on-five residential right. They were willing to look at it in the APZ-1 until the City of, Count City of Homestead did that work for them, stripped the property of the rights without any compensation. So, um, you know, as I've stated in my letter, you can't do that. And I'd also like to remind um, the council as you're considering what, you know, what is compatible and what is reasonable, the, the Miami-Dade County's ordinance allows the one-on-five residential in the APZ-1, and the, the base has not sued the county or claimed any other incompatibility based on the county's ordinance. Um, in fact, the county has an established program that if the property is going to be restricted to agricultural use only, then they have the Purchase of Development Rights Program because they realize that, that, that restricting property to agricultural use only cannot be done legislatively without compensation. It has to be with compensation. So, you know, there's no doubt, there's no doubt under any analysis that leaving the property with the bare ag use is compensable. Um, you know, if we want to disagree about the numbers at this point and you say, and we say it's $13 million and you want to, you know, hire your own expert to get that damage number down from eight figures to seven figures, I just don't think that that's the position that the city of Homestead wants to be in at this point. Um, anyone who knows the Alger family knows that they are not litigious or adversarial, um, but they have no choice at this point other than to pursue this claim because it is sizable and it is the family legacy. That dirt, the property, is their family legacy. It has no value, according to our appraisal, in its current state with the bare ag use. So I would encourage the council um, at this time, I think what, you know, what we are asking is reasonable is that the um, city of Homestead restore those one on five rights. It is not going to compromise the base. The county's ordinance already allows for that one on five in APZ1. And I don't see the base telling the county that that's not okay. Um, so I would encourage you at this time to dispose of the claim expeditiously um, because the truth is, is after that 90 day period, if we don't have, you know, an active settlement offer, I have no choice but to file the lawsuit and, you know, and as you said, go full bore in the litigation. We just don't have another choice at this time. So I would, I would respectfully request that the city of Homestead, um, you know, meaningfully consider what that $13 million claim does for the city. Mr. Mayor, as you said um, earlier tonight, you said in case you haven't heard, we have some serious budget problems here. Based on the actions of previous council, now we are left holding the bag. And I, I don't think you should let that happen here. Thank you for your insight. Um, you know, reading between the lines, what I'm hearing is, is that we have no real, and I'm saying this to council, just not directed to you, uh, Amanda, that uh, 
There's very little risk that there will be residential development out there if these rights are restored. Um, there are plenty of programs available to uh, that the algers can avail themselves of to uh, to obviate that potential air base issue with with the land use. So you know, again, I say to council, I think the the uh, the fiduciary way to deal with this is to uh, direct our attorneys to to comply with the notice and and propose a an adjustment to the uh, to the ordinance to allow uh, one house on five acres. And 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 again, I don't I don't see. Excuse me. I don't see how it can be conditioned at all. It's either a right or it's it's not. It's got to be a a sellable uh, absolute uh, construction right. Um, I'm not in a position to make a motion, but that's uh, that would be my <clears throat> my preference is that we go go down that road. Mayor, if I may. Sure. Thank you. Yeah, I, I've been sitting here listening to this, and I kind of wanted to hear Councilman Shelley's perspective because I know he was the liaison council to help um, work this issue out because my initial instinct was to restore the one to five per acre, but I was interested in under, getting his perspective as to why he wasn't, why he wouldn't support it, and now I understand because of the ability to build out there on that property. But in light of what I'm hearing, I'm still leaning more towards restoring the one to five per acre. I'll rest there. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Mr. Mayor. Council Fletcher. Yes, thank you. Uh, again, not being a land use attorney and, and trying to take all this in and having a discussion with our attorney and, uh, and understanding uh, this on a very uh, elementary level. Uh, I believe that, uh, you know, we should not be putting our citizens in, in the, uh, the, the laser uh, for a potential $13 million uh, deficit. Um, I'm in agreement with uh, our vice mayor that uh, I believe we should start uh, looking at restoring the one to five acre rights and uh, removing the city from this. Uh, contentious issue at this time. Thank you, Councilman. If so needed, I will make a motion to that account right now to restore those uh, good rights on that property to one to five. Thank you. We have a motion and, and James gives some guidance here. I guess that, that the legal, the statutory nomenclature would be option one. Would it, would it be option one? Well, I think it, I think I think it would be appropriate to. Um, I don't think you. I don't think you have to uh, specifically pick, reference yeah. pick one. I mean, I, I think uh, either one or two. Mm -hmm. uh, if direct, if the direction from the council is to um, make Agree to initiate initiate a written settlement offer uh, to the Algiers to um, to. Uh, modify the regulations to recognize one per five on that property, um, then we may use one, we may use two. But I, but I think I, you don't have to specifically pick one at this juncture. Um, we can leave it open. All right. Um, Mr. Fletcher, is that your motion? Yes, sir, I'll amend my motion to uh, the attorneys. Uh, and I will gladly second that motion. Anything further from council, members of council? Is everyone clear on, on the motion? We're going to comply with the other requirements, such as uh, within the time frame, providing a list of allowable uses and proposing to uh, initiate the, the legislative process to amend the ordinance to allow for one residence per five acres on the subject parcel. Anything further from council? So is this going to be presented for, uh, to come back to us for further discussion or if they accept it, that's it? Uh, Councilman Abla, 
so um, if the direction this evening is to, or the consensus to uh, proceed or direct uh, direct me to uh, proper a written settlement uh, offer to the Algiers, um, we'll do that in correspondence. We'll probably come up with a settlement agreement. As part of that settlement agreement, uh, one of the conditions uh, will be um, a proposed legislative ordinance. I, I, I mean, I, I, in that agreement, we don't have the ability to say that we will approve it. So uh, we will tee it up. It'll come back to you. The uh, whatever we do will come back to you for ratification and approval, and um, and then we'll proceed and we'll move forward with a proposed legislative uh, change to the ordinance. And uh, if that's if that's approved, then uh, the terms of the settlement would be met, and um, this Harris Act claims or these Harris Act claims would go away. If uh, for whatever reason the legislation is not approved, then the uh, the settlement terms would not be effectuated, and then we would be uh, headed down a litigation path. Thank you, Mr. White. Thank you. And, and I think my last question, with with the history of this case, you know, it being so many years, is there no statute of limitations or or I, I feel I don't even know if we can discuss these items not having an executive session. So I'm scared to ask and scared to not ask. Well, I, I can share with everyone that, you know, there's been a lot of discussion about um, the litigation that uh, was filed by the Air Force uh, back in um, 2011. In 2010, we adopted the ordinance. Uh, in that ordinance, we provided for a vested rights procedure for property owners to come in and, and avail themselves of a vested right. Um, the Algiers took advantage of that process, and we held a public hearing on that vested rights termination uh, in early January of 2011. Uh, at that time, the decision by the council was to approve the vested rights termination, and that's what ultimately led to a, um, a petition for a writ of cert, which was the litigation that was filed in circuit court uh, by, the, by the Air Force Base. Um, we entertained settlement for many years, um, all the way through 2019. Settlement, uh, unfortunately, uh, did not happen. Um, the litigation proceeded. Um, it was stayed during the settlement time frame. The litigation proceeded. Um, the circuit court uh, basically quashed the decision of the council and said that there were no vested rights in the property. The appeal was taken to the next appellate decision. Um, they upheld the lower court decision. So that litigation is over. Um, and so this claim, right, even though we can look to and, you know, show a new court um, what might have been done um, previously, this is a brand new case. This is a, what we call a de novo action. It's brand new. It's not bound by the litigation that was previously litigated or the decision. And uh, it's not bound by the record, uh, the public hearing record, like the last litigation was. So, um, so this is a brand new claim. Yes, uh, if we were to litigate as part of our defenses, we would um, we would assert um, number a, a number of things. Um, I'd rather not get into the specifics of that, but yeah, we would assert all sorts of things. Um, as to um, time, you know, time barred, statute of limitations, it's not ripe, a whole list of things. Um, whether or not those would be successful, I can't tell you, but uh, if we were to litigate, yeah, certainly those things would come into play. Thank you, Mr. White. So, uh, are there any further further questions from council on the the substance and the impact of the motion? 
or comments on it? That appearing, then I'll call for a roll call vote. Councilman Shelley? No. Councilwoman Bailey? No. Councilman Ross? No. Councilman Fletcher? Yes. Councilwoman Avila? No. Vice Mayor Fairport Stacks? Yes. Mayor Lawson? Yes. The motion fails. So then it appears we need an alternative uh, direction. Is any member of council willing to give our attorneys direction in this matter? Not that I want to go till midnight, but I'm, I'm just thinking long and hard of options. I've got an option. Why don't you and Mr. Shelley recognize your significant conflicts of interest in this matter and leave the dais? When Mr. Shelley has a business relationship with the wife of a party in interest, it boggles my mind that he can sit there as the guy who's wrapped himself as Mr. Ethics for nearly 12 years and won't step off the dais in good faith. And you, Councilwoman, are married to an active duty, full-time reservist, member of the armed forces, who goes on his uniform and goes to work every day at Homestead Air Reserve Base upon whose behalf the litigation that brought us to this point was brought. I fail to see how either one of you can in good faith sit there and take part in this conversation. There's a solution. There's no conflict here, Mayor. I assure you and I assure the public of the same and I mentioned the same in discussion on Copart. And if I felt there was a conflict, I would walk away. And in well, fact, that would, re that would recuse me of the responsibility. School. That would allow me to walk away from that responsibility of commenting on this, which is a very big responsibility. Your responsibility is to ensure the people that there is full transparency and good faith going on in our decisions. And you and Mr. Shelley, in my view, respectively, have utterly failed. You have put the city at risk if we do not come up with a viable alternative of a judgment of $13 million and several hundred thousand dollars in attorney's fees on this fiction that this is going to close Homestead Air Reserve Base. I am, I am appalled and disgusted. I'm Those are your words, public. Mayor. I Those are I'm your sorry. words, Mayor. No, I am very sorry, Mayor, but there is none of that is going on. And this is a group effort, and I see us all sitting here trying to come up with options. And so you don't get that you shouldn't be part of the group. You're new to this. Do you recognize that one time the city attorney actually gave me an opinion that because city deposits were held in a bank owned by my father, that I had to leave council, even though I had nothing to do with, with the management of the bank or the control of city money? If my wife worked for the Algiers, I would, I would in good faith walk away from this conversation. Your husband works for the party and interest who brought us to this point. What does it hurt? Show some good faith and walk away. I have not received such counsel on that subject. Have you asked for such counsel? Absolutely, I have. From the very written, beginning. Do you from have the a written opinion? Counsel, uh, counsel client privilege, I don't need a written opinion. It wasn't asked for me to provide a written opinion to, the, to my colleagues. 
But I, I can tell you, I've done my due diligence, and, you know, this is not helping me come up with any ideas or brainstorm with other options. Now, I'm open to starting conversations with the Algiers so that we can see where this goes. But to, to allow conflict, building, you should not be part of the conversation. Your duty to the people is to give them confidence that everything is above board. And a result of your husband's employment, you are tainted. As a result of Mr. Shelley's business connection with the wife of Richard Alger in her capacity with Farm Share, which, by the way, somebody who skimmed nearly a million dollars in management fees out of Farm Share, where he was CEO for the last three years of reporting, I think that's a pretty significant. Um, pretty significant conflict. I just fail to understand how your obligation doesn't fall on the side of giving people confidence that we're not going down the road of a bottomless pit of liability and litigation, and you owe it to the people to give them a written opinion or an opinion that I know good and well doesn't exist. Well, I think I heard Amanda say that there's no way of transferring rights that aren't there, but our attorney was okay with offering the option. And um, if if we go that route and it fails either way, then we're back to square one. So I'm trying to think of an option that's really going to work. Well, as a real estate attorney, I'm pretty comfortable that that option is a big nothing burger. Mayor, if you're if you're done arguing with the councilwoman Avila, I'd like to defend myself as well because when this thing was bubbling years ago, or probably a year or two years ago, and the Algiers had come back to discuss possible settlement, I had had conversations with the city attorney to make sure that there was no conflictual relationship that would ultimately result in a conflict. And there, the the person you're referencing is retired from farm share and has no no dealings with um, a business really. I, I don't, that's why I don't understand what you're, what you're discussing. It's not hard to find your form 990s online and, and the 19s haven't been filed yet, but during the time that this was bubbling up, she was your boss. She was your chairman of the board. And again, it may not be an actual legal conflict, but in terms of good faith, and fiduciary duty to the people of this community, I know what I would do. And I want, I need the people to know that two people who really, in my view, shouldn't be in on this conversation are and are taking us down the road of liability and attorney's fees that we cannot afford. Mayor, so, Mayor, Mayor, so. <laughs> Number one is you, you, you know, if I don't have an actual conflict, then I have to participate. And I understand that you don't like and appreciate or agree with my point of view. And therefore, no, you're no, no. It, some way. Attorney, and I know you failed at a practice and had to go to work for Farm Bureau. As an attorney, you should Mayor, understand Mayor, the Mayor, you're, you're getting, Mayor, you you're, you're being completely unprofessional right now. You, you are attacking your own counsel. We are trying to solve issues here. We are trying to make policy and decisions. And now you are you are devolving into attacking council members because the decisions are not going ways that you want them to go. And I find that to be problematic. And and you're personally attacking me. I have never personally attacked you. That's All I'm trying true. to do is make I'm trying to make decisions based on the facts and my own opinions and my own beliefs. And this is an issue where I'm very protective of the base. And you're making allegations against me that I'm somehow unethical, that my vote, my vote actually hurts the person that you're referencing and saying that I somehow would have a conflict with, my vote to not provide them rights, to not potentially give them the ability to earn dollars off the sale of those rights actually would be problematic. And so I don't understand how you're saying I have motives to somehow help somebody or that are unethical other than the fact that you don't like my position. And no, so this, I, don't, I don't appreciate that. I think you've taken this down a very bad path. I think you, you have gotten way off the subject matter and the purpose of what we are here today to discuss. 
Mr. Shelley, you're right about one thing. I don't like the way this is going because it is contrary to the best interest of the city as a business entity and its people. And let me be very clear. And as an attorney, you should understand this. That there is the issue of the appearance of an impropriety. And I believe that as an elected official and as an attorney, I personally have an obligation to walk away when there's any opportunity for an inference of questioning my decision. So it's not that you're casting a vote that is it, it, the issue is not whether it's against the interest of someone that I believe that, that you have a very close relationship with that should preempt your participation. It is the fact that you are participating in this conversation to any extent that that appearance of impropriety conflicts you from coming down on either side. Um, that, that's where I'm coming from. I, I am not accusing you of being unethical. I am merely stating that in my view of what's right and wrong for a public official, I want the public to know what's really at play here, and I don't understand why the base is given such deference. I'm old enough to have been here when both President Bush and President-elect Clinton came to Homestead and promised that the base would be reopened as a full active duty base. That has not yet happened. And I'm really, I, and this has nothing to do with support or not supporting the men and women of the armed forces. My son is a member of the armed forces. So let's not spread that garbage out there. I don't understand why some of you feel or have indicated tonight that the interest of the base are above the financial interest of the city of Homestead. So where we need to go now is somebody needs to come up with some direction for our attorneys to comply with the 90 day period to, 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 to get them all rolling. James, when is the deadline for the 90 day period again? Um, I believe that the deadline is uh, August 19th. Okay. So is there a possibility to defer this to next week so that I can do uh, some more council questioning? Or does yeah. it have to be determined I mean, tonight? Yeah, certainly whatever, whatever the will or desire of the council is will. Yeah. Uh, I think that, you know, with all of the comments that the mayor has had, if this was really such a big concern, I would have wished that he would have brought it to council's attention to discuss further with me because all of my inquiries about any potential conflict were brought on by myself and not brought to me by anybody else's accord. But those are valid points and I would love the opportunity to dig deeper in what those perceived conflicts would be other than the fact that I'm married to a service member who has nothing to do with this case um, nor has any opinion on the same, uh, but perhaps this is a good time to defer it. It's 11 o'clock at night, and we can take more time to consider these options. Councilwoman, is that a motion to defer this item? Unless someone else has a other alternative to consider. Mayor, if I may? Yes, Councilman Roth. Uh, I, I understand the, the passion and what we need to discuss here. Um, I would be in favor of getting together next week and with fresh minds and fresh ideas, uh, whether it be a special call or I, I don't know if we can discuss this at the Cal meeting or not, but um, it's important enough, I think, that we, we, we do have another meeting and it is 11 o'clock at night and I think fresh minds and, and and a fresh perspective on this it might be a better better opportunity for us to discuss it further and come up with with alternative uh, options before the deadline and in that regard then if each of you would submit um 
to the clerk the times that you're not available so that we can try to winnow it down to a day that's agreeable to all. Let's do that. Yeah, I think that I think that's the right right thing to do right now. Let's you know it's eleven o'clock at night. I think we still have one more item to discuss, and um, let's bring it back. And I, I don't want to kill it. Uh, that motion failed. I, I, I regrettably it failed, but we, we we do have to come up with a solution that protects the city against any harm that could come its way. So I'll be happy to comply with that and. Uh, I will submit to the clerk or communicate with the clerk on my availability for uh, next week. Thank you, Councilman. So is that a motion to defer, correct? I'll make the motion to defer unless it's already been made or I'll second the motion. I don't think it did. I think you're it. Okay, so I'll make the motion to defer uh, to uh, date determined next week. I'll second. Anything further from council? Roll call vote, Madam Clerk. Councilman Fletcher? Yeah. Councilwoman Bailey? Yes. Councilman Shawnee? Yes. Councilman Ross? Yes. Councilwoman Avila? Yes. Vice Mayor Faircourt Staggers? Yes. Mayor Lozner? No. The motion carries. Hi, right, next item, uh, tab 18. Vice Mayor, you're on. Okay. Thank you, Mayor. Um, in light of the time, Wait, is it me or the city attorney? Vice Mayor, you sound like a robot. Can you hear us? Yes, can you hear me? I saw city I saw your city attorney's report. I didn't know what that was being skipped to come. To oh, me. I'm 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 sorry. I, I didn't have my agenda agenda in front of me. I may have skipped uh Skipped over that. I'm I'm sorry. So we were at tab 17, which was the um, the Alger issue. Next is tab 18. Is uh, is you, Vice Mayor? Mayor okay, I, thank I'm you. I'm sorry, Mayor. I'm just, sorry, yes. That's part of her. That's part of her business. But we still have uh, reports from the city manager, the city attorney, and then reports from Mayor and Council. All right. City manager, any further? Yes, one thing, one very quick thing, Mayor. There's two special master open positions. The, we'll be considering applicants. Any recommendation will be brought back to council for your approval. That's all I have. Thank you. And I know that we uh, we had to uh, add a couple, uh, an item uh, springing from our executive session uh, almost yesterday now. Uh, Mr. Pearl, do you have that? Approving the settlement of all claims made by Regina Early, Reginald Early, and Mildred Early, providing for implementation, providing for an effective date. Um, you're all familiar with this case. There was a 1983 claim that was filed against the city and several officers. The city was successful in obtaining summary judgment. The plaintiffs took an appeal, and uh, during a court order, court mandated mediation during the appeal period, um, our insurer um, has decided that it would like to settle the claims. The payment of the uh, the settlement amount will be of twenty two thousand five hundred dollars would be paid entirely by. The city's insurer, there will be no cost to the city. Payment will be made directly by the insurer. And um, we recommend that we settle this and eliminate any potential uh, exposure to the city in the future. All right, do we have a motion for approval? Move approval. All right, we have a motion from, uh, I'm sorry, was that the vice mayor? Second, Councilwoman Alvila. 
Is there anyone in objection to uh, the motion to approve the settlement agreement? Seems unanimous. Um, uh, yes. I'm sorry, before we move on, can I announce an, an additional executive session? Before sure. we, thank you. Um, uh, I'd like to announce an executive session, the matter of Yellen v. City of Homestead. It's case number 2018-042920, uh, pending in Miami-Dade County. And then one more, it's Godfrey Roll, uh, case number 19-010354 ERA. It's uh, the Division of Administrative Hearings uh, for the state of Florida. Thank you. Maybe we can squeeze them in before the potential meeting next week regarding the Alger matter. Would okay. That be sufficient? Uh, absolutely. Whenever we'll you're to, all available. Yeah, we'll endeavor to do that. All right, and I'd ask my, my IT people, do we have anyone um, waiting in the wings to to make a public comment? Hey, Mr. Mayor, we have uh, two hands up. Uh, one is John I. Alger. I don't know if it was from the previous item. Well, that may be from the previous item. And Lawrence Ventura. Uh, that may be a holdover from the co-part. Mr. Ventura is still, still on. Let's check in and make sure. Can you hear me? We can. Yes, I would like the opportunity to speak a little bit tonight. Uh, I'd like to speak on the, uh, the Harris Act. I'm not going to get into it uh, because you've all have deferred the matter. However, I feel that I should at least come out and say a few things about your interpretation, Mr. Mayor, of the ECUs and what is and what is not encroachment. I want to let everyone know that while it is only the ACUS is only a recommendation, as I think all of you know, based on 30 years of statistical record keeping around the world of military aircraft. The recommendations that are for safety that are in there are up to you all, of course, if you wish to implement them. The city uh, is, is in and any municipality uh, is the one who is given uh, the uh, the responsibility, if they choose to accept it, to protect their military base. This is the same on all military bases all around the country. If the communities want their bases, they decide to what extent they want to defend them. Uh, to say, however, what is and was not encroachment, uh, that one thing is more encroachable than another, one thing is, is, is less of a hazard than another, we don't get to make those determinations. Those are made by these folks who do these studies all around the world who did these 30 years of statistical record keeping. They've chosen to keep families out of the accident potential zone. We don't get to make that decision. There are other uses allowed in the APZs, which they have determined to be uh, less uh, risky or safer, uh, uh, but we don't get to make those determinations is what I want to say. So I can't come up there and say that. I also want to come out and say that what one municipality does, like the county, vice another one does with the city, are up to each of those individual municipalities. The city's was done 30 years ago, and for good reason. And for the last 30 years, it has protected the base. It was reapplied. The same standards have applied with no housing for 30 years now. And that also includes uh, the annexation agreements which specifically stated and was signed by every member of the city council. It was re-implemented in 2001 when they updated the CMP. Nothing was ever changed. So I just want to call out some of those things uh, uh, because I felt there was a need and, and I don't think that uh, if you have a question about what it is and what is not uh, uh, mission sustainment issue for the base, please ask me. I'm happy to give it to you, but I'd rather not. Uh, you can do whatever you want. It's completely your call in your city, but I'd rather not you try to interpret what is and what is not safe by the ACUs and what is and what is not okay. Thank you. Thank you. IT, is that close it out? Let's, let's check with Mr. Alger. Okay. Uh, Mr. Arger is unmuted now. 
in case he wants to speak. Uh, Mr. Alger, did you wish to speak under public comments or was your hand up from the prior uh, discussion? All right, that, that must have been a holdover from the prior discussion if uh, you would mute him back. Okay. Um, Councilwoman Bailey, anything further tonight? No, Mayor. Thank you. Councilman Roth? No, Mayor, thank you. Thank you. Councilwoman Avila? No, Mayor, looking forward to Vice Mayor's report. Thank you. Councilman Fletcher? Nothing additional. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Councilor Shelley? Nothing at this time, Mayor. Thank you. Okay, Vice Mayor, at long last. <laughs> the floor is yours. Okay, thank you, Mayor. And for the sake of time, do I sound okay? Yes. Okay. You do for the sake anyway. of time, we'll give you the, um, the abridged version of this presentation because we do not endeavor to be here until midnight. But the past, over the past month or so, we've had conversations about um, racial equity and systemic injustice in the African American community on the heels or the aftermath of watching the late George Floyd narrate his death for eight minutes and 46 seconds. Um, and it ignited conversations not only in the community but around the world. So as a council, we decided to really look at multiple areas in which we can uplift and empower the African-American community to take us or lift us to an altitude that will allow all of us to be able to breathe and place us on a path of prosperity. So we looked at education, mentoring, health and wellness, um, economic development, home ownership, um, as ways where we can really take a deeper dive and look how we look at how we can create opportunities for the African American to discover the home, the opportunities, which is the city of Homestead's motto. So each council person that participated in those conversations um, aligned themselves to a particular initiative that they wanted to champion, and I invite you who pledged to work on these initiatives to come up with what you would like to, what you would like these initiatives to look like and then present out to council. But what I would like to do is um, move on to our PowerPoint presentation, the video. We'll play the video and then from there, I'll invite our um, Homestead Police Department to talk about police accountability and reform and the work that they have done to reflect on standard operating procedures and policies in place that would prevent or preempt anything like this would happen in Minnesota to happen in the city of Homestead, and then move on to the conversation about body cameras, which has been a rallying cry in the community, and share the cost associated with body cameras so that the council can determine which direction um, we would like to provide for staff as it relates to body cameras. I know we're in a budget crunch and I'm very sensitive to, sensitive to that. And my heart aches to even be having this conversation, but I believe it's a very critical conversation that we all need to have. So with that, you can play the video and then I'll tee it off to the police department. Thank you for sharing that. And before I allow the police department to weigh in, I would just say that I'm encouraged that there are so many corporations around the world that are investing in the whole Black Lives Matter movement to not um, give a handout, but a leg up to those in the African-American community. PepsiCo announced five-year, $400 million initiative in supporting um, Black managerial representation Bank of America announced one billion and a four year commitment to strengthen economic opportunities in communities of color. PayPal is committed five hundred and thirty million in supporting black owned and minority owned businesses in the United States. Comcast is dedicated one hundred million over three years towards diversity and inclusion efforts. And no, we do not have that kind of money. But my question is, what would be the city's investment 
And the additional question is, how will our leaders in the city of Homestead respond? So with that, um, police department, I tee it off to you. Good evening, everybody. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, good evening. My name is Sergeant Fernando Morales of the Homestead Police Department. I will first like to start off by stating that you will not find a Homestead Police Officer from Chief Row down to all the men and women of the Homestead Police Department that condone what occurred to George Floyd at the hands of a Minneapolis police officer as acceptable behavior by a law enforcement professional. Since then, there has been nationwide calls for police reform to include the changing of hiring practices to diversify police agencies to a review and reform uh, police policies. Recently, Vice Mayor Faircloth addressed several concerns with the Homestead Police Department. Thank you for that, ma'am. The following will demonstrate the accomplishments of the Homestead Police Department, which directly address some of these concerns. I will show you that some of the reforms that are being requested nationwide have already been in effect for many years under the direction of Chief Rowe at the Homestead Police Department. You will also be updated on steps that are currently being taken to continue to provide the residents of Homestead with the level of policing that they deserve. Um, what you're gonna see now, um, next slide please. What you're gonna see now is the current Homestead Police Department racial demographic, demographics. You're gonna see that 22% of our officers are white, 22 are black, and 55% are Hispanic and two other. Uh, more importantly, in 1998, which is as far back as I can go, we had 42 white officers, 12 black officers, 10 uh, Hispanic officers only. Um, in 1998, we also had seven female officers and current uh, date number of female officers is um, 18. Uh, next slide, please. Next slide. Oh, I'm sorry, go, go back one, I apologize. Um, you'll see that there has been a 38% reduction in white officers, 160% increase in black officers, a 500% increase in Hispanic officers. Now, why is this significant? Uh, I'm not sure if anybody had the opportunity to see the Channel 7 report last night where they touted um, the, uh, or they spoke about the demographics of police agencies um, in, comparison to, in comparison to the demographics of the cities in South Florida. Um, what I'm about to show you kind of correlates with that, and you'll see that, um, in my opinion, in our opinion here, we're doing a fantastic job. Uh, next slide, please. You'll see that at, at present time, uh, the work that has been done in the past couple years um, has really paid off, where you can see in this graph that the number of officers that we have or the demographics directly correlates with the demographics of our city, which is what is being asked of many agencies all throughout the United States. Now, this is something that just didn't happen overnight. This is something that has been happening um, throughout the years under the chief's direction, um, where he's asked us to you know, recruit, recruit locally and recruit um, uh, minorities, especially um, in our cities. Um, you'll, one of the important things when you look at this in Ferguson, during the Ferguson riots, uh, you had 90% uh, white uh, department, a uh, police department, versus a 68% black community. There's no way in the world, uh, at least in our, in our opinion, that you can uh, effectively police in that type of environment. As you can see here, we've gone through great strides to uh, level the playing field between the demographics of our police uh, department and the community. Next slide, please. Um, also, one of the things that the chief has, uh, ha has been very adamant about is hiring from within, from within the city. Uh, you'll see here um, where you'll find 27% um, of officers um, are within the city of Homestead, uh, as far as our department, 28% are in the Homestead area and 45% are in, uh, outside of our jurisdiction. So in other words, uh, you can hit next. Uh, you'll see 55% uh, of our officers live within our community. Um, again, why is that important? Uh, you'll see next, uh, go ahead, next slide. If you look around the area between 2011 and 2000, 
12 and 13, you're going to see our crime rate significantly begins to decrease. Now, in talking to experts, um, as you will see in that Channel 7 report, one of the things that occurs when you hire people from within the community, there's a, a larger level of trust with the officers. They have more vested um, in their relationship with the community. Um, I can tell you, as, as, as when I was a detective in this city, um, living here, uh, working here, playing here, shopping here, you'll find a great deal of people of our residents that trust the officers a little bit more when they see that the officers are, are residents of Homestead, their families are. So what does that cause? That causes them to receive phone calls to assist in fighting crime. Um, I think everybody here knows that uh, Homestead is a small town, but with very large families. And these families, they contact these police officers and they let them know when things come out on the news or they find out about crime or even call them directly. Um, so, I, I mean, I can't tell you 100% that this has been a factor in the, in the uh, lowering of the crime, but 100% um, it has been one of the factors as to why crime rates have, have decreased so much. Next slide, please. And if I'm going too fast, too fast, please tell me. I'm trying to go as fast as I can. Um, here you're going to see the uh, officer statistics, uh, officers per 1,000 residents. In 1998, we had 2.9 officers. That roughly equates to um, approximately 90, 92 officers uh, that we had in 1998 with approximately 22,000 uh, people uh, in the city of Homestead. Uh, now we fast forward to today's date and you'll see that we have 1.6 officers per 1,000. Um, and we have a little bit over tripled the amount here in Homestead, and we've only gone up to 113 officers, a short, a short distance only. Next slide, please. Uh, you will also see one of the largest departments in Washington, D.C. They have 6.8 officers per 1,000. Miami Beach, a little bit closer, has 4.2 officers per 1,000. And now we go to the Florida average which is at 2.4 average as dictated by FDLE, um, and the national average as dictated by FBI is 2.1. And you'll see that the Homestead Police Department is well below uh, not only the state average, but the national average at 1.6. Uh, next slide, please. We're gonna go into the professional training that we have. Um, the use of force training uh, is it, it, very, um, it's very important that not only uh, mayor and council understand, but that our residents understand the level of training that our officers go through here. Um, our use of force uh, training is, is done to each and every one of the officers, um, and we speak to many facets of use of force training. Uh, one of those is the uh, FAPS machine, which is the firearms training simulator, which also includes de-escalation training. Um, how does that work? That works that depending on the officer's interaction uh, during this training, it dictates which direction the, um, the simulator will go. So in other words, if the officer is effective in, in uh, talking down the subject or de-escalating the situation, we can make the uh, simulator go to a route where a person basically gives up, turns around and puts their hands behind their back. Or if the officer isn't effective, we can up the machine to where it gets to a high liability area and then discussing with the officers techniques and exercises and different scenarios where the officer can uh, de-escalate um, any type of situation. Professional traffic stops is another one that we have all of our officers um, go through. Um, officer survival. Officer survival is another one that every officer does here on a yearly basis. Uh, something that most agencies don't do. We do that here under the direction of the chief and our training department where officers go through different scenarios. And this is not a, um, a for example, a simulator. This is actual, actual practicums where we use role players, where the officers also have to use de-escalation techniques and officer safety scenarios and use everything that they have at their disposal to defuse a, a situation. Um, the active shooter, as everybody knows, after the uh, Marjorie Stoneman Act, uh, we have to do active shooter training to the schools. We've been doing uh, that. We've also put every single one of the officers here in Homestead through an active shooter training course, uh, which they had to successfully complete. Um, discriminatory profiling. Uh, 
Uh, that's another training that they will go to and to include human diversity. And there's three here that are, that are kind of important. The human diversity, the discriminatory profiling and professional traffic stop. There has been talk about implicit bias training. These are some of the components of implicit bias training. Um, crisis intervention training, CIT training. This is a training that our officers go through. Um, it's a 40 hour class. In other words, it's five days. They uh, go to a class on how to intervene during crisis intervention, during mental health situations, drug abuse, and also uh, some autism um, training is there to deal with persons or how, how to identify a person with autism versus something else. Um, roll calls. We have roll calls here every single day in the department uh, where our supervisors discuss what we're doing, what was done, uh, if there were any incidents the, the prior day, they will discuss if there were any flaws, anything that could be done better. Um, it's an open discussion with the officers where they, if they find any flaws, we'll highlight those. If it has to be a training issue, um, it will be forwarded to the training department or if it's something that they can discuss there and just talk to the officers and, and go through every single incident that occurred the night before or something that has been highlighted, for example, the, uh, the uh, George Floyd um, um, situation. Um, I, and a lot of these things, um, you know, uh, I, I think I can honestly say, you know, Councilman Fletcher, um, I mean, I think that you can very, uh, very much discuss this because you have taken pretty much all of these. And you know the significance and the extent of, of the training uh, that the training department gives uh, to, the, uh, to the officers and how important um, this training is and how successful this training has been um, in many situations that we have encountered here in the city of Homestead. Uh, next slide, please. A community and youth engagement. Um, if you look at the community engagement, um, you know, I wanna start off by SOS. Um, I think um, everybody or most, most people know uh, the Start Off uh, Smart Program uh, at the city of Homestead. It's, a, it's actually a long arm of the police department uh, considered a softer side of police work, which includes domestic violence assistance, relocation of battered women, programs involving at-risk juveniles, and also work closely with the Department of Children and Family Services to ensure, to ensure child safety. Um, the gang awareness presentation uh, to school staff, active shooter presentation to school staff uh, per the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas mandate. And I'm just gonna go through a couple of these. Uh, drug and gang awareness presentations for at-risk youth at schools. The Police Athletic League, which has after-school programs and partnerships with our local schools and juvenile mentoring programs. That's part of our community policing program. Um, uh, our award-winning Police Explorer program, which is, um, which is leadership producing program to include uh, politicians, first responders in law enforcement and the medical field. And some have gone to serve our country in the military are some of the examples of, you know, of persons that have, you know, uh, basically um, graduated from this. Now, this is all, uh, uh, most of these things that I'm telling you um, are officers that have volunteered their time to assist with these. Some of these officers are assigned, but for the most part, a lot of these programs, schools contact us, you know, officers and their time off, they'll take it upon themselves to go to career days and, you know, reading with a cop, uh, popsicle with a cop. Some of you have uh, in council have also uh, been involved with the bigs in blue, uh, these situations, a pizza with a cookie. A lot of these officers that are from our um, neighborhood, you know, our, our city here, they attend these things with their families and they see their friends coming in and they see that they're law enforcement officers and they're really good event, events. I would really encourage everyone to attend these, uh, these events. Um, this goes back to the hiring of the persons that are familiar with Homestead and are excited to volunteer their time, events that impact the community um, that officers and their families live in. I just wanted to highlight that. Um, next one, please. Uh, our standard operating procedure on use of force, which is, which is a big one. Um, the use of force continuum. Many agencies that, uh, across the nation are being asked by civilians to have a use of force continuum. We've had a use of force continuum and interventions here for the past 20 years at the city of Homestead. It's also been mandated by the state of Florida. Most agencies in the state of Florida have them. But we get to tweak that a little bit. Um, and it's probably one of the best uses of force 
uh, continuums, uh, we follow the Dade County guideline and the state of Florida FDLE guideline when it comes to that. We've been doing this already for many years. Use of force reporting. Um, many agencies are being called upon to make sure that the use of force reports are reviewed by everybody. At the City of Homestead Police Department, each use of force is reviewed up the chain of command from the direct supervisor to the training department to the professional compliance bureau all the way up to the, to the uh, division uh, captain and the chief of police. Um, we um, require to exhaust all alternatives before deadly force. Uh, this has been there um, since I've been in the department over 22 years. Um, every officer is trained on this, um, where they're supposed to uh, exhaust all alter alternatives uh, before resorting to deadly force. There's specific language to this. Uh, also, required de-escalation techniques. There's also language in regards to this, and as I explained earlier, we, this is one of our high liability areas where we train the officers on the de-escalation techniques. Um, required warning before deadly force, uh, that there's also specific language there when it, uh, in regards to uh, deadly force, um, obviously, uh, when time uh, permits and the circumstances permit. Um, one of the big ones since um, the George Boyer situation, uh, the lateral vascular neck restraint, commonly called the chokehold, um, are considered deadly force in the uh, Homestead Police Department. Furthermore, this is something that has not been authorized in the police department for at least 20 years. Uh, this is something that was uh, changed uh, back when uh, the chief became chief in 90, 1998, which is as far back as I could go, um, where this has been uh, not an, an approved technique only uh, under a deadly force situation, which is any other technique also when uh, an officer has to resort to deadly force. Shooting at moving vehicles, not permitted unless there's an imminent threat or danger to an officer and or others. Now you're gonna notice that duty to intervene is highlighted in blue. That is something that we have uh, since added um, literature on it and have been very, um, very exact with, with the garbage to where every single officer now in the City of Homestead Police Department has a duty to intervene um, regardless if it's uh, a subordinate or a supervisor that he has to intervene with if, if he observes any excessive use of force or any inappropriate um, actions uh, by a fellow police officer. So that is some language that we have already added. Uh, Chief Rowe has already approved it and it has been disseminated uh, to the entire uh, department. So that is in effect at this point in time. Uh, next slide, please. Um, also, we're going to be moving into uh, body cameras um, where we will be following the uh, Florida statute 943.1718, uh, which uh, basically governs the training, the monitoring, the records retention, and the records uh, request in regards to body cam. At this point, I'm going to hand it over to uh, Captain Raymond Dijon, who is very well versed in this uh, in this aspect, and he will continue from here. Good evening, uh, Mayor and Council, Vice Mayor, and uh, staff. Uh, thank you for having us here this, uh, this evening to uh, share our research on the uh, body camera programs. I'm going to go ahead and start from the beginning, uh, back when we started researching it. In 2016, under the direction of uh, Chief Roll, we began to look at developing and the possibility of developing and implementing a body camera program. We selected a body ca body worn camera vendor and uh, even received a quote and began weighing our options and what were the needs of the department at that time. Due to funding limitations and the needs of the department and the city as a whole, we were not able to proceed back in 2016. Uh, now, with the events that have occurred and it brings us up to present day, we are now presenting a request to council to consider the possibility of implementing a body-worn camera program. As you can see, uh, we are highlighting a uh, company called Axon Taser. Um, and why did we cho choose Axon Taser for this research? They're one of the most widely used body camera systems in the country, uh, including many departments in South Florida, city of Miami, Miami Beach, and Doral. Axon Taser, they have a specific plan. It's called the Officer Safety Plan 7 Plus. Uh, it's a five-year plan, basically a five-year contract. They, uh, this, what's unique about this feature is that each officer that gets a camera, 
They get uh, also get a uh, less than lethal weapon, which is a taser, the latest taser. It's going to be the latest camera and the latest, latest technology taser available. Uh, also in this package, there's a replacement guarantee. If there's any malfunction with it, if it uh, becomes damaged due to weather or some sort of uh, event where it gets uh, broken, um, that there's a replacement guarantee that is at no cost to us, we will receive, uh, receive a new one. Additionally, there's also a new equipment every two and a half years. Uh, Axon Taser replaces this equipment for the officer. That way, uh, if there's any chance that the battery is wearing down, if there's a, a lens uh, issue where it's not getting clear pictures, they want to avoid all that, so they redo a, what they call a refresh every two and a half years. Um, also, what is really, really uh, great in the, how technology has changed since 2016, this feature has a plan that includes sensors uh, for instance, in the officer's uh, vehicle, when he activates his lights and sirens, the body camera automatically turns on. Uh, if he draws his weapon, um, the, it automatically uh, it, it turns on the camera. There's a sudden uh, incident where he's not even on a call, but there, there stands to be an instance where he has to draw the weapon or a taser, the camera comes on. And what's even more significant about that is that once an officer um, draws his weapon suddenly, any officer within 50 feet of that, that um, sensor, their cameras also come on. So now you're, you're increasing the possibility of capturing every single angle um, and leaving uh, little room for doubt. Not, I'm not going to say no room for doubt, but it's going to leave little room for doubt. Um, along with that is the, uh, the, the, the program administration. Uh, with this, uh, Axon Taser has a, a suite of software that is only going to set us up for success as we manage uh, moving in and manage in the program. It has auditing features that enable supervisors to continuously um, keep an eye on what the officers are doing as far as are they following policy and procedure. If there was a complaint, they can follow up on uh, these types of things. There's even, if, if the officer is actually on a live call where it's actively recording, a supervisor can check in live. Uh, he can see what's actually happening in the moment. Um, and we, we find that very interesting and in, in the, 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 how we can use it for training or we can take corrective action on issues that we may see. Also, there, the, the software includes uh, an excellent uh, redaction uh, suite, which would be in, uh, we would follow redaction pursuit to uh, Florida state statutes. Uh, every video that's produced, whether it's going to the state attorney's office or, or going to public records request, it has to be viewed for anything that's possible uh, that you have to do redactions. For instance, if you uh, respond to the hospital, everybody that's in the lobby or in the emergency room, you're going to have to redact their faces due to, due to HIPAA. If you go to a school and you have all these juveniles, you're going to have to redact their faces. That takes a lot of work. The, the better the software, the easier it's going to, um, you're going to be able to, um, uh, you know, do the redactions. Uh, evidence storage. All this evidence storage would be in the cloud. It's called the evidence.com, which is powered by Microsoft Azure. Um, again, all the software suite that goes along with it is really the key to setting us as it's about the equipment, but the software is excellent. It's going to set us up for success. And then there's evidence sharing. You can share this evidence directly with the state attorney's office. No longer you're going to have to uh, put it on a disk or a thumb drive. You can um, automatically uh, give them a link, and it could be forwarded straight to the state attorney's office. Uh, so these are these are some of the reasons why we chose this program in particular. Next slide, please. When it comes to the uh, next slide, you're you're looking at what what do they cost? Um, they basically, the the equipment costs about if you look at it per officer, it's 229 officers. Uh, a month or $229 per month per officer per year for a five-year period for 113 officers. It comes out to $1.55 million. The, uh, the yearly annual cost would be $310,000 a year. Now, that's just for the equipment, the software, and the, the managing of that program. Now, the personnel, it, it's going to take additional personnel to manage this program. Um, during our research, what we found is that we would probably have to have a sergeant to manage it, uh, a detective um, to assist with it, and a civilian personnel. Now, these are going to range from everything from doing uh, fulfilling public records requests to doing redactions 
to audit to a doing auditing to make sure that uh, you know we have to periodically check uh, different officers and uh, see uh, if they're functioning uh, doing their job properly. So it's all about accountability at that point. And again, what that total comes out to, you have the, the list of prices there or the cost for each uh, personnel that's going to be assigned to that, which in also includes their uh, required fringe benefits, fringe benefits and insurance and retirement. And the total package between the equipment and the personnel comes to $777,272 per year over a five-year period. Next slide, please. So what are the potential funding sources for body cameras? Well, uh, you know, it's general fund revenues is one. Uh, we take a look at it for the 2021 budget. Uh, there's state and federal grants, which uh, currently, uh, I've looked into it, there are currently no state and federal grants available. Um, they will become possibly available where we start applying for them, possibly towards the end of the year, beginning of next year, and they'll be awarded in the spring. There's also, uh, Taze and Axer offers a deferred payment plan. It's true, they offer it, but we all know what a deferred payment plan doesn't mean it's free. Uh, that payment for the year or how often you, or how long you may defer it is going to get tacked on and spread out over the other years. Um, so all in all, we believe that the implementation of a body camera program will ensure greater accountability for our officers and citizens alike. And the increase uh, with our the cases that we make, the arrests that we make, the byproduct of that is going to be an increased conviction rate uh, of those cases, all of which will uh, better serve the citizens of Homestead and increase public trust. And with that, I'm going to turn it back over to uh, Sergeant Morales. Next slide, please. That you'll see here that uh, we've identified and completed needed revisions to the SOP on the use of force clarifying language regarding the uh, duty to intervene, which has been a very good step for us. Thank you. And the very last thing I just want to mention, one thing that we're going to be launching is the Meet HPD portal. And that's so that the information that we saw during this presentation will be readily available to the public. They'll be able to go in, see the statistics, view policies, and get to know our officers. Thank you, Kate and Detective Morales and Captain John for your information. And I appreciate you addressing um, the concerns that I have presented to you relative to the lab of training and codifying the duty to intervene in your SOPs, as well as the demographics to show that it reflects the diversity within the city, as well as the human diversity to ensure that our officers have the appropriate professional development in order to interact with various uh, Vice Mayor, we're losing ethnic, ethnic groups in the community. I know you're on the council. Okay, how does this sound? Much better. Does it sound okay? Well, light of what you heard and the information presented, would you like to digest this information and then have the conversation at the special call meeting? or for the next 18 minutes, just weigh in as much as you can as it relates to your position on body cameras. And if we want staff, we'll direct staff to move forward with determining what this will look like if we move forward with this in the general um, fund budget for fiscal year 2021. Vice Mayor. Yeah, let's in. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Ms. Avalon. I think uh, we can take the next few minutes to weigh in. I think uh, a lot of effort was put into the presentation and it doesn't hurt us. We've already agreed to allow the meeting to continue, so another 10, 12 minutes doesn't hurt. Uh, I, I, I would agree. You know, we're here. Let's go ahead and call it, finish, finish out the night, the time allotted. Okay, Dr. with that, would anyone like to, to begin that weighing in process? I am for um, body cameras now. Initially, I was with of the position that we were short police officers, so that should have been the focus 
I think 55 some, something uh, police officers. But in light of everything that is going on with this um, racial pandemic and systemic raci- racism, I feel that um, now is the time to have those crucial conversations as it relates to body cameras because they have the ability to validate or substantiate. So I am for moving forward with allowing staff to look at the numbers and determine what it will look like as it relates to our 2021 budget. And I'm very interested in hearing my colleagues' position on this item. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Fletcher. Thank you. Uh, I just want to, I don't want to belabor this too much. Uh, I am in agreement with uh, Vice Mayor Faircloth. We need to move forward and, uh, and uh, you know, look at the body camera issue and, and implementation in the very near future. Uh, however, as a former member of the Homestead Police Department, uh, I think it's, uh, it would be uh, reluctant of me to state that uh, the training that is provided to the, to the personnel at the City of Homestead is some of the best that uh, we've seen in Dade County. And, and other agencies have also uh, discussed the, the programs that the Chief has put in place over the years and authorized through our training organization to ensure that these officers are prepared uh, for the streets of Homestead. Um, personally being through many of those programs, uh, I gotta say that it, it does nothing but uh, you know, assist the officers as they're doing their daily uh, activities uh, from the firearms training to the use of force training to, uh, you know, two day schools at the uh, over at the Miami Dade College, where we bring in folks from different uh, the LGBT community, the Hispanic community, sit there and talk about how how we're able to interact with the folks in the city. And uh, I just want to thank uh, the chief for for pushing those uh, throughout uh, my time at the police department, uh, as well as uh, in the future. <clears throat> with that being said. Uh, Along with the body cameras, we also still need to look at uh, the low numbers that are being shown to us tonight. Uh, what was it, 2.9 per thousand in 1998 to 1.6 today? Uh, we have to look at strengthening our police department and including additional officers for the force to include uh, the use of body cameras as well. So, uh, being in the tough times that we currently are in, and we see ourselves in the in the next couple of years, we have to find a way to, to offset those costs and ensure that we're also increasing the amount of personnel at the police department uh, to ensure that we continue to provide the community with the correct uh, services as uh, we move forward. Uh, with that, I will uh, release back to you all for further discussion. I would also ask the, the city staff to look at what other options are available to us? Are we able to utilize uh, forfeiture money uh, if we have any left uh, to to offset these costs as well uh, for body cameras and other officers? Thank you, Mr. Mr. Fletcher. Mr. Roll. Thank you. Um, yeah, a uh, couple of things. The Councilman Fletcher mentioned that we, we do got to look at keeping up the, the numbers for the officers that we have. But one of my questions about the body cameras is, is there a way to offset the cost of the body cameras by not assigning every single officer with a camera that's not on duty at the time? Um, simply uh, maybe switching body cameras out as they come in and out of shifts. Uh, to bring the numbers of the cameras down, but keep every officer uh, covered with a camera. I don't know how that would work. Uh, if you can assign officers uh, multiple uh, cameras that are used on multiple officers uh, to to bring down the the cost of uh, of everything that's involved in this. Maybe maybe either Sergeant Morales or uh, Dejan could could answer a question like that. Uh, Councilman Roth, um, I understand your question. You're wanting to uh, see if there's a possibility that officers could basically, uh, old school uh, police term, hot bunk um, sharing of uh, uh, body cameras. Um, that's not 
a recommended uh, uh, practice. Um, you know, for one, if you have an officer, say you have an officer that doesn't take such good care of his cameras, and then you have the officer, another officer who takes that camera and he goes out and it's a faulty camera. I would hate to be that officer. I would hate to be that officer that would uh, be stuck in a position where a camera that does not work that well and, and then he gets into an incident and it's not captured properly, then all eyes are on that officer. Did he do something correctly? The other thing is you have a issue with uh, evidence, evidence collection. Um, it, it's, it wouldn't be wise. Each officer has to have it. And also, the, the, if you partially deploy camera systems through part of the department, you only give it to half the uniform form patrol or a couple officers on each shift, uh, you know there's naysayers out there. They're going to say, if one officer who gets into a shooting doesn't have a camera, they're going to be pointing the fingers, and they're going to say, why didn't he have a camera? Or they're going to say, sure, he didn't have a camera. And also, if you have an officer that's working an off-duty job, um, you know, it's very important. The likelihood of an officer getting work to an off-duty assignment, um, he can very well be involved in a shooting um, or some other sort of incident where He's going to, we're going to have to have that accountability officer, and we're also have to document the evidence that, that, that occurs. Um, so uh, yeah, it's very important that we cover everybody from, you know, all the officers to uh, reserve officers as well, because they, they're working off duty jobs. They're riding right along as well. So it's very important that we do a, a complete coverage. So, so then to follow up with that, we can't, we can't do that particular type of thing, but you're, you're saying we're covering 113 officers. What about the specialized units and those guys? Obviously, these uh, specialized units that, like, say, are narcotics guys or uh, special investigations unit, they're not going to be wearing them in civilian clothes. They're, they're, uh, every day is sort of undercover. They're walking around and they're on surveillance. They can't have a camera on them. These uh, cameras are of decent size. So you can't wear, do that. But if they are working other, if they're working off-duty details, if they're working an overtime detail, they very well, according to how we ever set up the policy, they very well could be uh, having to wear cameras as well. But that's what we'll have to decide in the end where where it applies the policy and who's going to wear the cameras and when. Understand. So I, I guess my 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 emphasis would be on on manpower and the ability to record. Um, it's just how will staff uh, work together to figure out a way to make it reality, you know, for the, cit the citizens and the city, um, you know, moving forward. So uh, with that, Mayor, I'll rest. I there's eight minutes, nine minutes left, so I know there's want to speak. Thank you, Councilman. Mr. Mayor, Mr. Mayor. Yes, Mr. Fletcher. Uh, just one thought. Uh, is there a way we might be able to offset the cost of this system also through our off-duty program by potentially increasing the rates for those officers that are, are wearing those when they're performing uh, those off-duty rates. So it's just something to think about. Uh, I know uh, those costs tend to get high, but uh, we also need to, to look at uh, potential offsets. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman. Very, very good point. I was thinking along those lines too, that with this, new equipment and highly technical equipment um, it's out on out on private pay jobs that uh, there's a lot of wear and tear on on city city assets that are not cheap Mr. So Mayor. yeah Council yeah just I'll, I'll weigh on this as well and so um yeah, as far as the body cameras go, I'm, I'm not opposed to body cameras. My my concern with body cameras has always been I'm, I'm not a fan of government having cameras, <laughs> which is why I never liked uh, red light cameras. I, you know, I've just that's one of my biggest concerns is making sure that you know as we go down this, as we look into this, that there's safeguards, um, you know, also for what the government can use the cameras for, you know, safeguarding the um, the recordings, things of that nature um, are probably more of my concerns, which uh, I'd like to make sure that as we're going down this pathway, you know, staff and the police department are looking into that. What, what, what are our ways to make sure that the body cameras are used for purposes other than what we've authorized them as policymakers to be used for? Because I know 
the, the red light cameras were originally couched as, well, we're using this for safety purposes and to help people that are running red lights. And then before you know it, government's using it to track people as they're going through intersections and, you know, all may be good things, but you're still, it's, it went way outside the scope of what the red light cameras were originally intended to be used for. So that's more or less my line of thinking as far as uh, things I want to be looked at as we're going down the body camera route. Um, and then obviously costs are another another factor. You see the cost of slides, you see how much this is going to uh, potentially affect our budget. And so it's making sure are there government grants, are there are there other means or funding sources out there to offset these types of technology advances um, to be put to use in our police department. So those are kind of my initial thoughts. I know we'll discuss this more in, in detail later on. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman. If I can weigh in one moment. Sure, thank you. I just wanted to thank Sergeant Morales, Captain Dijon. You guys have been great throughout all the community conversations that we've had, and I continue to be very proud of our department um, since day one for me, even before day one. Um, I've always been for cameras. I think that they are a great idea. Um, I am completely in agreement to move forward to see how we can get them implemented for the city. I'm also really happy to hear that there are new redaction op options as well as the cameras automatically activating and turning on because that was my biggest issue is to take one and a half million dollars, two million dollars from our budget for the possibly one or two officers that might do something that we wouldn't agree with, how easy it has been in the past for those cameras to turn off. So this changes, this changes a lot. And I thank you, Vice Mayor, for bringing this presentation up and look forward to discussions. Thank you, Councilwoman Bailey. I would I would just like to add that, you know, I'd like us to go forward, but I think that we need to um, to see the option the, the cost options for other systems. We don't have time tonight, but I'd really like to know more about the ins and outs as to why this system was chosen and what other reasonable options there are. I'm really taken aback by the new salaries that would be attached to the to to at least this system every year over four hundred thousand dollars a year every year from now to eternity increasing every year to to staff these cameras that's that's very uh very breathtaking and and, and again um i'd like the opportunity to you know at a later date to find out what other systems are out there and what the differences uh, are. Uh, we've got to really be careful and and balance good equipment, uh, what will do versus what it costs. We, we've got to be, I, I, I'm coming at it from that regard to be very careful, but, you know, make no mistake, I want to go forward and see, you know, uh, what's available out there to help us fund a system. Not necessarily this system, but a system. Um, so I would look to to the manager and her procurement staff and, and her her team to to help us sort through through that rather than just have this is what we want laid in our lap. We can come back to you with that, Mayor. Thank you. Appreciate it. Anything further on this? Yep, if I can just chime in, sure. I thank you. I echo the sentiment uh, shared by everyone. And um, as, a, as a cop's daughter, I, this is very near and dear to my heart. My father served for Dade County for over 30 years. And I, um, I do agree that these cameras will do well for our community and for the officers. And I want to thank all of the leadership within our HPD from the chief down to the clerk. You guys have been doing an amazing job. And I wanna thank you, Vice Mayor, for carrying the torch on this item and for bringing it to us. Thank you very much. 
Thank you, Councilwoman. And I think that brings us to the end of the meeting and everyone's got to have, have I said the opportunity to have some business other than, than myself. And I just, it's been, a, it's been a very interesting night. I just want to clarify something. I believe that there are two components to ethical behavior. What is actually black letter law prohibited and what feels right versus what looks wrong. And that's where I come from. And I have a passion for right and wrong and what's best for this community. And if it comes across as personal, I'm sorry. But I think that, that we all owe it on any given issue to really ask ourselves, is there anything in our personal or professional life that would create any question among the people who put us here as to whether or not we should be participating on a given item. Um, that That's where I am. I mean, I've, I have walked off the dais many years in the past when, many times in the past, when I probably wasn't required to, but I felt it was the right thing to do. And going forward, I, I hope that all of us can make that analysis so that whatever the final decision is, the people are comfortable that uh, the process was was fully and completely transparent. My only other issue, and I'll just give a heads up to, to management, Mr. Corradino and the attorneys. I'd like us. I'd like to talk about, and we can talk about it later. What obligations we have to to continue bringing forward quasi-judicial and other land use type items virtually. Um, after tonight, I, I am not comfortable at all with the transparency of the process or the, the quality of the process, uh, particularly as it relates to the public's right to, to reasonably participate and, uh, and be heard and, and felt and understood. So I, I, you know, in the next few days, let's, let's put our heads together and talk about uh, determining what our legal obligations are, what the practical implications are for, again, stopping uh, potentially or to have a conversation about ceasing the conduct of uh, quasi-judicial type hearings. And with that, do I have a motion to adjourn? I'll make the motion. We have a motion by Councilwoman Avalon. I think I heard Councilwoman Bailey second. I'm sure no one is in opposition. Thank you all and good morning. Good, night. <laughs> good morning. <laughs> good night, guys. Bye. Take care.